Hey everyone, and welcome to the best of March 2022. It's crazy to think that we are finally getting out of the winter months. I hate the cold, so I'm really excited about that. Bring me some crop tops and booty shorts ASAP, because I am so tired of sitting inside all day every day. <laughs> anyway, tonight we have 10 and a half hours worth of stories, 29 in total, in no specific order. I hope you all enjoy them. If you do, please be sure to drop a like rating. Let's aim for... Let's go for 2,000 likes on this one. It's been a little while since we've done that, and I think if everybody took a quick second to drop a like, we can make it. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated as I post content just like this as often as possible, and I would love to have you here. We are less than 500 subscribers away from 111k, so every like, every comment, everything helps. Enjoy the video, and as always... I hope you all have a great night. I don't want my mattress anymore. It's got my ex-boyfriend's sweat in it. His skin flakes, a mixture of wood smoke cologne ringed with stale body odor seeps from it. When I wake up, I think he's still lying next to me. I don't want to be reminded of him of the things they did on this mattress while I was at work. I don't want to think about all the nights I've slept with him on it, blissfully ignorant. I undress the stupid thing, ripping the blankets and the sheets off to uncover a yellow stained thin mattress, patterned with fading blue flowers. When I was a teenager, I'd taken it with me when I moved out of my home five years ago. I flip it up and away from me. It's hard, like a giant biscuit. I shimmy it across the room and prop it against the wall, blocking half the tallow-colored sunlight beaming through my only window. When I sit on the metal frame and release a long sigh, I drive for nearly an hour beneath the darkening sky to the light industrial quarter of the city where dusty streets are lined with tall signs lettered with jumbo font advertising furniture stores, and I park in front of a mattress warehouse, wandering the expansive store. I sit on a random mattress and bounce a few times to test its comfort while sneaking a hand down to the giant laminated price tag. My eyes widen at the price. I let the tag swing down and get up, my neck craning as I scan the sprawling warehouse for any signage. Curious if they got a budget section. I find a nest of mattresses, thin and cheap looking, and step towards the one with a big sale sign. Can I help you there? My head jerks forward. The man's voice is so close I nearly scream. I turn to see a short, thick set man with black hair slicked down over his skull. He's around my age and a little familiar. His hands are up. Sorry, didn't mean to scare ya. He clears his throat. These carpeted floors make me quiet as a mouse in church, I swear. He taps the floor with one foot. His grin tightens half his face, wrinkling the skin so tight his right eye closes. It jogs a memory. I know this guy. That's okay. I turn and look at the mattress again. How much is that one? I point to the cheap looking queen mattress with the giant sail tag. You like that one? He grunts as he squats to check the price tag. His button shirt accordions under pressure and through the gaps I see a yellowed singlet. Let's see. 499. He looks at me dark eyes bulging. It's Marty. Marty from elementary school. This guy had a crush on me, sent me a Valentine's Day card asking me out. I'd rejected him. The next day at recess, he snuck up behind me and pulled my pants down in front of everyone. No one had yelled or laughed, just stared. I'd pulled my pants back up over my yellow underwear and ran. In no direction, I ran and cried until my legs gave up and I collapsed in the middle of a golf course. Oh, that's a good price, I say, turning away from the bed. 
Hey, you're Shirley. He points with one eye closed. Right? Tanglewood Elementary? I sigh and nod. Marty, right? He stands, glancing at me for a moment before staring at the carpet. He rubs the back of his neck and his ears turn red. Damn. He shakes his head as though struggling to find words. Look, I'm sorry about what happened back then. How I acted. No, no, don't worry about it. I should go. I search for the exit but can't see it. I was meant to say, I'm really sorry, Shirley. I shouldn't have done that. I was wrong. I fiddle with my purse straps. We were just kids. Plenty worse has happened. That's not an excuse. He sits on the cheap mattress, rubbing his head. I knew better. That was horrible what I did, and I never apologized to you. His dark, wet eyes turn up at me. I'm so, so sorry, Shirley. I stop fiddling. A ball of warmth breaks in my chest and I nod and sit down on the mattress across from him. Thank you, Marty. I appreciate that. Is there anything I can do to make it up to you? I shake my head. The apology is enough. Slapping both hands on the mattress, Marty's eyes charge with energy. Hey, you know what? What? I'm going to give you a great deal on a mattress. I chuckle. You don't have to do that. Not just any mattress. The best we have. He gets to his feet. Come on, I'll show you. I get up and follow. You don't have to do that, seriously. He paces across the store in long strides, then turns back to me and keeps talking as he walks backwards. It's new technology. Just came in. We customized it and everything. He turns forward and leads me to showroom where the mattresses are thicker and fluffier, and the signs are bordered with gold that shimmers under the soft lighting. No way I can afford these. He waves my words away. Try this one. He points to a mattress of lavishly sculpted white fabric. I shake my head looking at him. He issues that cheesy grin. Scrunching half his face. Trust me, my fiancé loves it. Snores like a baby, and I'll customize it just for you. I'm surprised and relieved to hear he's got a fiancé. I return the grin and lay on it. As though being cradled, the mattress seems to shape itself to my body as it absorbs my weight, gently supporting it. Wow. Told ya. It's like sleeping on a cloud. I smile. Okay. Let's do it. I spend a week sleeping on the couch before the mattress is delivered. To my surprise, Marty's at the door when I answer. He's got on a white collared shirt and a red tie. With his sleeves rolled up and he's standing next to a tall man in blue overalls. I didn't realize salesmen deliver too. He smiles. No, not usually, but I just... I wanted to make sure it's perfect. Make sure there's no problems. Nodding, I show them through to my bedroom. They make short work of removing my old hard biscuit mattress and carry in the new one with specific metal handles attached along the mattress's side. With great care, almost dignity, they move it onto the base, shuffle it gently into an exact position. They stand back to admire their work. It gleams fresh and white like a giant eraser, and I feel lighter on my feet. Relieved to have jettisoned all physical traces of my ex-boyfriend. Wanna lay down? Make sure it feels right? I shake my head. Oh no, it's too nice to lay down on. I smirk. The men share a laugh. I have to go to work soon anyway. Marty nods and looks at the other men. Can you grab the paperwork? The man returns to the truck. Marty glances around the room at the crumbling metropolis of makeup atop my dresser. The open closet with clothes spilling out. The sci-fi books on my bedside tables. So, I was wondering if you want to catch up for a drink sometime. Reminisce on the old days. He grins, hands in his pockets. 
I'm standing just inside the bedroom doorway, and he's across the room from me. I cross my arms. We didn't really know each other. He shrugs, peering into my closet. Maybe we can change that. I don't know. I don't think that's a great idea. He turns to me, brow furrowed. Really? He snorts. I don't mean that way. I've got a fiancé, Shirley. Jeez. I just thought you might want to treat me to a cup of coffee or something. To, you know, thank me for all this. It wasn't cheap. He opens my blanket box and casually peers in. Have you got a mattress protector? My gut tightens, forcing out all my breath. Before I can speak, I swallow hard. Can you not look through my things, please? He shuts the box and smiles. Hiding secrets, Shirley? I didn't ask for the mattress. You offered. Come on. He spreads out his arms. Don't be like that. My back's against the door jam, one foot in the hallway. Maybe this wasn't such a good idea. I say, rubbing my arms. From down the hall, I hear the man in overalls returning with the paperwork. His approaching footsteps cause my muscles to relax. Don't be silly, Marty says, swiping a black stick of hair from his forehead. I was just joking around. As I sign the paperwork, Marty steps past me and I catch a whiff of his hair, the sickly sweet tang of hair gel. In my pajamas, I'm lying on the bed staring into darkness. It's a warm, humid night, and already my skin is sticking to my cotton shirt and pants. The standing fan struggles in the corner, whirring in agony against the thick air. The mattress sucks at my body as if trying to absorb me into itself. It must be the memory foam. I'm just not used to it. Shallow breathing triggers my eyes to snap open, but all I see is black. Was that my breathing? I try to rise from bed, but I can't. I'm stuck to the mattress, fused to it. Coldness fills my chest as I struggle against it, but... It's as if my body's submerging into thick dough, and I can't break free. A glimmer of light at the end of the bed catches my gaze, and I force my head to bend forward and see what it is. Shimmering in the darkness, Marty's eyes staring at me. He's standing at the foot of the bed, grinning. His eyes two silver crescents. The eyes move down to look at my groin. His hands grip the side of my pants. In one hard tug, he rips them off, exposing yellow underwear. I try to scream, but nothing comes. My heart hammers in my chest. The room stinks of hair gel, and a horrible sound cuts it like a knife being pulled through a block. Marty's grin flares to an inhuman size, and he crawls on top of me. His naked arms and legs sink into the mattress, and our limbs entwine. Skin and bone rubbing together. It steals my breath and sends my flesh crawling. I use every ounce of force inside my body to scream, enough to produce a faint squeak that, like a valve, opens into a shrill cry. My eyes open to a pale, sunlit room. Looking down, my body is fully clothed and damp, chest to legs, with cold sweat. I sit upright, catching my breath and hug my legs. The mattress is back to normal. It's just a mattress. It was a nightmare. I rub my head with a trembling hand, wondering if I've ever had a night terror so vivid. The camera is a cheap little white cube. I prop it on the bookshelf, aim it at my bed, and turn it on to record myself sleeping. The night terrors have persisted for a week, and I need to prove to myself I'm not going mad. That Marty isn't entering my room at night. I know how crazy it sounds, but every night, it's like he's in the room with me and I can hear him breathing. The night terrors play out as usual. Shallow breathing that sounds like it's coming from outside me. Sinking into the mattress, and then Marty, staring at me from the end of the bed. 
his eyes and that horrid grin shimmering in reflected moonlight. Three times I wake up, startled, skin popping cold sweat. It can't be the new mattress causing these night terrors. The thought is ridiculous. The bed's so comfortable I feel like the queen laying in it. But still, something's wrong. Like there's a wooden sliver in the lining of my stomach that tightens my gut every time I go to bed. Arriving home, late from work, I grab the camera off the bookshelf. I sit on my bun and plug it into my phone. There's a mistake. There's almost 20 hours of footage. I'd left the camera recording all day. Scrolling back through the footage, a dark mass flashes across the screen. My heart skips a beat. The phone drops from my hand. It's probably nothing. Something fell and passed in front of the camera. I pick up the phone and scroll back over it, but slower this time. Something big moves across the screen. The timestamp reads 4.25pm, about two hours ago before I arrived home from work. My mouth is dry. I press play. On my phone, video plays of my empty bun. From left of screen, a figure enters. A man's legs and pudgy stomach. Because of the low camera angle, I can't see his face. From the bedroom door, he walks around to the side of the, my bed nearest the camera and crouches down, head lowering into frame. It's Marty. What the fuck? I say aloud. Heaviness expands inside my gut, weighing me down like an anvil. On screen, Marty lifts the fitted sheet and grips the two metal loops along the center of the bed and turns them like keys. He heaves the top layer up by metal loops, and the bed opens like a hinged clamshell, revealing a hollowed-out chamber in the bottom half. My hands are trembling, and I nearly dropped the phone, so I laid on my leg and gripped the bed covers. I feel dizzy. The bottom chamber is like a sarcophagus. Foam padding with a cavity carved into the shape of a human body lines the bottom. He steps into it and lays in the cavity while grabbing a clear plastic mask, connected to a hose that curls inward from a hole at the base of the mattress. Marty pulls straps over his head, fixing the mask over his mouth and nose, then slowly lays down flat while bracing the top layer with his hand and letting it lever down on top of him. The bed closes with him inside, facing upward. I look at my mattress, and time seems to stop. This can't be real. Slowly, I rise from it and step away. I go into the hallway. My mind's tangled mess of thoughts. My pulse is racing, and a strong compulsion to run away from my apartment floods my body. But I clench my fists and remain standing. Turning, I face my bedroom doorway and breathe deep through my nose. The cops need to find him inside my bed. I want them to find him like that. I walk backwards to my hall closet, not even glancing in. I grab a coil of nylon rope I use for camping. Entering the bedroom, I grip the end of the rope and roll the spool across the floor under the bed. Halfway, it snags on a shoebox. The space under my bed frame is snug, and I know I can't crawl far enough under to grab it. I slide a bedside table over the rope end to secure it. Stepping lightly, I lift a coat hanger from my closet rack and move to the other side of the bed. Laying on the floor, I slip my arm under the bed and with the questing end of the hook, attempt to fish out the rope spool. The bed creaks, sending a jolt of ice through my spine. Shuffling inside the mattress, laying on the floor, still not breathing. A dark circle catches my gaze. It's on the bottom of the mattress. A black hole. I hover the back of my hand under it. A gentle blow tingles hairs on the back of my hand. Marty's breath. My eyes squeeze shut and I pull my hand away. A vinegar smell punches into my nose. His breath. 
Burning bile rises in my throat and I think I might puke, but after three attempts I manage a hard swallow. Blindly. Quiet as possible. I wave the coat hanger. It bumps something hard. The spool. I knock it towards me further and further until the spool rolls out. Like rotating a delicate cryptex, I pay the rope out across bed with outstretched arms and meet the waxed end held under the bedside table. The nylon rope is strong. It's like climbing rope. But I don't trust one length enough, so I repeat the process three more times. Rolling the spool, hooking it on the other side, and then looping it over the top. As I'm paying out the fourth band of rope over the bed, the spool slips from my hands, rolls off the bed and onto my bedside table. It knocks into a glass of water, and the glass upends off the table and breaks on the floor. Breath hitches in my throat, and every muscle in my body tightens. Shuffling noise inside the bed. To a loud grunt, the bed starts to open. I jump onto it, my weight snapping the mattress shut. Knees spread at the center. I lean over and reach for the rope spool. I'm sent a few inches in the air as he tries to push me off, but I shift my weight in time. The rope spool is just out of reach. His attempt loosened the loops, planting all fours on the center of the mattress. I raise my chin and spot my phone on the floor. It must have dropped from my pocket when I jumped on the bed. No way to reach in. My body is raised into the air as he pushes up the mattress lid, but within seconds it slams shut again. He's grunting and I can hear the air blowing and sucking through his breathing tube. The rope loops around the bed are looser. Another push and they'll be useless. Now's my only chance. Eyeing the spool, I lunge off the bed, grab it, then grab the rope end, pull them tight and tie them together. Drawing the tie of rope taut against the mattress, I work through two knots. The lid cracks open and pushes against the rope loops. Marty coughs and chuckles as he lowers the lid. My heart's beating so hard it hurts my chest. I quadruple tie the knots, grab my phone and hop back onto the bed. You're not getting away with this, you fucker. I rasp between heavy breaths. Kneeling, I dial 911 and I speak to the operator. I explain that there's a man in my house and to send the police. The operator takes my address and asks me to stay in the line until police arrive. One of the bands of rope saws back and forth across the bed in rapid bursts. I grab it in one hand and it comes away loose. Leaning on all four as I peer over the edge of the mattress, a small knife blade juts out the sign. The blade finishes cutting the second loop and begins sawing the third. While the third loop frays apart, I tell the phone operator that Marty's going to get out and that he's going to try and kill me. Can you run? Can you leave the apartment? Yes. Then run now. Get out and yell for help. But what if he... The mattress rushes into my face as though hit by a wave. The room tilts violently and I'm sliding off the mattress and collapsing onto the floor. Pressing the floor hard with both palms, I pull my legs under me and lunge out of the bedroom. At the hallway closet, halfway to the apartment door, I stop. An image enters my mind of me as a girl, running away, crying after Marty ripped my pants down. I'm not that kid anymore. I open the hallway closet and grab my squash racket. I turn back to face the bedroom holding up the racket with both hands. Marty emerges hunched over in a stained, disheveled singlet and pair of tracksuit pants. I don't want to hurt you. He says, stopping just outside the bedroom doorway. His body is turned sidelong. One hand is held up in surrender while the other hangs nearly out of view gripping the knife. His black hair is scuffed and falling in his face. With the knife hand, he swipes the hair across his forehead, uncurtaining, bulging dark eyes that lock onto mine with intense ferocity, as if at the point of ignition. Within them, 
struggles a competing mix of fear and violence. Get out of my way. I widen my stance, gripping the racket tighter. The police are coming. I say flatly. He steps closer. I hold the racket higher, ready to swing. Gritting his teeth, a large vein pops from his skull and his chest rises and falls like an accelerating piston. Staring him down, my heartbeat slows and my breathing evens out. Go on, I say firmly. Try and get past me. He grins. I'll cut you. He says in a shaky voice. I take a step towards him. I'll break your face. He giggles nervously, nose wrinkled, spittle flying from his mouth. Then his eyes drain of energy and shaking his head as though in disbelief his posture slackens. The knife drops from his hand and clatters to the floor. Eyes half closed, he dips his head. He's no longer looking at me. I lower the racket. Marty crouches to the floor and sits, back against the wall. With shaking, almost panicked breaths, he hugs his legs and rocks back and forth. A sharp, singular wail releases from him, and he starts crying the way a toddler cries after being injured, howling and sniffling, eyes red with tears. I put the racket back in the closet and lean against the wall and watch Marty. He grows quiet, sirens blare in the near distance. The horizontally slatted light of sunset laces Marty's body in a red glow as he rocks against the wall, sucking his thumb with his eyes closed, muttering in tongues like a madman in prayer. We hear it every night at 12.01. The sound of a helicopter is heard circling around every house on our street for one hour. This has been happening for three years straight. No one has ever seen it as we are too scared to look. At 12.01, we immediately hear it. But since we live in the middle of Cedar Road, towards the end, the sound is far away. That gives our dad a chance to place the sheets of metal he got from work in the windows. He brought them home the day after this started happening. He came home and had me help him bring these pieces of metal in, cut up to fit the window perfectly, because we live near the end of the street. It also gives us a chance to get back and hide somewhere. We aren't quite sure why we hide because we still don't truly know if this thing is a threat to us. I was 12 the first time this happened. My brother was 10 and my sister was 7. It was a Friday night and at first we thought it was just any old helicopter you'd hear. We all always had a fascination with planes or helicopters and we would always look and watch them fly by. So the first time we heard it we all ran to the window to see it. It was muffled indicating it was still at the other end of the street but we still should have been able to see it. But something weird happened when we did. The first thing we noticed is we didn't see it. There were no lights or anything. Another thing that I thought was weird was when we looked out the window. We heard no sound. And not just no sound from the helicopter, but no sound at all. No crickets or any other nighttime sounds. It was just dead air. But when we backed away from the window, we could hear it again. My dad noticed it too, and that's why we never try to look at it anymore. We all find it very strange. It stops all of us from sleeping early. We are too scared to go to sleep early. Something just keeps us awake to hear the helicopter. Because of this, everyone's bedtime is 1am. Not that my parents are happy about it. They have tried to tell us to go to bed early, but once it gets later in the day, the thought of sleep leaves our mind and we have to stay awake. I don't know if it's a hypnosis, fascination, or obsession. It circles around every house twice before moving on to the next one. We know this because our neighbors all hear the same thing we hear. For us, it starts muffled. 
but it gradually gets louder and louder until it reaches our house. We know it's at our house because it's at its max sound and the house will begin to vibrate. We know when it moves on because the vibration will stop. All of our neighbors tell a similar story. Of course, except for the Worthingtons, the Wallaces, and the Doyles, who are the first few houses on the street. They hear it loud immediately at first, then it gets muffled. We had a standard procedure and it worked. I'm now 15, my brother is 13, and my sister is 10. When the clock hits 11.30, my sister Jessie runs over to me, and she stays with me until the helicopter goes away. She and I have always been close, so she feels safe when she's with me. We kind of became desensitized to the whole thing. Sure, we still have a slight uneasiness due to the ambiguity of the situation, but it doesn't get our anxiety up anymore. It's just like a daily routine now. It's always the same sequence. Help Dad put up the sheets of metal, shut off all the lights, make sure the doors are locked, get to our safe spot, and wait until 1am. We did this for three years, and everything was fine. Until one night, when the routine was interrupting. The day was going as normal. We all got up and went to school. Because my high school let out earlier than Jesse and Blake's, I would walk to their school and get them, and we would all walk home. We would stop to talk to the neighbors, as we all knew each other. We hadn't seen the Wallaces, though, because they were out of town. My friend Alex came out of his house and ran up to the fence as we walked by. What's going on? Alex asked. Alex and I have been friends since we were in first grade. Nothing special. Same old stuff. Why? I asked. Can I sleep over? I mean, it's Friday. He asked. Why not? Let's go. Alex went back into his house to get his things. He came back out with his little sister, Missy. Missy and Jesse were best friends. We got home and I asked my parents if Alex and Missy could stay the night. My parents always said yes as they loved Alex and Missy. And my parents' closest friends are Alex and Missy's parents. Nothing changed, it's not like they never heard the helicopter before. They live six houses down from us. They have a similar routine to us. And they knew our routine by heart. So, nothing felt different. The girls ran to Jesse's room. Blake grabbed something from the fridge and sat in the living room while Alex and I went to the basement as we had a better game room down there. A few hours later, I went upstairs to grab us some food and drinks and noticed that the sun was going down. I looked at the clock. 8.10. I went back downstairs to Alex. Three hours and 51 minutes left. I son. Until the fun starts, Alex said with a chuckle. Yeah, we can call it that. I said back. We kept playing games until we heard the basement door open. Jesse and Missy came running down. Jesse sat down next to me while Missy sat next to Alex. 11.30 already? I said. Yep. She said with a simple head nod. Alex and I kept playing PS4 and I kept my eye on the clock. Once it hit 11.55, I got up to turn the PS4 off and I jammed the sheets of metal in place of the windows. I heard the basement door open again. You kids should come upstairs, I heard my dad say. Already on it, I replied. We all walked upstairs. I shut the basement light off and shut the door behind me. We did a sweep of the house, shutting all the lights off and locking all the windows. We started upstairs and moved our way down. The basement windows were already covered and I shut the light off already. I was right in the middle of asking my dad where the metal was for the living room and kitchen windows when we heard it. The distant sound of the helicopter. We quickly put the sheets of metal up against the windows and shut the lights off. Jesse ran over and grabbed my hand. We all walked over to our little safe space under the stairs. 
At first, everything seemed normal. The helicopter got a little louder at each house. I figured I would just sit back and relax for the next hour or so. It would take 30 minutes before it even reached our house. We sat and talked for a while with Jesse right next to me. Almost 25 minutes later, we heard the helicopter getting louder. But over the sound of the helicopter, we thought we heard it. A man yelling, like screaming. We had never heard anyone yell in the neighborhood normally, let alone now when the helicopter was out. My dad wanted to see what was wrong. Are you stupid? I said. Yeah, dad, I don't think that's a good idea. Blake said. I just want to see who that could be. My dad said. I couldn't just let him go alone, so I got up too. No, don't go. Jesse's son. Jesse, just stay here. Don't move. I'm just going to see what dad is doing. My son. I walked out to see my dad slowly making his way to the window. I walked up behind him, and he pointed over towards the other side of the metal sheet. We grabbed him. Are you sure about this? I questioned. Just a quick second. My dad's son. I hesitated, but we pulled the sheet of metal off. We saw a man. He was standing there with his head tilted, waving. We stood there confused. We were putting the sheet of metal back in the window when all of a sudden a spotlight appeared on the man and we heard the helicopter. The house also began to vibrate, but what scared us the most was that the spotlight revealed that the man was Mr. Wallace. His eyes had blood running from them and he was smiling. Joseph? My dad yelled. Dad! I yelled. He couldn't move. I grabbed the sheet of metal and put it back up against the window. I looked at my dad. Why could we still hear the helicopter? We were looking out the window. My son. Because this time it had something to show us. He replied. I thought they were out of town. I said. I thought they were too because I haven't seen them in days. My dad said. What the hell is wrong with him? I asked. We could still hear the helicopter and Joseph started screaming again. We started to hear the helicopter get even louder than before. It's landing. I said. My dad and I took a step back and then we heard a clicking noise. It was hard to describe. Not clicking like you'd hear from your heater or something. It was like the sound people make with their tongue. Only it was louder and more rapid. We had started to hear another noise that I soon figured out what it was. Dad, someone is climbing up the side of the house. I said. We then started hearing glass break every few seconds. Something is breaking our windows. My dad's son. We ran to the closet and told everyone to stay inside and not make a noise and we locked in. My dad and I then ran to the basement thinking maybe we could sneak a peek at the helicopter. Then we moved the sheet of metal. We saw... nothing. We looked at each other with confusion. As soon as we put the sheet of metal back in the window, we heard it again. We then heard something hit our walkway. It sounded like a metal fragment hitting the ground, and that's when we realized that something had just ripped off of the sheet of metal out of one of our windows. Someone is in our house. My dad's son. We walked our way upstairs with a flashlight and some metal pipes we found. As we were heading towards the closet, we saw something come down the stairs. It was a very skinny and lanky creature. It was as wide as the staircase and very tall, but as it hit the bottom of the stairs, it all of a sudden changed back into Joseph Wallace. We quickly ducked back behind the wall and went inside a little storage closet. We sat there for what felt like 10 minutes until it was only 30 seconds when something came slowly walking around the wall and over to the closet. It slowly walked over taking a step every three seconds or so. Its steps sounded heavy, 
Like there was a cinder block tied to its foot. It stopped right in front of the closet and just stood there. We saw saliva dripping from its mouth and listened to its heavy breathing. It finally turned and walked away. We figured it was gone, so we exited the closet and tried to get back up the stairs. One thing we noticed is the front door was open. So whatever this thing was, it could unlock and open doors. We also saw the spotlight of the helicopter shining in. We all of a sudden heard a loud, inhuman shriek. Think of the alien sound you would hear on a video game when it spots you. Similar to the sound the bugs make on Resident Evil 4. We quickly but quietly got back into the spot under the stairs. The creature came running back into the house, knocking everything over. It was throwing a fit, but we just stayed quiet. I held Jesse tight and we listened to this thing trash our house. On top of hearing the helicopter, it finally walked right up by the door to the stairs and stopped. I could hear its muffled breathing. The floor made a creak and we all looked at each other with fear, as whatever this thing was did what I hoped it wouldn't. It started banging at the door. Luckily for us, everyone stayed quiet and no one screamed. This thing just kept banging on the door. The door wouldn't be able to take much more. I then had an idea. My radio up in my room was always on, so I grabbed my phone and turned on my Bluetooth. It connected to my phone, and I turned up the volume to max on my phone and played music. We heard it from downstairs. The banging stopped and the creature ran upstairs. I took this opportunity to run out and try to get this thing out of our house. I ran to the stairs and turned the music off. I started yelling and banging on the wall. It slowly walked into my view and it was Joseph again, smiling and waving. I ran and then I heard the creatures shriek again. I ran and hid behind the front door, hoping that it thought I ran outside. It did and it ran outside too. I shut and locked the door and started backing up, thinking it was over when all of a sudden I heard a loud crash. The thing crashed through the sheet of metal on one of the windows in the living room. I fell to the ground. I tried to look outside, but all I saw was a bright spotlight. I couldn't see the helicopter. The creature slowly walked up to me and leaned over right in my face. It took a breath and started to shriek again, but then I heard a loud alarm. Almost like a loud fire alarm. The creature looked back and jumped out the window. I looked at my phone. 1 a.m. I got up and put the sheet of metal back up against the window as my dad came rushing out. We heard the helicopter go away. But it wasn't like it usually was. It didn't gradually get quieter. It just sounded like it quickly flew away. I leaned up against the wall and slid down to sit. Everyone else came out and ran over to me and I told them what happened. We grabbed the sheet of metal from outside and replaced it on the window upstairs. It was in Jessie's room so she slept in my room. The next morning we all woke up and we were having breakfast. My dad came home and called me over. We went outside and talked. We tried to figure out what happened. What we came up with was Joseph must have decided that he was going to try and look at the helicopter. When he realized that everything got quiet and he couldn't see it, he must have gone outside and looked up. And maybe that's what triggered it. Whatever he saw turned him into some kind of shape-shifting being. The screaming was a trick to get us to look outside so that Joseph could come and get us. We also theorized that whenever he suspected we would see him, he shifted into Joseph. But whenever he was alerted and chasing us or searching for us, he was the creature. That night we got ready for our routine, but we didn't hear the helicopter. The same thing with the next night and the night after that. Alex wasn't hearing it either. Neither was any of the other neighbors. Two weeks went by and we still weren't hearing it. We got the windows repaired and we could now finally go to sleep at a normal time. I theorized that the helicopter didn't finish its cycle down the street because it stopped at our house. That's why that alarm went off at 1. 
The helicopter was still on the streets and it just flew away, never finishing the cycle. After a year, the helicopter has never returned and the neighborhood has returned to normal. I just hope that thing never comes back to finish this cycle. My sister murdered a girl tonight. I watched her do it right out here in the woods behind our parents' farmhouse, the home we grew up in. I'm a hundred yards back, crouched beside the barn. We used to play in when we were kids, but my childhood memories are tainted, polluted in the blink of an eye. She's a girl, a victim, late teens, maybe my age. Her voice, her screams, those sounds will haunt me forever. They were arguing. She was threatening my sister, shouting that she had evidence, proof that my sister had kidnapped this girl's professor. A professor? But why? It doesn't make any sense. Shit. I think she saw me. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Don't move. Don't breathe. She wouldn't hurt me, right? We're the only family we have left. I'd rather die than turn her to the fucking cops. Deep breaths. That's it. Calm the fuck down. I'm gonna look just to make sure. Oh, fuck. She's digging a grave. She's burying the body. Fuck. I need to think. Think about what I'm gonna do. My sister wasn't always like this. Growing up, she was perfect. An overachiever. High school valedictorian. A star in both chorus and theater. Everyone liked her. I looked up to her. Not because of her accomplishments, but because of who she was. How she cared about people. About doing the right thing. Like how she rallied her entire class to volunteer at least one day a week at the nursing home. Or how she stood up to our physical education teacher when he was berating a kid on the spectrum. Her gift was thinking of others. She saw hope where most couldn't. I never lived up to that. Who could? I was rough around the edges. Still am. I was the captain of all my sports teams, soccer, basketball, softball. I was as competitive as she was compassionate, the yin to her yang. All sisters have a bond, but ours was unique. We were inseparable, always had each other's backs. If she was the brains, I was her brawn. We used to have hopes, dreams, but... All those are dead now, buried beside the graves of our parents. It still feels like yesterday, when everything changed, but it's been five and a half years. I was visiting her on campus that weekend. The weekend it happened. It was her freshman year at college. She came on a handful of my recruiting trips, but this was different. She was so excited to show her little sis around. So proud like she was giving me a sneak peek into how bright my future could be. Saturday night she took me to a house party. It felt like everyone knew her. You'd think she was a senior. And boy, or should I say boys, could she flirt. That's just who she was. Charming to a fault. Me? Not so much. I had a boyfriend at the time, so I told all those testosterone-raging leg humpers to fuck off. As the party grew in size, I grew tired of swatting away belligerent douchebags. I bailed without saying goodbye. Little did I know, my sister would never make it home that night. She vanished. Gone without a trace. Initially, everyone. My family. The police. Her friends. Thought a few of the frat bros had something to do with it. Rightfully so, they were acting guilty as fuck. But it turned out to be someone else. Someone not at the party. Instead, it was a predator lurking from the shadows. 
a shark stalking its prey. You saw her on every news channel. She trended on Twitter. Her face was all over Instagram and TikTok. True crime podcasts feasted on her like she was a piece of meat. Everyone wanted a taste of the missing college girl. No one knew what happened, but that didn't stop them from spewing their bullshit theories. Fuck the media. Fuck social media. Fuck it all. The man who took her wasn't who they conjured up their imaginations. He wasn't some lowlife or a freak riding around in a creepy van. He turned out to be rich. Super fucking rich. Educated. Cultured. Born with a silver spoon in his mouth. That piece of shit held her captive for five years. On the day the FBI surrounded his opulent estate, he had six other captives inside his wine cellar turned prison cellar. He killed every single one of them, burned their bodies, including himself. At least that's what the authorities claim. Like a tornado, his infamy overpowered my sister's survival. They coined him the Billionaire Butcher. Netflix is doing a couple specials on him. Better than Bundy? Darker than Dahmer. Fuck Netflix. For years I couldn't sleep. My nightmares followed me, haunted me like my own shadow. Everything was taken from us. Our innocence, our future, our past. We all suffered. My parents and I, we searched. Every day for years, it consumed us. Devouring our psyches. I'm sure some therapist wouldn't psychoanalyze us. That the horror still has us by our throats. Well, not my parents. Their agony was suffocating. Permanently. Two months before my sister made it out alive, my dad left the gas on. The notes said that their souls couldn't take the torture anymore. They professed their love for me, for my sister, too. I didn't know if I was angry with them for leaving, or for not taking me with them. That night before I left to see one of my clients, my parents said something I'll never forget. Family sticks together, no matter what. For the past six months, my sister has insisted their death isn't what it seems. She's maintained that she didn't escape. She was set free. She's stressed that her abductor, the wealthiest serial killer in history, is still alive. That he's hiding somewhere, protected by his family's immeasurable power. She's warned that he's going to kill more women. It sounds like the ramblings of a... a person with PTSD. She's still fucking digging... Maybe there's room for two, or three. Murder-suicide wouldn't be so bad, would it? Fuck this, I'm not thinking straight. I need to rest. I'm going inside the barn. It looks like my parents left it. Some boxes moved around. When we played hide-and-seek, I was the only kid brave enough to descend into the root cellar. No one knew my dad transformed it into a half-decent man cave. While everyone was getting bitten by ticks, I was snacking on fruit by the foot. He is on the hook. I just need a minute. Looking for the light. Got it. What the fuck? There's someone down here, bare-chested in the corner of the room. He's just staring at me. I don't know what to do. He looks homeless. Like he hasn't showered in days. His hair and beard are mangy. I can't tell if he's gaunt or just has 0% body fat. There's a cut on his forehead. His ankle is swollen and bandaged. I'm going to ask if he's okay. Fuck. He just lunged at me. But he was jerked back. He's chained to a thick pipe. He's screaming at me, shouting that we don't have much time. He's begging me to let him go. Oh my god. It's him. The girl's professor. He's swearing he's a former FBI profiler. 
that my sister kidnapped him three months ago. He's claiming that my sister wasn't immune, that she has Stockholm Syndrome, that she killed one, maybe two women while in captivity. I think I'm gonna pass out. He's still talking, but I breathe deep breaths. Fuck. He's insisting she's hunting him down. The man everyone thinks is dead. That these past six months, there were casualties. He could prove it. First, some crime blogger. She buried him in the woods. Next, a private investigator hired by the family. She ran him off the road. He's pointing to the corner of the room. Fuck me. There are maps, timelines, photos, victims. That's it. I have to get help. Wait. I hear something. Shit. She's here. I'll let you know when I turn her in. I'm lying on the floor of my childhood bedroom. It's been a while since I've been in here. My mind is racing. All I keep thinking is, I wish he would have taken me instead. My sister, she came barreling down the root cellar stairs, gun drawn at me, at the professor. I don't fucking know. I blacked out, but once I came to, I confronted her with everything. You know what she said? I could use your help. Those fucking words. My help? Yeah, she could use a lot of fucking help. I screamed at the top of my lungs, yelled at her until my vocal cords snapped. How could she? After all this, she was becoming him. She confessed she was suffering, drowning in her trauma, conflicted by who she was, who she's become. Then, like a bolt of lightning, it struck me. The last thing my parents told me on the night of their murder. Family sticks together, no matter what. My sister is a serial killer. Now, I'm her accomplice. Ever since we were little, my brother Cody and I were obsessed with supernatural happenings ghost sightings, alien abductions, the works, and over the years we've spent our summers investigating them. We stayed local when we were kids, hunting down stories in our community from newspaper clippings at the library in our town, but as we got older we branched out taking our investigating to a national level. A few years ago, after we became bored with the more well-known haunted locations in America, we began our search for places more hidden places less well-known. That's when we found the Society. The Society is a moderately sized online community of people sharing rumors, coordinates, and information of places that have had supernatural occurrences, massive death tolls, or instances of occult activity. So far, we've only had mild success. About as much as you see on a Ghost Hunters TV show. But two months ago, my brother and I found out about Site 49. Site 49 is a long abandoned town in the southern part of Utah that was the location of numerous horrific tragedies. Many of the people in the society attest to it being so haunted. You'll experience strange occurrences just by being within two miles of the place. One month ago, my brother and I were supposed to track it down together right after our time off from work started. But then my brother and I got into a fight. A big one. Probably the biggest of our lives. I don't want to bore you with too many details, but basically it boils down to me wanting it to just be us, and him wanting to bring Tracy, his girlfriend, with us. Now, I like Tracy fine. She's sweet and we've always gotten along, but these trips my brother and I take... They're a tradition. A tradition that thus far have been just the two of us. And I liked it that way. I thought he did too. I understand him wanting to bring her, but I just wanted to spend time with my brother. 
It's the only time we actually get to see each other, as we're so busy throughout the rest of the year with work and family. So, I told him I wasn't going. He said fine, he didn't want me to. And so when he called me during the trip to keep me updated, I ignored him. And when he left me voicemails, I ignored those too. I only just recently played them and heard what happened. I wish I had picked up the phone. What follows is the transcripts of the voicemails he left me. They were pretty clear, so I'm confident in their accuracy. Voicemail sent May 23rd, 351 p.m. Hey, so we finally made it to the motel. Only took about 30 hours. Uh, there's not too much to look at. Just a lot of desert for like 400 miles. Fuck, it's hot. Anyway, I'll let you know if we find anything. We better. You wouldn't believe how much we spent on gas. Yeah, I know. You told me not to take the truck. Since when have I ever listened? Alright, I'm gonna go. Wish you could be here, buddy. Talk soon. Voicemail sent May 23rd, 7.43 p.m. Hi again. I really wish you'd pick up. I'd love to hear from you. It's kind of weird doing this without you. We did some light exploring today. Just drove around and looked at the buildings. We found the gallows where they hung all of those kids. It was pretty brutal. There were rotted stools under the nooses for the kids to stand on. I'm not sure if it was real, though. Somebody from the website could have just come out here and tied the rope to it for authenticity or whatever. Anyway, we're going to rest up at the motel and keep going tomorrow. Talk soon, I hope. Voicemail sent May 24th, 8.01 a.m. Okay, it's 8 in the morning. Way too early in my opinion. But Tracy was too excited to go back to sleep. We're driving through town right now, and I don't know, man. It definitely feels haunted. Like, the vibe here is off. Way stronger than any place we've been before. And dude, there's this really creepy church smack dead in the center of town. Seriously, I'll send you a pic. It looks like they could shoot a horror movie there. There's this huge stained glass window, right? But... What's really creepy is it's not Mary or some religious shit. It has this dude, or what looks like a dude, with antlers growing out of his head and bright red eyes. I can hear Tracy in the background. It's really creepy. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's not a church. Babe, remember we found those Bibles? Oh, yeah, I... And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 24th, 6.33 p.m. Hey, Ethan. So I think this place is definitely legit. We went to the church, and man, the vibe inside is even worse than outside. We heard scratching on the walls and tapping coming from the basement. It was actually creepy. Ah, don't forget to tell them about the shop. Alright, so we walked into the town square, right? Kind of had an old western feel to it. And the fountain. Yeah, there was a fountain in the middle of the square. And there was a statue of the same antler dude from the church. There were a bunch of coins in the water like a wishing fountain. And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 24th, 6.36pm. Fucking voicemail. I'm going to set up an auto-redial app so I don't have to worry about it. Anyway, there were coins in the fountain, but they aren't like regular U.S. currency coins. They're super old. They look like real gold, but I don't know. I'll have to test them. But they have these weird inscriptions on them with a tree insignia underneath. I tried Googling it, but I couldn't find anything. Oh, the shop. It was an old shoe shop, and after we left, we looked back. There was a face. A creepy fucking face. Peering through the window staring at us. Pale as all hell. I almost shit myself. We'd just been in there. 
We were just in there and no one was inside except us. So, it was a ghost, right? Had to be. Nobody's lived there for decades. I can hear a light tapping in the background. What was that? The tapping grows louder. Do you hear that? And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 24th, 6.41 p.m. Cody and Tracy can be heard whispering to each other. What the hell is going on? I'm getting really creeped out. I thought no one lived here. No one does. The tapping grows insistent, turns into aggressive pounding. Dude, what the fuck? The banging continues for several moments, then ceases. Cody's breathing can be heard as he walks to the door and opens it. Hello? Is someone out there? Then the door closes. Well, um, I guess we're going to go to bed now. Talk tomorrow. And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 1.01 p.m. We're currently standing in the meat shop where the butcher chopped up all the kids after the town hung them. Don't be gross. <laughs> what? It actually happened. Or so they say. It just feels disrespectful. Murdering children and then eating them is also disrespectful. Didn't the butcher also go all Jack the Ripper with the women in the town? Yeah, yeah. I guess that guy really didn't have a type. Tracy can be heard laughing in the background. And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 2.04 p.m. Okay, we're in the school now. It's surprisingly well preserved. There's even still chalk on the blackboard and kind of spooky. Can you read it, Trace? I can't. No, I can't tell what it says. Wait. She pauses for a moment, then she gasps. What? What does it say? It... it says you're a nerd. Ha ha, you're so funny. You love it. I can hear them kiss. Did you hear that? And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 2.09 p.m. Hello? It's Tracy this time. A child's giggle can be heard. Is there someone here? I can hear Tracy gasping. Then I hear Cody. Holy shit. You shouldn't be here. We shouldn't? Why not? They don't want you here. Who doesn't want us here? You'll find out. They're not going to let you leave now. You should have left. The child giggles again, and small footsteps can be heard running out of the room. Hey! Wait, come back! And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 6.21pm. We're back in the motel now. We tried looking for the kid, but we couldn't find her. Which is kind of unnerving because there aren't many places to hide here. She was a ghost, Cody. They aren't always corporeal. That's true. Do you really think she was a ghost? You said it yourself. No one's lived here for decades, and the society said this is one of the most haunted places in the country. Do you really think we'd come here without seeing anything? Kind of. I don't even know if I believe in ghosts. Are you serious? You've been ghost hunting all your life. We've never actually found anything. And a voice message. Voicemail sent May 25th, 6.32 p.m. Tracy this time. Do you think we should leave? Do you? I don't know. I'm getting kind of creeped out, Cody. All of this feels a little too real. Yeah, I've felt it too. 
This place is way more intense than anywhere else Ethan and I have gone. We'll leave in the morning, okay? Okay. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 26th, 5.01 p.m. Cody can be heard panting. Get in the car. Ethan, something really fucked up is going on here. This place is real. Everything they said was right. They were fucking right. He opens his truck. The beeping from the open door can be heard as he talks. We went back to the church. We went back to the fucking church. Babe, please drive. Please go. Two doors slam, and the engine starts. There were people in the basement. They were singing this fucked up song. He hums part of it. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 26th, 5.06 p.m. God, they killed her. They fucking killed her. And they cut her up and... Cody, Cody, look. Oh my god. Drive. Fucking drive, Cody. The engine gets loud enough to cut off their panicked voices for a moment. Cody? Cody, watch out. Tracy screams, and then there is a loud crash. End of voice message. Voicemail sent May 26th, 5.10 p.m. Cody can be heard groaning. Shit. My head. Tracy? Tracy? The car door opens. What the fuck? Oh, what the fuck? No, no, let me go. Let me go. Tracy? Tracy, wake up. Tracy. Cody's screams fade as he is pulled away from the truck. There is silence for several moments. Then the phone jostles and heavy breathing can be heard. Someone laughs into the receiver. And a voice message. That's the last of them. I've listened to the voicemail hundreds of times now. I'm really freaked out. There was no attempted contact after the last one. No more calls, no more texts, nothing at all. I went to the police, but they said because they went missing in another state, all they could do was contact a local police department and have them send someone out. I'm going to go look for them. I don't know if that's the best decision, but maybe I'd gone with them in the first place. This wouldn't have happened. If I'd gone with them, they might not have disappeared. It should only take me a couple of days to get to Site 49. I'll keep you all updated with what I find. Two days after my last post, I made it to the motel Cody and Tracy were staying at. It was a beat down piece of shit about 15 miles outside of Site 49, but it wasn't too far so I could see why they chose it. I walked inside the small office and rang the bell for the clerk. A man in his late 30s came out of a back room with a door marked employees only. He was wearing a dirty wife beater and had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I eyed the sign on the counter that read, no smoking, and quirked my brow at the clerk. You need a room? He grumbled. His voice was thick and gruff, probably from all of the cigarettes. I nodded. Fifteen for the hour, forty for the night. I swallowed back the distaste in my mouth. They rented rooms by the hour. This place was definitely a shithole. I pulled my wallet from my back pocket and grabbed two 20s from the small number of bills I had inside. The man slid them off the counter and tucked them into his pocket. He turned his back for a moment to the row of keys hanging on the clips behind the counter and plucked the one marked 14. He handed it to me. One more thing. I said. I unlocked my phone and pulled up the picture I had of Cody and Tracy on the screen. Have you seen these two? The clerk's face turned sour. Yeah, they were here about a month ago. Stiffed me for a night. Do you know where they went? No idea. All I know is I'm out the money for their room. Are you here to settle their tab? I opened my mouth to protest, but... The next motel wasn't for another 10 miles, and I doubted he would give me back the money I'd already paid. How much did they owe you? The man smirked. 
60. Bullshit, I said, then bit my tongue. The clerk noticed. Cleaning fee. You can either pay me what I'm owed, or you can go find another establishment to stay at. I held back the comment I wanted to make about how this seedy garbage fire was a far cry from being considered an establishment, and coughed up the extra money. Pleasure doing business with you. I walked back outside, where my car was the only one parked in the lot. It seemed most other people were willing to drive the extra 20 or so minutes. I put my key in the lock of room 14 and jiggled the knob when it stuck. The room was what you'd expect, so long as you had really low expectations. The walls were nicotine stained, the suggestion of their previously white coating long gone. The carpet was green and so it looked like it had a stain to mark every year since its installation. I didn't even want to think about the state of the bed. I walked over to it and lifted the blankets to check for bed bugs. When I didn't find any, I peeled back the sheets to check for stains. Surprisingly, they looked clean. New. I kicked off my shoes and crawled under the covers, tucking them under my folded arms. If I was being honest, I was scared to go to Site 49. As much as I wanted to find my brother and Tracy, and I did... I was desperate too. I was also terrified. I didn't know what happened to them, who had taken them or what. What if I couldn't save them? What if they were dead? What if, and I hated myself for being such a coward to even think this, but what if whatever got them got me too? It was hot when I woke up the next morning. The AC kicked off at some point during the night, and it was at least 76 degrees in there. I flung the covers off and swung my legs over the bed. I peeled my sweaty shirt from my back and stood. I felt and smelled disgusting. I didn't know if I trusted the shower enough to use it, so I walked to the bathroom and flicked on the light. It was surprisingly clean, so I hopped in and showered in cold water before I got dressed in the clean clothes tucked away in my duffel bag. I towel dried my hair quickly and grabbed my keys from the table by the door. Here we go. I left in the late morning, the sun blazing high in the cloudless sky. The drive wasn't too long. It took about 20 minutes to get to the coordinates of Site 49. I pulled up to a building on the outskirts of the town and turned off my engine. I steeled my nerves for several moments. I could do this. I had to. No one else knew where they were. No one else would be able to save them. It had to be me. It could only be me. I got out of the car. Immediately the heat beat down on me, arid warmth searing my exposed skin. Cody was right. It was fucking hot. I approached the building I parked my car next to. The windows were coated in grime, but after wiping it off with my hand, I cleared enough to peer inside. It looked like an apothecary. Large cabinets with small drawers housing bottles of medicine lining the walls around the room. There were rows of shelves next to the counter, mason jars filled with pig feet and cow's tongue. I made a face and backed away from the store. I doubted they were in there. I walked down the wooden steps and back out onto the dusty road. They could be anywhere. I didn't even know where to start. You shouldn't be here. I started and whipped around, looking into the face of a child. A young girl. Was she the same one from Cody's voicemails? You shouldn't be here. She repeated. She was very pale and very thin. She looked malnourished, like she hadn't eaten in weeks. Maybe longer. Her hair was mousy and thin, bald patches marking parts of her scalp. I couldn't tell if she was real or not, just like Cody couldn't. Cody wasn't lying when he said we'd never really seen any evidence of the supernatural on our trips. Occasionally we heard scratching, sometimes breathing, but we usually just chalked it up to the power of suggestion. Over the course of our lives and the years, we'd spend tracking down things that shouldn't exist. 
We never found any concrete evidence that they did actually exist. So when looking at this child, this dirty, hungry child, I didn't see a ghost. I saw a poor kid that needed to eat. I'm looking for my brother and his girlfriend, I said. Have you seen them? I pulled out my phone and showed her the same picture I'd showed the clerk at the motel last night. The girl's face remained expressionless. She stared at the picture for a while, though. Longer than would be normal if she didn't know them. I told them they shouldn't be here, she said. What? You remember them? Do you know where they are? I crouched down to her level and firmly grabbed her by the arms. I looked into her face. Please, I have to find them. They're in danger. Please tell me where they are. I told them they shouldn't be here. The girl said again. Then she cupped my face with her small hand. And neither should you. Now you're stuck here. Just like them. Then she grinned at me. A rotten, blackened horror. And widened her jaws to bite my arm. I screamed and tried to shake her off, but she was latched on with the ferocity of something much stronger than someone as small as she was. I yanked on her hair, but as I did, it came out as a thick clump in my hand. What the fuck? She took another bite, and when her jaws were briefly unclamped, I grabbed the back of her neck and thrusted her away from me. She fell onto her back and rolled into a crouch. She snarled at me, baring her bloodied teeth as she prepared to pounce. I looked around for something, anything that I could use. I spotted a large rock and snatched it up. Then, when she was almost on me, I smashed her over the head with it. Her head made an awful cracking noise and she fell to the ground with a heavy thud. She was still twitching when I got to my feet. I panted heavily and tore off the bottom of my t-shirt to wrap over the bite marks in my arm. They were deep oozing blood down my hands so that it dripped onto the dusty ground beneath my tennis shoes. The girl groaned and tried to move, but she couldn't. Either the hit had paralyzed her, or she was too weak to do anything. I rolled her over onto her back. Where are they? I growled between clenched teeth. She took gasping, wheezing breaths as she lay there on the ground. I thought for a moment she was too weak to even speak, but then she looked right into my eyes and said, You should have left when you had the chance. And then she laughed that high, childish giggle that I had heard in Cody's voicemails. I gripped the rock harder and smashed her in the head with it again. Once, twice, three times, until she stopped laughing and her brain matter looked like ground meat. I stumbled to my feet, breathing hard, and let the stone fall from my hand, and then I vomited. I braced my hands on my knees as my body convulsed, the force of it arching my back so that my stomach upended its contents. They landed on the remains of the dead girl. I vomited some more. Eventually, I stopped puking, and I spit a few times to get the acrid taste out of my mouth. I just murdered someone. A little kid. I felt dirty, tainted, like I'd lost some pivotal part of myself that I'd never get back. And I would never get it back. I sniffed hard and wiped my mouth. I had to go. Whatever I had done, it paled in comparison to what would happen to Cody and Tracy if I didn't find them. I swung around looking at all the buildings in this crazy fucking town, thinking desperately about where they could be, and then I spotted it in the distance. The church. A big, hulking thing with tall spires piercing the sky. I knew immediately that that was where they were. I threw open my car door and shoved my keys into the ignition. The engine caught and I pressed hard on the accelerator as I whipped the steering wheel around. It took about two minutes to get to the church. I slammed on the brakes and flung the door open. The church was a large structure made mostly of stone. Most of the windows didn't have glass. Rusted metal bars crossed over the openings. 
As I stared up at the church, my fervent anger faltered for a brief moment as I was confronted one more time with the enormity of what I could be walking into. And then I heard my brother's voice in that last voicemail, panicked and terrified, helpless. I yanked open the heavy wooden doors. They swung wide, a mouth yawning open to inhale that which chose to enter in. I walked inside. It was quiet. Most places this far removed from society usually were. The freedom from noise pollution providing a profound lacking that was as noticeable as any sound. There were rows and rows of wooden pews, standing at attention and facing the front of the church. There was a podium at the tip of a raised dais. A large and leaden-looking book laid open on top, and behind it, where there should be a cross hanging from the wall with Jesus mounted to it, there was nothing. Instead, there was a large tree, its limbs outstretched and reaching for the ceiling. The face of the man with the antlers was carved into the trunk. With such acute detail, it looked like he had been real once, and had melded with the tree over time until they were one and the same. Staring at that tree felt wrong, like I was peering into something that wasn't meant for me. I felt like I was staring at millennia of history, but that history was only for a certain kind of person. It had spent all of those years growing around me, unfurling itself in directions I had never gone, its path far removed from my own. Until now, when we had reached our convergence point, my shoes scuffed against the concrete floor. I took small steps until I reached the dais, and I climbed the steps to the podium. I looked at the book and ran my fingers over the insignia of the tree that was so significant to this town. I flipped the book open to the middle. There was a picture of a man holding a woman in his arms. He held her face up to his and for a moment it looked like they were kissing, and then I realized he was eating her. His teeth dug into the skin of her cheek, and the picture was so detailed I could see the sinewy strings of her exposed flesh. Under the picture there was an inscription that read, The man celebrates the sacrifice of the woman by treasuring her offering. I stepped away from the book in disgust. Everything pointed more and more to this place being the home of a cult. And not just a cult, but a cannibalistic one. I thought of the girl I had killed, and how she had taken a couple chunks out of my arm. How she had looked malnourished, like she hadn't eaten in a very long time. And Cody and Tracy being kidnapped after they had come to this very church. And then it hit me. This place was never abandoned. The people that lived here had never left. I heard music then, the muffled sound of piano keys being gently stroked somewhere beneath my feet. It was a slow song, a song that meandered through its tempo instead of rushing through it. I looked around trying to find a way to the lower levels of the church. There was a door that, from the position of the podium, was hidden behind the tree. I walked over to it, resting my ear against the wood to listen for the music. It was coming from there. I twisted the knob and pulled the door open just a crack. It led to a stairwell that was dark and dank. I stepped inside and went down the stairs, pausing at the landing to peer around the corner. It led to more stairs. As I walked down, I could hear the gentle humming of voices I couldn't hear before. They droned in unison. The melody haunting and eerie. It sounded like the same song Cody had hummed in his voicemail. I reached the bottom of the stairs. A long stone hallway stretched before me. Several doors leading off on both sides, but the music was coming from the door straight ahead. So that was the one I moved toward. The music was picking up pace. The humming more erratic. They were grunting now, yelling, desperation lilting the notes as they sang them. I shivered with revulsion. There was something so wrong about this song. Something off. 
It felt unholy, like it was sucking all of the good from the air, replacing it with something dark, something sinister. I reached the door. The music was at its height, the rhythm cresting to its crescendo that sounded like a pulsating heartbeat. And then with a final, anguished cry, it seized. The door was parted slightly. I peered inside at the scene beyond. It was similar to upstairs, but smaller. There were several wooden pews set in a line on either side of the aisle, big enough for the two or three people sitting inside them. The room was well lit with dozens of candles. A woman stood in the front, clearly respected as every person's eyes were trained on her. She held her arms aloft, her blood red, chusable. Her blood red chasuble obscuring the table behind her. Today we celebrate the gifts that our gracious Lord has sent to us, she said, her voice clear and strong. In times of difficulty, such as we have been in for these past many years, we need only pray to the Savior, our Lord, who has blessed us and blessed us again. People in the pews were nodding and beating the air with their hands. He is forgiving, our Lord, and through his mercy we have this bountiful reward. She gestured behind her and moved so that the room could see. There was a large mica table on a raised stone floor. The body of a heavy set man was strapped to the table. My stomach lurched. The man was still alive fighting sluggishly against the leather straps that bound his hands and feet. Were they going to kill him? Was this a sacrifice for their so-called god? The woman brandished a glass knife from inside her sleeve and moved around to the other side of the table. As her hem grazed the floor, I could finally see the face of the person they had strapped down. I had to clamp my hand over my mouth to keep from screaming. It was Cody. It was my brother. We thank thee, O Lord, for blessing us with that which will sustain us beyond our tribulations. Oh my god. They were going to kill him. I cast a panicked glance at the people in the pews, their thinning hair, the bones of their backs visible through their shirts. They were going to eat him. The woman plunged the knife into Cody's sternum and dragged it down his belly button. He screamed through the gag in his mouth, but she just smiled and tore further down to his waistband. Blood poured onto the table and leaked onto the floor, where there were bowls to catch the drippings from my brother. She peeled back his skin to reveal his intestines, which she took out and put on plates that were lined up on the table. She licked the blood off her fingers. Cody was dead before she finished. I fell to my knees and dry heaved, my stomach empty from earlier when I had killed the girl. My head was buzzing and I felt like I was on the verge of insanity. How could someone's life end like that? So cruelly. So suddenly. The only reason I didn't charge into that room is because there were too many of them, and I knew I would end up like Cody if I did. And then I remembered Tracy. I had to find Tracy. I didn't know if she was still alive or if they'd already eaten her, but I had to find her. I knew Cody would want me to. I stumbled to my feet, leaning on the wall to steady myself. I faced the way back to the stairwell and I eyed the doors, having no idea which one Tracy would be in. There were so many. Where was I supposed to start? I picked one at random. There were beds inside, four of them positioned across from each other. They were made up neatly, the cleanliness suggesting a normalcy these people did not possess. I left the door open and tried another room, another bedroom, and another, and another. How many people lived here? I tried a door that led to an office, though... Through it, I could see a smaller door. I ran over to it, hoping it wasn't just a closet. 
it wasn't. There was a smaller staircase that led down into pitch black darkness. I glanced behind me quickly to make sure no one had seen me and I closed the door quietly behind me as I stood on the landing of the stairs. I pulled out my phone. I needed to call the police. It was too much. It ran so deep and I would be lucky if I made it out alive. I checked the reception in the corner. No signal. Of course. I pushed out a shaky breath and descended the stairs. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and pointed it in front of me. I was in a basement. The floors were dirt and there were several wooden posts holding up the ceiling. There was blood on the ground. I couldn't help but think about how it was Cody's, how he'd resisted them, and how they'd probably beaten him for it. I shook my head. Now wasn't the time to think about that. His death would mean nothing if Tracy died too. A muffled scream and the rattle of chains. I swung the flashlight around looking for the sound. There in the far corner of the basement was Tracy. She was crying and tugging on the chains desperately. I rushed over to her and pulled the gag from her mouth. Ethan. Fuck Ethan. They took Cody. They took him. You have to find him. I tried not to look at Tracy, but I knew she should know. Tracy? I started, but I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. I couldn't say it out loud. I didn't want to make it any more real than it already was. We stared at each other for several beats, and I watched as the realization dawned on her. No. She sobbed and shook her head as more tears fell. He was just here. Right here. I grabbed Tracy's face and forced her to look at me. Tracy, we need to focus. The last thing Cody would want is for us to die, too. We have to get out of here. For him. She nodded but kept crying. I pointed the flashlight at the cuffs. They were leather at her wrists, but metal where they were looped around one of the wooden posts. They had a keyhole to unlock them, but I doubted I would find it down here. I need to find something to get you free. I told Tracy. No, no, you can't leave me here. She pleaded. I'll be right back. We're not getting out of here if I can't get the cuffs off. She begged me not to go, but I ignored her as I ran up the stairs. When I got to the top, I turned the flashlight off and looked through the door. The office was clear. I rifled in the drawers of the desk for the key, but they were all empty. There was nothing sharp in the room I could use, either. Fuck. I muttered. I would have to go back out into the hall and search the bedrooms. My stomach churned as I grabbed the door handle. I really hoped they were still congregated in the other room. I turned the knob and had just started to open the door when I heard voices outside. I froze, not daring to move, not daring to breathe. The people were talking and laughing, sounding giddy and happy as they walked down the hallway. I was filled with rage in that moment. A feeling so primal, I felt I could rip their throats out with my teeth. My brother was dead because of them. They feasted on his flesh and thanked some god for it. These people, this cult, had destroyed the most significant part of my life. I wanted to burn them to the ground. The voices faded, but I waited several minutes before I left. There was no one in the hallway when I checked, and before I could think too much about it, I ran to one of the bedrooms. I shut the door quickly behind me and wasted no time in looking for something to free Tracy. I searched through the bedside tables and under the beds, but there was nothing. I looked in the wardrobe. Apart from a few raggedy dresses, it was empty, and then I saw a glint of metal underneath one of the pillows. I pulled it out. It was a small switchblade. I turned to leave when the door flung open. I dropped to the floor and crawled under one of the beds. My heart thudding so painfully in my chest, I thought it would soon burst its way out. 
I could see small feet enter the room and hoist themselves onto a bun. They swung their feet back and forth for a moment, humming the song they'd all been singing before they murdered Cody. It was so disorienting to see this small child behaving so normally, so much like other small children, but knowing they had just been eating my brother not ten minutes before. Suddenly the child let out a pained howl and ran from the room. Who stole my knife? It yelled. Who took it? It hollered again and again, demanding to know who stole its knife. And then its shrill voice turned into a constant scream as it stood there and shrieked in the hallway. Hey, calm down. What happened? A more adult voice soothed, trying to calm the child. My knife is gone. The child cried. We'll find it. Don't worry. The child's sobs faded as it was led away. I rolled out from under the bed and hid behind the door for a moment. After I determined the hall was clear, I ran back to the office and to the little door. By the time I got to Tracy, she looked wild with fright. I heard a scream. I thought they'd gotten you. I started cutting the leather that bound her wrists. I'm fine. I said not daring to think too much about whether or not that was true. Now wasn't the time. After a few moments, I freed Tracy, and together we sprinted up the stairs. I pushed her behind me and confirmed the coast was clear. We dashed into the hallway and moved towards the other staircase that led into the upper levels of the church. Did you take my knife? My stomach plummeted. We turned around slowly, now face to face with a little boy. He peered at us curiously, a small smile playing about his mouth. Yes, I did, I said. I grabbed the knife from my pocket and held it out to him, my other hand up to placate him as if he were a cougar I'd encountered in the woods. If I give it back to you, will you promise not to say anything? The kid nodded and took the knife. He stared at us as if we were some wonder on display in a museum. Then he grinned, a horrible and bloody smile, and screamed. People rushed out of their rooms and stopped when they spotted us. We stood at a stalemate for a moment, the tension in the hall thick and charged. Then we ran. Tracy and I bolted up the stairs and out into the church. We rushed down the rows of pews. Her hand and mine gripping me so tightly I felt she might break in. We skirted around the benches and bolted over the carpeted aisle. We nearly made it to the door when she was pulled from me. Ethan, she shrieked, her arms flailing as she tried to grab me. A huge man with stringy hair was dragging her back towards the daze. I tried to pull her from him, but he was too strong. He held her with one hand and shoved me to the floor with the other. I rolled to my feet and looked for something, anything that I could use against him, but at that moment the rest of the people from under the stairs burst out into the days, dozens of them crowding around each other, staring at me and Tracy hungrily. Stay there, the man said to me, and held his hand under Tracy's chin. I took a step forward unsure of what I was planning to do. The man dug his fingers into the skin of Tracy's throat. She cried out in pain. He grabbed his nails across her neck slowly, blood trickling down the rest in the dip of her collarbone. Let her go, I shouted, but the man just smiled. Tracy bucked wildly and kicked off of one of the pews. They crashed to the ground. The man's head cracking against the concrete floor. Blood bloomed where his head made contact. I grabbed Tracy and yanked her up. We ran to the door of the church, the people from below right behind us. We rushed to the car and fell inside. I rammed the keys into the ignition and stomped on the gas. The people swarmed out to meet us, running at the car and beating on the windows. One of them broke the glass on the driver's side. He tried to pull me from the car, but I tightened my grip on the wheel with one hand and punched at him erratically with the other. He 
He laughed. I recognized that laugh. It was the one from Cody's voicemail. The one who dragged him from the car. He was the reason my brother died. I slammed on the brakes. The man flew off the car, the momentum tossing him forward so that he crashed to the ground. I flung the door open, ignoring Tracy as she screamed at me to get back inside. I straddled the man on the ground and grabbed him by the collar. I didn't say anything. I hit him, and then I hit him again, over and over, until his face was so bloody I could barely tell there was a person underneath it. I didn't know if he was breathing anymore. I didn't care. I pulled my fist back to hit him again, but Tracy stopped me. Ethan, we have to go. They're coming. I looked behind us, where the other cultists were closing the lead we had gained in the car. I swore under my breath and looked down at the man, not getting the satisfaction I was hoping from his fucked up face. Tracy and I bolted back inside and peeled off across the dirt. We drove away from the town. Some of the cultists tried to give chase, but they couldn't keep up on foot. We watched them fade in the rearview mirror, trying to wave us down, trying to get us to turn around. Starve, you fucks. I didn't let up off the gas until the town was miles away, the sunlight receding against our backs. After a while, I found the ability to speak. So, can I ask? I hesitated, unsure how to phrase my question. I looked at Tracy and eyed her up and down. Are you asking how I got fat? She said. An eyebrow quirked. Well, she stared at her lap and picked at the skin around her fingernails. They fed us when we were down there, she whispered. I was about to question if they fed her what they were eating people, but she cut me off. Not human meat. It was this nasty green shit. They forced it down our throats with a tube. It was hard to choke down, but they made us drink every last drop. We fell into silence, my anger boiling my blood. Those fucking people. They prepared them like pigs for slaughter, force-fed them to fatten them up, to get a higher yield. Bile rose in my throat and I had to push past the urge to puke. I clenched the steering wheel so tightly I thought my knuckles would shatter under the grip. I whipped the car into the parking lot of a local grocery store and threw the gear into park. What are you doing? Get out. I suddenly leaned over to open Tracy's door. What? I said get out. I grabbed my phone from my pocket and folded it in Tracy's fingers. Go inside. Stay with people. Call the cops and tell them to meet me at the church. You're going back? Are you crazy? Maybe, but I don't care. I'm going to burn that town to the fucking ground. I drove to a nearby gas station. I had to map quest it because I was in the middle of nowhere and I didn't know where anything was. I charged inside the store and nodded at the guy behind the counter. Gas cans? In the corner. He answered, barely glancing up from his phone. I grabbed four gas cans off of the shelf and walked up to the register. I held one up. I got four. I said. The clerk tapped on the screen a few times and then looked at me. 2164. He watched me take the money from my wallet and I couldn't tell if he was staring at me suspiciously or if it was just a smudge on the dirty plexiglass distorting its face. I avoided eye contact. Keep the change. I sat and stepped down, using my back to open the door as the clerk droned to have a nice night. Not likely. I filled the gas cans at the pump, impatiently tapping my fingers on the roof of the car. I screwed the cap onto the last can and tossed it in the trunk slamming the door and getting into the driver's seat. I pulled out of the parking lot and turned in the direction of Site 49, pressing hard on the accelerator. If the cops pulled me over, I'd bring them with me. I wasn't nervous this time. I wasn't sick to my stomach or ruminating over every possible thing that could go wrong. I didn't care what happened to me. 
I wanted to destroy them and everything they had, and if I died, so be it. By the time I got there, it was well into the night. I shut off my headlights a few hundred yards from the outskirts of the town and pulled up slowly. There wasn't any noise or light. There wasn't any sign that there were people living there. It looked like what they wanted it to. An abandoned settlement that didn't deserve to be looked twice at. There was no sign of the lives they led below. I grabbed two of the gas cans from the trunk. I set one behind the building along the rear wall and walked back around to the front. I pulled open the door to the apothecary. A strange sense of disillusionment came over me. I had just been there earlier that day. I had peered through the window not knowing what I know now. Not having seen what I'd seen. My brother was still alive the last time I had been in this building. I let the door close behind me. I checked to make sure no one was coming this way, that I hadn't been seen. Then I unscrewed the lid of the can. I dumped the contents out, drenching the cracked wooden slats that made up the floor of the store. I tossed some of the walls on the counters, every surface until I bled the can dry. I tossed the can to the ground and it made a wet squelch sound when it landed. Then I stepped back outside checking again that the area was clear. I stood beyond the puddles of gas and took the matches from my pocket. I struck one and held it up, staring briefly into the small flame, thinking about the repercussions I would be facing after I did this. I smiled and then I dropped the match. Fire blazed to life, the flames licking their way through the apothecary dancing across the floor and bounding up the walls. The wood was so dry that it didn't take long for the entire building to go up. After a moment, the windows shattered, and I covered my eyes with my arm. I watched for several moments, mesmerized by the beauty of this destruction. And then someone screamed, The well! Go get water! I ducked behind the burning building, the heat kissing my skin as I raced around to the other side. People were running with small pails of water, trying in vain to save it. I watched with relish as they dashed back and forth. They lugged the water from the well, not accepting the fact that the structure was done for. Some of them stood in groups and hugged one another, their sobs filling the air over the sound of the roof caving and crashing to the foundation. Who did this? A woman screamed. Who did it? No one said anything. They just continued to hold each other as tears ran down their faces. The yelling woman let out a frustrated cry and stomped her way back to the church. The rest stayed and watched as the fire continued to taste the night. I picked up the gas can I had set behind the store earlier and then drove around the conjoining building beside it. I was out of the cultist eye line when I got to the other side, so I ran from building to building when I hit the stretch of dirt path that led up the church. A fierce satisfaction shocked my nerves. Righteous anger coursed throughout my body, lighting my cells so that I felt like I could tear the whole world down with only my fingers. I had caused them pain. I had caused them suffering. I wanted to cause more. They didn't notice me as I made my way to the church. To this day, I'm still unsure how. Surely someone was watching the blaze through the windows, but no one stopped me. If I was noticed, I was allowed to pass. Maybe they wanted me to. I opened the door of the church slowly, peering inside of the crack to determine it was empty. The door made a soft whoosh noise as it closed behind me, sucking the air in the room with it. I prowled down the aisle, my step determined and sure. I uncapped the gas can as I walked up the steps to the dais. I poured a puddle in front of the door leading down to the lower levels, cutting off their exit, condemning them to death. I hadn't seen another way out when I was down there, and Tracy hadn't said one existed. I hoped it didn't. After I drenched the carpet, I poured the rest of the gas on the tree, 
I made sure to douse the face of the thing in the tree, as if it were alive, as if I could drown it in penance for what it had done, for the pain it had caused, for the pain it had caused me. I stepped back to admire what I'd done. The wood was soaked, ready to combust under the ignition from my match. I pulled the pack out from my pocket and flicked one across the strike pad. It didn't take. I tried again. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I flinched and spun around. The priestess stood before me, her posture placid, her fingers laced together as she looked up at me with soft amusement. This was the woman who led the ritual, the woman who killed my brother, the woman who licked his blood off of her fingers as if he'd been a tasty midday snack. And why is that? I said, my voice steady, even as my hands shook. My anger flared, boiling beneath my skin until I could feel the heat of it lighting my brain on fire. I wanted to rip her eyes from her head and force them down her throat. I could see on her face that she knew what I was thinking. She took a step closer, daring me to. To put it simply, you'll die. She quirked her head to the side, staring at me curiously, the way a bird stares at a worm before it plucks it into its mouth to taste it. It was the same gesture the little boy had done earlier. I wondered if she was his mother, the soothing voice in the hallway that tempered the child's anger. What makes you think I care if I die? I son. I don't believe you do. She was at the steps of the days now. But it serves our purposes better if you don't. What the fuck did that mean? Let me guess. She sung, a playful tone edging her voice now. The boy I killed? He was family? I didn't say anything. I just continued to stare at her as she further closed the space that separated us. A brother, perhaps? Her hands were clasped behind her back now, that same sardonic tilt of her lips plastered on her face. I narrowed my eyes at her. I felt like she was a lion, prowling forward to test the waters before she pounced and drowned me beneath the surface. You know, he fulfilled his purpose, his destiny. He was fated to be brought here, to provide succor to those who would have perished had he not. To be brought here? I said, my mind snagging on the phrasing. Who brought him here? Why, the glory of the Lord, of course, she said and gestured to the tree I had soaked moments before. We serve him, and he protects us. He picks us up when we fall. He brings us back from the edge over and over again. Lord knows we don't deserve it, but the Lord is a forgiving Lord. I rolled my eyes and scoffed. Rage crossed her face. A sharp and rapid reaction to my dismissal of the thing she dedicated her life to. Her shoulders tightened as her mouth stiffened. You dare disrespect the Lord? She said, her voice low and quaking. I could hear the anger simmering low in her throat. I grinned at her. Lady? Fuck, you are God. She screamed then, an unnaturally high, piercing shriek that splintered the air and brought me to my knees. I covered my ears with my hands as she brought a blade from out behind her back and raised it above her head. She ran at me, still emitting that shrill wail. The cultists who were outside ran in, the rest of them coming up from under the church at the sound of their leader calling them forth. They stood at attention, waiting for the priestess to need them. She stabbed at me with the knife. I let go of my ears to grab her hand. She pointed the tip over my chest where my heart was, pushing into the butt of it with her other hand. She was strong, much stronger than I would have ever thought. We stood in a deadlock for a moment. I stared into her face. From further away, she looked normal, like a regular person. But up close, her skin was thin and translucent. 
her teeth sharp and pointed. Her eyes were almost fully black. There was only a thin, red line at the edge of the large pupil. My arms trembled from the effort of pushing her back. She started to gain traction, the tip of the blade edging closer and closer. The members had joined hands, and they were swaying. Their eyes closed as their voices joined together to sing out that same haunting melody I'd heard just earlier that day. I had to do something. I had to do it now. I smashed my forehead against her nose. She stumbled back, blood flowing down her face like the current carries a river. She wiped at her face with her sleeve, the blood barely visible on the red of her shirt. She spat on the floor. You'll regret that. And then she threw the knife. It carried through the air, N flying over end, and I had barely a moment to move before it buried itself into my shoulder. I cried out in pain, my hands shaking as I raised it to the knife. My shirt was soaked in a matter of moments. The priestess cackled. Then she charged at me. I held out an arm to stop her, but it was useless. She knocked me aside and grabbed the hilt of the knife. She twisted it. The pain seared deep beneath my skin, the tissue grinding and grating against the serrated metal. I was blinded for a moment, everything white and hazy as I dropped to my knees. She pushed the knife in the rest of the way and then yanked it out. I braced myself against the floor and gasped. I had never felt such intense pain before. My shoulder throbbed and I could hear my heartbeat in my ears. I looked up at the priestess. She dragged the knife across her tongue. A red streak of my blood left behind. She took her tongue back into her mouth and swallowed. Your brother tasted better. I wrapped my arms around her knees and shoved her to the ground. We crashed to the floor, our limbs tangling and our heads budding. She elbowed me in the face. My nose cracked under the impact, and I tasted copper on my teeth. I punched at her messily, my fist landing lightly on her ribs and chest. She grabbed my hair, and I pulled my head back to stare into my eyes. I'm going to enjoy eating you. She opened her mouth and positioned it over my neck. Time seemed to slow down, and I felt every second as she clamped her jaws into my flesh. The cultists had grown louder, their song booming around us to the erratic pace of my heart. Her teeth grazed my skin, and then she bit down. She tore at the skin of my throat, and I screamed as she ripped it out. A burning heat spread along my neck. I put my hand over the wound and looked at the priestess. She chewed me deeply, savoring the taste. She pulled my hand away and went for another bite. I punched her in the face, one time, two, three, stunning her enough for me to shove her onto her back. She tried to hit me, but I pushed her arms back and held them down. When I saw the knife, it was uh, laying about a foot away on the carpet of the days. I knocked her head into the floor and grabbed the knife. I stared into her creepy black eyes as I shoved it into her sternum. She screamed, but I only pushed it in further, twisting it the way she had done to me. I yanked it out and did it again, and then I noticed the gatherers had stopped singing. Some of them were crying, and others were looking at me with intense hatred. I could tell they wanted to kill me. One of the men took a step forward before he could take another. I grabbed the matches from my pocket and struck one. The flame danced gently in the stuffy air of the church. I took a few steps back, out of the area that was soaked in gasoline. The man stopped. He looked down at where he was standing. Then he looked back up at me and widened his eyes. His arms held aloft, as if to pacify me. The cultists who were at the door of the church had rushed up to the daze. They began to climb it heading for me, trying to get to me before I could set this place on fire. I looked back at the man, 
I bared my teeth at him. I dropped the match. It only took a few seconds for the tree to go up in flames. The fire blazed towards the ceiling, the searing heat singeing my eyes so that I had to take a step back. The fire formed a half circle on the dais, blocking in all the parishioners on the other side. Trapping them. They couldn't go back down into the church and they couldn't step off of the dais. They screamed and congregated in the middle. The part that was untouched by the fire. The area was too small for all of them, so they pushed the outliers into the blaze. They shrieked and flailed for several moments, their flesh blistering and charring, their hair lighting up like hay. I gagged at the pungent smell. They fell to the floor, their bodies landing with heavy thuds. By the time they died, the fire made its way over the carpet to the rest of the cultists. I turned away as they, too, were consumed by the flames. The priestess laughed madly, her hysterical mirth feeling out of place in the context of this moment. She wiped tears from her eyes. You have no idea what you've just done. A deafening crack split through the room. I turned toward the tree, which was splintering and breaking apart like an animal breaks out of its shell at birth. I watched, horrified as something tore its way out. Claws came out first, long and sharp, as black as charcoal. Then its arms, which looked almost human, but the skin was scabbed and oozing pus. And then its head topped with large, stretching antlers that bowed to the sky. The thing broke out, shattering the tree so that it flew apart, pieces of it tearing through the room like shrapnel. It let out a thunderous roar and spread its arms wide. A long, scaled tail whipped around behind it. I stumbled, but my feet lost contact with the ground and I fell back. I plunged through the air for several moments until I made contact with something. It was the members that had gathered at the base of the days. They broke my fall, but they didn't stop me as I crashed to the ground. Chaos. Everything was chaos. Deafening screams and cries of fright filled the room as people rushed away from the creature. They stampeded to the doors of the church, trampling me where I lay. I gasped for breath, the weight of them crushing me, and then the thing advanced. It stepped on the priestess, the long claws of its foot spearing her body, impaling her. The grin was still on her face, blood bubbling out of her mouth and staining her cheeks in a mock Glasgow smile. The thing leapt off the dais and into the crowd of people. It stood at about nine feet tall, towering over them, who looked like ants beneath it. It moved to block the doors of the church. They stood huddled together, trembling as they stared up at their god. One man stepped forward. My lord, he said, his voice wavering as he clasped his hands together. He dropped to his knees. I have served you my entire life. I have done everything you required of me. I have done everything in service of you. Please, let me leave. The thing quirked its head at the man, and I couldn't tell if it had understood him or not. Then it grabbed the man's head and crushed him between its palms. The others tried to run away, but the thing tore through them like they were ribbon. It slashed and hacked tearing their bodies apart as easily, and scissors tearing through paper. It tossed people into walls like they were rag dolls, their skulls cracking against the concrete before they fell to the ground in bloody heaps. I got to my feet, but I had nowhere to go. The fire was licking its way up the aisle of the church, and soon there would be nothing between me and this... thing. I only had time to briefly wonder if it really was their god when it punched a hole through the last cultist's stomach. And then it turned to me. I had never been a religious person. 
I grew up atheist in a family of atheists. Church had never been a part of my life, and every time someone tried to convert me, I just nodded with humor and moved on with my life. So in that moment, after all the shit I'd seen that day, staring into the face of this unnatural creature that shouldn't exist, it didn't occur to me to pray, to reach out to some god I had never known to save my life. Instead, my mind turned to Cody and I had only one thought. I'll see you soon, buddy. The creature lumbered toward me, crawling on all fours with its tail swaying through the air. Its face was horrifying. It had the smooth skin of a human, but there were no nostrils where its nose should be. Its eyes were bright and blue, and they had an innocent expression in them, as if it hadn't just annihilated dozens of people moments before. It stopped in front of me, sitting on its hind legs like a dog would when it begs for a treat. My brow furrowed. Why hadn't it killed me yet? Why was it just sitting there, watching me, observing me? It reached a claw out then and dragged a talon along my throat. The sharp tip of it nicked my neck. I trembled where I stood, barely maintaining the strength to hold myself up. I closed my eyes. This was it. This was where it ended. Gunshots rang through the church. The creature roared back and swung around with a ferocious bellow. There were police standing in the doorway, six of them, their guns drawn and pointed at the creature. I could see cruisers parked outside, the red and blue lights melding together to create a purple haze. The cops didn't say anything. What was there to say? They just pulled the triggers on their weapons and unloaded their clips at the creature. It howled with every piercing bullet and flinched from the impact, but it seemed to not do anything other than piss the creature off. There was a small window in which all of the cops reloaded their guns, pulling mags from their belts and shoving them into the butts of their guns. This is when the creature pounced. It bent down on all fours and sprang at the men, the muscles in its haunches loading like a spring to launch it forward. It landed on one of the officers, smashing his head into the floor as it faced another cop. The man looked horrified, terror etched into every one of his features before the creature ripped his throat out like it was tissue paper. Another of the officers pressed the barrel of a shotgun to the creature's head and wasted no time in pulling the trigger. It did nothing. The creature's skin was singed, the flesh blackened and bruised, but there was no wound. I didn't wait around to see what it did next. I looked around searching for an exit, and then I noticed one I hadn't earlier. Where there had once been a stained glass window, there was now only a gap in the wall of the church. I clambered through it, not looking back as I did. I ran across the dirt ground towards the apothecary that I had burned down. The flames had long since died and now it was just a smoldering pile of rubble set against the dark of the night. I stumbled past it in the direction of where I'd parked my car. I held my hand against my neck. It wasn't bleeding as much now. It felt pretty shallow. I was losing my energy to keep going, to keep fighting. I felt that if there were a bed in front of me at this moment, I could fall asleep into it and sleep for a very long time. I hoped that that wasn't the blood loss talking. I finally made it to my car and unlocked it. I heard another cacophonous roar in the distance, and I hastened into the car. I started it and pulled out into the road, hoping the thing would let me go. I drove along for a minute or so, and then the car lurched backward. I pushed the accelerator to the floor, but it still wouldn't move. The smell of burning rubber filled the interior, and I could see smoke billowing around the front and in the rearview mirror. There was the creature, holding the car and staring at the back of my head. I took my foot off the gas. The creature jumped onto the hood of the car. The momentum slammed me forward and it was all I could do to bring my hands up to keep my face from smashing into the steering wheel. 
The creature climbed off and turned around, staring at me through the shattered windshield. It stayed like that for a good minute, and then it lumbered around to the driver's side window. It pointed at it, and then gestured at the pavement. The fuck? I pushed down on the window switch, and as it rolled down, the creature and I stared at each other. I placed my hands on the steering wheel as if the creature was a cop and I had just been pulled over. I wished I was somewhere so mundane right now. The creature reached out at me, again, taking a talon of its claw along my neck. I turned my head away and sniffed, fear taking hold of all the energy I had left. My muscles were taut and my breath trembled. I almost wished the thing would kill me, if it meant the end of this misery. And then the creature pulled its claw away and turned around. It walked into the desert. It stepped slow and pace measured. I watched it go until I could no longer see it, and then I tried to start my car. It was a long shot, of course, given how horribly the creature had destroyed it. The metal was crumpled and the windshield shattered. The hood was flattened like a pancake. And when I turned the key in the ignition, my hand shaking so horribly, I had to hold it with my other hand to keep it still. Nothing happened. The engine didn't even make a noise. I had to go back and get one of the police cruisers. It took a while, the adrenaline wearing off so that everything felt twice as slow and my body moved sluggishly. When I got back to the church, I didn't go inside. I could see piles of bodies through the door, parts of people spilling out into the steps. I fell into one of the cop cars, the keys dangling from the ignition, the headlights still on. I put the vehicle in reverse. I turned it around and sped off in the opposite direction. When I got back to the grocery store where I'd left Tracy, she was nowhere to be found. The store was closed. I think it was sometime after midnight, so I drove around until I found the police station. There were two cars in the lot. One cruiser and one civilian. I limped inside and walked up to the receptionist counter. She took one look at me, stood quickly and backed away. Hi, I said, my eyes dropping shut. I tried to ask her where Tracy was, but I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. The only sound that came out was slurred incoherence. I collapsed to the floor, my body refusing to fight as it forced my eyes closed. When I woke up, I was in a hospital room. I groaned and moved to cover my eyes to block out the bright ceiling lights. And that's when I noticed I was handcuffed to the bed. What the fuck? I said, pulling on the metal chaining me to the railing. Hey, you're okay. You're okay, Ethan. I looked to my right where Tracy was sitting in a chair next to the bed. Tracy, why the fuck am I handcuffed? They said it was for your protection. That was obviously bullshit, but they're the police, so I can't do much. She stood up and walked to the door, poking her head out to someone in the hallway. He's awake, she said loud enough that I could hear it from where I lay. She came back inside the room. A cop followed behind her. He was tall with a classic look. A neat haircut held in place by gel and stubble growing along his jaw. He looked like exactly the kind of person who would become a cop. Ethan. I'm Officer Matthews. He held out his hand for me to shake it. Hi, Officer Matthews. I said. Care to enlighten me as to why I'm in fucking handcuffs? His expression soured. He turned all business then. We're holding you until we can figure out what happened at the church. So far, you're the only witness we have. So far. I said. Officer Matthews put his hands in his pockets. We have an officer in critical care. I bit back my shock. How did anyone survive that? I looked back at Officer Matthews and I couldn't tell for sure, but it seemed like he could read what I was thinking, as if it were written plainly on my face. 
So, said Officer Matthews, want to tell me what happened out there? Not really. But I did. I took him through everything that happened, from the voicemails to the first time I went to Site 49 to the second. I detailed the entire day. The more I explained, the more I could see him doubting what I was saying, even with part of Tracy's statement. Collaborating mine, he still didn't believe me. Not that I could blame him. A cannibalistic cult is one thing, but a godlike creature bursting from a tree and killing dozens of people is a little more difficult to swallow. Matthews finished writing my statement on his pad and tucked it into the breast pocket of his jacket. Then he crossed his arms and stared at me. You know lying to a police officer is a crime, right? I leveled my gaze and stared into his eyes. I guess it's a good thing I'm not lying then. Matthews bit back a smirk and left the room. I turned back to Tracy. Did all of that really happen? She asked. I scoffed. Are you serious? You don't believe me either? She grabbed my uncuffed hand. I know you've been through a lot. We both have. She paused. And I could see her working up the courage for what she was going to say next. But sometimes... When we go through something really traumatic, I yanked my hand from hers. I know what happened. I didn't just imagine it. She didn't say anything else, and we fell into silence. I lay with my head against the pillow and faced away from Tracy. Images from that night played through my mind as clearly as if they were a movie. All of that blood, all of that carnage, I'd seen enough of it to last 30 lifetimes. After 20 or so minutes, Officer Matthews came back into the room. He was grinning. Good news. The officer in the ICU woke up, and his story matched yours. Now, you either have an incredibly detailed shared delusion that coincidentally matches up with real events, or you're telling the truth. I'm thinking it's the latter. You're free to go, Ethan. Tracy and I looked at each other. She looked shocked. Like her entire universe had just been shattered. I resisted the smug smile that was trying to make its way to my face. Just like that? I said. Matthews nodded, sticking his key into the hole of the cuffs and unlocking them. To be honest, I believed your story from the start. This place is... He paused looking for the right word. Different, to say the least. There's nothing out of the realm of possibility here. Then he left the room, tucking the cuffs into a pouch on his belt. Tracy hugged me tightly. It took a couple of days to sort things out, but eventually Tracy and I arranged a flight to get back home. We sat together on the airplane, barely speaking, unable to pull ourselves from our disenchanted stupors. Our flight touched down and together we walked through the airport and stepped past the automatic doors and outside. Well... I'll be seeing you, Tracy said, and she hugged me. We held each other tightly, knowing that what she'd said was wrong. We were never going to see each other again. Maybe it would be better that way. See you later, I said as she got into a cab. I waved at her as she pulled away and waited until she was out of sight before I got into my own. The cab dropped me off in front of my apartment I handed him two twenties through the open passenger window and turned around to face my building. I walked inside and up the two flights of stairs to my door, feeling the exhaustion pull my shoulders tight. I took my keys out of my pocket and slid them into the deadbolt. I unlocked the door and kicked it open, welcoming the sight of my apartment. But it felt different now. Hollow. The light shining through the windows felt false, too bright and too warm. All of my things were right where I'd left them, but they didn't feel like my things anymore. This life felt like it belonged to someone else. Someone from a long time ago. Someone far removed from who I was now. It's funny how it only takes a day to change that. I sat down at my desk and stared through the blinds into the street below. A mother walked along with her child, 
his small hand interlocked with her larger one. On the other side of the street, a man and a woman sat and talked, laughing at each other's jokes and leaning into each other. They had no idea what was really out there, what the world was really capable of throwing at them. I pushed up the screen of my laptop and typed in the URL for the society. I had to tell them what happened. I had to tell them about Site 49, about what would happen if you went there. They had to know that some things weren't a joke, that they should tread with caution in the future. But when I hit the enter key to go to the site, this is what popped up. Error 404, page not found. What? An alert popped up on the screen telling me I had just received an email. I moved my cursor over to it and clicked on it. Dear beloved reader, Unfortunately, due to unforeseen complications, we had to shut the site down. We do not have a plan to start a new website at this time. Perhaps we will in the future, but for now, we urge you to find other sources for all things supernatural. The internet is a vast place. We're sure you can find something that will satiate your need to know. We thank you for your support over the years, and we hope to see you again should we ever choose to bring the site back to life. I was about to click off the email, baffled at the timing of this with everything that had happened, and them shutting the site down. When I noticed the scroll bar had room to go down farther than the end of the email, I pushed the cursor down to the end and there, at the bottom, was one last paragraph. And to Ethan, who didn't realize just how far the little flap of his wings would go. We only have one thing to say. We'll see you again. My husband tells me I've been muttering in my sleep ever since one of my twin boys passed away. He says my voice sounds almost identical to our teenage sons, but gnarled and raspy. To prove it to me, he took an audio recording last night. This is what I said on the recording. I know I should be thinking about my twin brother, cold and wet, being eaten from the inside out by bugs, wormy and flitting. Slimy, ferocious creatures with the sole instinct to pick everything clean off the bone. I know I should feel remorse over not focusing on the memories of his young life lived well, or the grief over him being hit by an 18-wheeler when he ran out on the highway. His long intestine unraveling, looking every bit like the average roadkill on a Sunday, and I should be perseverating on the immortality of humanity. The fact that cars continued to come... Tears streaming down my mother's face with each one that whizzed by. And the car that didn't stop. The only evidence of its wrongdoing, a broken front mirror. The one thing that occupies every crevice of my crowded mind is the baseball. The feeling of it gracing my gloved palm at 4.42pm, October 9th. Astros vs. Red Sox. When fate decided this pristine ball was going to be mine... The universe trusted I would take care of it, and take care of it I did. Every morning I would painstakingly wake up a full 60 minutes before school started to inspect it, dust it, apply a few drops of well water, buff it, tell it how it gave me purpose and reason to get up in the morning. Now that purpose is gone. My mother believed it'd be a good idea to stick the ball in with my brother's grave. He used to love throwing it around with you. She said, it's a good way for you to be with your brother. In reality, he always wanted that ball. He didn't care about the thing itself. No, he couldn't stand to see me win. His 16 attempts to steal the ball were all because he didn't catch in. I mean, the reason he was squashed like cream corn by that gigantic big rig is because I started cross country. He never wanted me to be faster than him. I've dealt with this my whole life. My mom did the dirty deed when I was at school. 
She knew how badly my brother wanted it, and whatever brother wants, brother gets. Tonight, I will be having no trouble ripping it from his ice-cold appendages. You see, I loved that ball. For everything it is, not just a symbol of beating my brother, it's my most prized possession. And when drastic stakes hang in the balance, all options must be considered. I've considered mine. I look at the clock perched above the empty chalice of my once beloved property. It is mine and I will take it. I've already hidden the shovel beneath my bun. I reach under and inspect it now. Traces of blotted dirt remain from when I broke ground for Chloe or Australian Shepherd. This job will be no different. Light emanates from the moon, illuminating my path. My room is very orderly in the first place, ideal for situations such as these. No stumbling, rumbling, bumps in the night, absolutely no reason to arouse suspicion. I open my window and duck clean through the frame. I've had to get out many nights before, you see. I close my window to the last inch and jump the four feet to wet grass. Grave sights a mile away. I realize immediately I should have worn an extra layer under my windbreaker, but too late for that. I'm already two minutes later than originally scheduled, due in large part to the time reminiscing about the ball in its most pristine form. My greatest fear, I think, is that the baseball has become grubby, not in an easy remedy sort of way, with general upkeep, a few drops of water, but in the most sinister way in an irreversible way, so that this ball, the most precious thing in my life with the chances of being mine ending up somewhere in the region of 0.000003%, would basically be rendered futile. Ugly, even. But I shake my head to get these dreadful, fanatical suspicions out of my mind and continue the track. It's 4 a.m., Last drunken bums have left the vicinity, and eccentric jogger moms are still asleep. I am the lone human with what some may say most malicious intentions. But there is nothing but love in my heart for my brother. Sure, he always had to be better than me. Sure, my parents loved him more. Maybe I envied him. Maybe deep down I wanted to be like him. Isn't that the stuff of brotherhood? But he has no appreciation for the ball itself, and that is what must be set right. The chill picks up, and on this long dirt road, a straight line to my final destination. I realize the country takes on an entirely new feel at 4, different from 2.30 when I typically experience it. Quite a peaceful feeling indeed. I take solace in the fact that I am rescuing my dear friend. No heart, blood pumping through its veins taking in oxygen, and yet the vibrational frequency still remains of love. How different is it from the love of my rotting corpse of a brother? Wind whistles through these craggly trees, whispering sweet nothings in my ear, encouraging me to go on, into the great unknown, and though I've tracked these dirt plains, forging this similar journey countless times over, like cascading from the moon makes this time feel different. Foreign. Luxury. I can see it now. Rubber center wrapped in yarn and covered with two strips of stunning white cowhide. Then suddenly I'm there. The blooming weeds surrounding the turf echo long forgotten cries of the living. If only they knew the dead don't hear the cries. I walk over to the hill to the small, metal gate, and am shocked to see a tall man, cloaked, staring down at my brother's freshly dug grave. His back faces me, and his very presence sends a chill through my spine. I shudder, then duck, trying to become as small as possible. This stranger staring over a freshly dug grave at 4.23 in the a.m. is most likely not the church-going type. But what if he's here from my ball? Not on my watch, damn it. I remain crouched and slowly peek my head out from behind the gate, 
so that the only crown of my head is showing. I see this long, slender man with the black gloves reaching into his cloak and pull out a sharp metal shovel. As long and devious as he is, he starts slicing through the loose soil, chucking the excess dirt over his shoulder haphazardly. Shuck, thwack, shuck, thwack. My fists clench. Who does this man think he is? Digging up my brother. How could he dare? I look on, mouth agape as he continues his work. Hey. I shout, my voice echoing across the entire grave site, reverberating off each headstone. I feel my face flush immediately, and the blood leaves my body, and my heart is in my throat, not daring to throb every muscle on my skeleton seizing up tight. The hooded figure turns, staring at me. He drops his shovel, which clambers to the ground. I am terrifying. He swiftly reaches his glove into his cloak and removes an object that looks strikingly familiar. My baseball. In pristine condition, practically glowing from the light cascading from the moon. It's never looked so perfect. Not a smudge, dot, speck. Nothing to indicate in any way it's been soiled. How did you? I start. The man places his right index finger to his lips. He then beckons me. He motions with his hand to walk towards him. I take a step forward. The man extends his hand with the baseball over the grave for my brother. No, I yelp. I take another step. The gloved hand turns over. All it needs to do is release its grip and the ball will be muddled. Please don't, I screech. Then with a flourish, the man opens his cloak and pulls out a boy. A dead boy. It's my brother. The man holds my brother effortlessly over the grave with one hand and the ball with the other. The man stares at me. Tears are streaming down my face. I'm a complete, total, utter fool. My brother. I blubber. I suck in all the mucus and liquid seeping out of me. I stand my ground. I want my brother. I scream. The man drops the baseball in the ground and removes his gloves. I gasp at his bony knuckles, completely stripped of flesh. He removes his hood and it's just a skeleton. It stares at me through its gaping eye sockets and places its long, bony index fingers on the temples of my brother's corpse. My brother takes a gulp of air and the tall skeleton disintegrates, leaving behind the black cloak and gloves in its wake. I stand there quaking in my boots. My brother stands up, brushing the dust off of him. He looks exactly as he did before he died. His sharp blue eyes meet mine. I hesitantly take a step forward and muster up the courage. Jack? I ask meekly. My brother grins, something wicked, and suddenly I feel a figure appear behind me. The skeleton hoists me up easily with its right hand, walking me towards the fresh dirt. It's holding the baseball in its other hand, whitewashed and immaculate. Keeping his smile, Jack points to the baseball with a single flick of the wrist. I manage to scream no before I'm sucked into the earth, and it all goes black. I hope he's whistling Sweet Dixie and grinning ear to ear on his way home. He and I both share the common belief. Truly, he did make the right choice. That is a fine baseball. I'm now terrified at the way my living son stares at me with those cold, black eyes. Fog. A dense accumulation of tiny water droplets suspended in the atmosphere close to the Earth's surface with obscures or restricts vision. That was exactly what Joshua and I were looking at. My god. Joshua uttered quietly as he walked away from his car, forgetting to lock in. Matt, what are we looking at? 
He said to me without taking his eyes off what was in front of him. It looks like fog, I think. I answered hesitantly. Not even I was sure about the situation. It looked different from what you would usually see. Luckily, we weren't alone. Gwen and Sam finally took the courage to step out of the automobile. Sam staggered, taking in the view that was in front of him. Have they built a wall around our hometown or something? Matthew, is this why you called us yesterday? That's not a wall, Sam, although I am not sure what it is. Gwen spoke up, following her lover. And she was right. It wasn't a wall. Yet, from afar, it would look like one. The fog seemed to have entirely blocked the view of the village, though that wasn't all. Looking left and right, it seemed to go on and on, almost as if only the town was chosen to be engulfed by the white curtain. None of us had been able to contact our family or friends that still live there. It has been like that for days. Eventually, I grew worried, thinking something might have happened to my sister. Joshua, Gwen, and Sam seemed to have the same distress, so we decided to meet up and check out what was going on for ourselves. Looking at the amount of police cars who were parked at the side of the road, you could understand how worried all of us were. It's definitely not a wall, but I think we should go inside and see for ourselves. I responded. Gwen stormed at me and clutched the collar of my shirt. Look at the amount of cars that are standing just outside the town, Matt. Sam and I have counted at least five police cars, all empty. Either they are already getting help as we speak, or something happened to those officers. Even though she was right, something felt off about the situation. Maybe it really was a crazy idea to go inside, but as stubborn as I am, that did not hold me back. Yanking my shirt free, I wanted an answer. But just before I could, Josh cut me off. That is great and all, but I think you should come and check this out. Joshua had been toying around with one of the cars. If the police was inside, and the cars outside, maybe there was a way of communicating with the officers. I thought to myself. What did you find? Sam asked as we walked up to him. Static. All of the radios of the cars are giving nothing but static noise. There was worry in his voice. Sam took the two-way radio out of Josh's hands to hear for himself. Let's go. He then said in a firm voice, dropping the radio out of his hands. Josh was barely swift enough to prevent it from hitting the ground. He gave a worried look at Gwen and me and signed that we should follow Sam. I nodded. In that fog, anyone could get lost, especially Sam. Without thinking, one after the other grabbed each other's hands. All of us were equally squared. Josh displayed it the most. He walked through the white curtain with his eyes closed and holding his breath. It's okay. The air feels heavy, but it seems safe. He let out his breath at once and started coughing from inhaling the vapor. After a few minutes of walking through the fog, the light of Sam's phone died down. None of our phones seemed to work anymore. It was as though all power and communication was cut off by the mist that we stood in. A barrier of some sorts. Without a light, we were not going to make it far. The further we got, the thicker it seemed to become. It became hard to see what was in front of you. At that moment, I was glad we hadn't decided to drive into the fog. Accidents were bound to happen at this point. We're going back, otherwise we all get lost, Sam said, taking the lead. Then it dawned on us. None of us recognized where we were. It was almost as if we were no longer on Earth, just walking inside of a dark cloud that not even sunlight could pierce. And which way would that be, Sam? Gwen asked him. Not wanting to admit that he was lost, he dragged us along with him, further into the fog. He never answered, although he was determined to protect us in this moment. Then the first house was finally visible, the fog seemingly cleared scarcely enough to see what was directly in front of you. Everything was dead silent. Thinking about it, 
We haven't heard a thing the past half an hour. No birds. Nothing. Not even people. And that wasn't even the biggest problem. Where were the people? I don't like this. It feels like a ghost town. Joshua stammered. Gwen put her hand on Josh's shoulders and pointed into the distance. There were figures, standing still. The further we looked around, the more we saw. They're alive. Josh said in a sigh of relief and wanted to take a sprint to one of the people on the street. He was held back by Gwen who yanked him back and shook her head. How sure are you about that, Josh? Her voice was trembling. My gaze fell upon one of the figures closer to our group. Now I understood what she meant. After taking a good look, I started to wonder if we were even looking at people. It was as if they had started to become one with the fog, their bodies almost colorless, swaying in a ghastly form in the middle of the streets. There was nothing human about these creatures. Maybe they once were, but that gave a whole new set of questions. What are they then? Did the fog transform them into this? Will we become like them? Or are they bringers of the mist? And if they pass the town, they will take the cloud with them. As curious as I am, there was no way I wanted to find out the answer. We needed to leave, and quick. Through the fog, something seemed to approach us. Footsteps echoed from the across the stream. It was the first sound all of us had heard since we stepped into the fog. It was a bizarre thing to behold, but its green light filled us all with fear. A bulb of light swung from left to right like a will-o'-wisp, anticipating you to follow it. Sam was the first to act and swung Josh over his shoulder, who was too frightened to move. When he was ready to grab his girlfriend by the hand, she was no longer there. Panicking, he frantically looked around, hoping he hadn't lost a member of the group. However, it was already too late as Gwen stepped forward, enchanted by the light reaching to whatever it was. Gwen! He yelled at the top of his lungs. The light seemed to halt for a moment. Something was holding that thing, and I was pretty sure it was the source of whatever was going on here. Gwen was too far away to reach, so I did what I could Grab Sam by his shirt and pull him into the nearest alleyway. He did his best to fight himself free, wanting nothing more than to save his girlfriend while Josh was dangling over his shoulder getting very dizzy. He put Joshua down and wanted to make another sprint back into the open stream. It was hard to pull him back, but he eventually collapsed to his knees crying. As quickly as I could, I covered his mouth as the green light drew near. My heart felt it was racing, as if I had just run a marathon. A prayer slipped from Josh's lips, who sat curled up in a corner against a trash can. If anyone is up there, please hear this prayer. Let the light pass. The light drew closer, and a miracle needed a hand, or rather mine. With my free hand, I grabbed the first object I could find. An empty cannon threw it around the corner of the alley. All of us froze up as we saw what looked like a cloaked figure fly by with a staff in his hand. I only saw a glimpse of it, but a crystal was dangling from it. After it passed the alley, Sam took the opportunity to grab both of us by the hand and leave through the other end of the alleyway. On the other side stood a small bus that seemed to have crashed itself into a lamppost. He pulled us inside and slid the door closed. What was that thing? Asked Joshua. I was still trying to catch my breath from running. It was truly a wonder that thing didn't end up changing its route and charge after us after we ran out of the alley. No idea, but it is not going to stop us from getting out of here. But first we need to... Sam said, panting. Before he could finish his sentence, I cut him off. Sam... I understand your feelings, but as long as that thing is looking for us, we can't go looking for Gwen all in the open. With a swift movement, he got up and yanked me by the collar. If you think that I am going to leave my girlfriend behind, then you are dead wrong, nerd. I love her more than anything in the world. I am willing to live to the end of my days together with her. 
he said, determined of the rescue mission he had already started planning. If you want her back, we need to work together. I answered him in a stern voice. Fine. What's your plan, then? He said as he slowly let go of my collar and backed down. Josh seemed to calm down a little as well. The poor guy usually would panic when others got into an argument, since he wasn't the loudest in the room, rather a doormat. Did you see where the light came from? I asked him, hoping that he would catch on. We all saw the damn light. He whispered loudly, not wanting to scream since that could blow the cover we currently had. It's a crystal. If I saw it correctly, it is hanging from a staff. If we can break it, we will have the upper hand. Whoever is holding on to it is luring people to it. And with that, I caught the attention of both my friends, who continued to listen as I explained the plan in further detail. Josh nodded as I gave everyone their roles, then looked up a little scared and unhappy with the situation he was going to be in. Seeing his realization kick in was a funny sight to Sam, who had a hard time keeping his laughter in. Okay, do both of you understand what we are going to do? They nodded, and as quick as we could, we grabbed what we could find within the bus. Everything that seemed heavy enough got stuffed inside bags. As if he had just struck gold, Josh held up something big and started feeling around the object to understand what he was holding. The inside of the van was dark, so it was hard to make out what everything was. Guys, it's a camera. And not a cheap one either, if I am correct. He put it on the floor beside him and started fumbling around the rest of the van. The walls of the van were covered with electrical devices and screens. I think we are in a broadcasting van, he concluded. The idea of a reporter and their team having been trapped here like ourselves gave us shivers. Since the van was empty, we all thought the same thing without saying it out loud. They didn't make it outside the town. You should hold on to that said Sam. Maybe if we get out of here, we can check if it has any footage of what happened. With that, Josh picked up the camera back up again and swung the bag over his shoulder. Shall we then? He said. The trembling in his voice was still there, but he seemed more confident of the situation. We were going to end this nightmare. The three of us had somehow made our way to the plaza. I stood at the side with the bags filled with god knows what. Sam had hidden himself near so he could take action, and Josh? Josh was bait. Cowardly, he stepped forward to the middle of the plaza, looking back in the direction of Sam every once in a while, who kept signing him that it was going to be okay and he should hurry. When Josh arrived at the place of destination, I grabbed the first thing and threw it into the middle of the square. The sound it made echoed and seemed to disappear after a couple of long seconds. A cold sweat had covered my back, but nothing came. The light had not shown itself. I wanted to give it another try, but Sam stood up and blew his cover. A ghostly figure had appeared in the plaza and stunned. From a distance, it looked like another figure that we had seen before, but this one seemed different. Gwen? He suddenly yelled, which startled both Joshua and me. Sam leaped forward to embrace his lover, only to be met by nothing at all. There was no solid being standing in front of him. It was a wonder. He still recognized her. A pair of lifeless eyes stared forward, her body swaying like smoke. It felt as if it was she wanted to say goodbye before she left the world behind. Tears had formed in Sam's eyes, as he knew he was too late to save her, as there was nothing left. I'm staying, he said after a long pause. Even though it was impossible, he tried to embrace the figure in front of him. His tears evaporated into the fog. He had accepted his fate with a smile on his face as he slowly turned into a figure of the fog. The two eternalized in an embrace forever in the fog. Josh had made his way over to me and put his hand on my shoulder. It was time to go. From the rooftops, a light had appeared. 
it had come after all. We witnessed a flash of green falling from the sky and collapsing to the ground. It stepped towards the middle of the square. The closer it got, the more figures appeared. They seemed to follow the crystal. When it reached the center, it stood still. Josh and I held our breaths. Neither of us knew if it knew we were there. The light shone brighter and the atmosphere changed. Wind circled around us and the crystal was heft up high. The fog was being sucked in. And not only that, the figures were forcefully swallowed by the crystal as well. No. I screamed knowing that everyone that once lived in this town was going to be trapped inside. Don't ask me where I got the guts from. My legs moved on their own, and I was headed for the thing controlling the crystal. Before I could leave a blow with my fist, it disappeared. When I blinked, everything was turned to normal. It was day again. Joshua and I had stood there in the middle of the square just staring in disbelief. Our only thing left to do was to go back and leave the now abandoned town. Both of us knew that there were no survivors left. The fact that we were still alive to tell the tale was a wonder of its own. The walk back to the car seemed longer than it had been towards the town. Neither of us had any strength left in our bodies, yet we carried on our feet as we stumbled forward. The police cars were still unmoved, but more cars seemed to have appeared that weren't ours. The thought crossed my mind that more neighboring kids, that by now had grown up to be adults, had passed through the mist almost made me lose my balance. Joshua was luckily there to catch me before I dropped to my knees. We were not alone. I stuttered. How many have been turned into those things while we were there? God only knows if we knew we could have saved them. Joshua replied, his gaze back at the town that was in the distance. No, Josh, I don't think we could have. We never had the upper hand. That thing, whatever was holding the crystal, knew what it was doing. I looked up to Josh, trying to meet his gaze. Do you think it will follow us? To turn us in too? He was scared to finish his sentence. It was something I had thought about as well, but I wasn't planning to find out. Just as I was about to reply, the two-way radio suddenly went off. A flood of screams was emitted from the small object that lied underneath one of the police cars. On cue, we flew towards the radio to grab a hold of it. Hello? Can someone hear me? I spoke loudly in the panic. The answer never came as the screams were cut off and the air grew silent once again. The police never believed what happened to us that day. The camera sadly didn't have more footage other than white noise. So that ended up being a failed attempt for evidence, but they still see the town as a mystery, as most people believe everyone just disappeared into thin air. Little do they know, Joshua and I are still uncertain of what we saw, but our friendship has been closer than ever before. We weren't planning on finding out when or how that thing was going to find us, so our mission is to find it first. My friend Joshua believes that if we break the crystal, we might be able to at least set the souls of the people free. That is the plan, and I am positive we can handle it together. After all, we are the people who were forgotten by the fog. I guess to really understand the problem, I need to take you back. My wife and I have a love story, the likes of which are only heard of in novels. In real life, no one meets their soulmate in third grade. No one sets out to love that person on sight and simply doesn't. No one still loves that same person from the third grade after decades have come and gone, and they've become old and gray. Except, that's exactly the story of my wife and me. Even though we've reached our 70s by now, in my mind's eye, I still recall the first time I saw her. She wore a yellow dress with frilly sleeves and white Mary Janes. Her golden hair was tied up in pigtails with long yellow ribbons to match her dress. I'd shyly asked if I couldn't take the seat next to her. 
She giggled delightedly in response. Her rosy, freckled cheeks glowed and her sweet blue eyes sparkled. She was always like that, ready to laugh even on the worst of days. We were fast friends from that moment on. We married just as soon as we were out of high school and we had our first little one just shy of a year later. My Lucy kept that same happy way and those same sparkling eyes day after day, year after year. We had the lean years most couples back then had, where every penny had to be stretched to feed the little mouths that kept coming. Four in all by the time we finished, our oldest, a son, next a daughter, and then twin girls. Even with the weariness of motherhood, especially when the youngsters were small, Lucy never lost the light. She was only in her 30s when she lost both her parents unexpectedly to a terrible car accident on a snowy night. Sure, the tragedy took the wind out of Lucy's sails for a time, but she always said her mama and daddy wouldn't want her to live her life sad. Then, in 91, our boy Trevor. He was 27. Man, hang on a minute. It's hard to talk about without getting choked up. Well, he was an accomplished soldier by then, and, well, the Gulf War happened. And Trevor didn't come back. We'll just say that. Sometimes I think that took more of a toll on Lucy than she let on. I mean, she was down for a good while when it happened, but of course she still had the three girls after all. It was always Lucy's way to never let them see her cry. She felt like she was on this earth to dry their tears, not for them to see her weak moments. So, on the surface, she seemed like she took it well, but... Yeah, yeah, I think it's fair to say she never could let that go. She was still my wonderful, beautiful Lucy, but maybe a more pale version, like a beautiful piece of art that fades a little bit as time goes on. But then, you know, the years rolled on. Lucy blossomed as a granny. The first grandchild was a boy, born in 1992. And they named him Trevor, so that's nice. Next came Lucy May. And then a whole slew of grandbabies for around about the next ten years. Later, there even came great-grandkids aplenty. Lucy had planned on taking on a job after the last daughter struck out on her own to have something to do, but she fell so in love with the job of being a granny that she never did wind up doing it. She was just that granny, the one that was always there, babysitting, weekend overnights, games, crafts, snacks, favorite meals, visiting their classrooms. It went on like that for a long time, a lot of really happy years. The first thing that really hit my Lucy hard, the thing that really set her back, the thing that began to truly chip away at my love was the diagnosis. Dementia. It started out with just a lot more forgetfulness than usual. Lucy always joked about her senior moments and hey, we didn't think a lot of it at the time. After all, we were both 76 by the time. Very few of us get to remain just as sharp as a tack as we get older and older, do we now? She started to mess up her words sometimes. She'd ask for her clippers, but what she meant was her glasses. Or she'd want me to start her laundry, but she actually meant that she wanted me to start the bath for her. The Lucy she once was would have found the ensuing confusion from these word flubs hysterical, but this changing Lucy would get more confused and then get upset. She would cry at the drop of a hat over it, and then she would get angry, angrier every time it happened, until finally there was an incident where she screamed at me and grabbed a knife off the counter. She told me to make sure I paid the heat bill, which I did upon her request, but the next day she came to me furious because the rubbish was under the carport and not out at the curb. I'm sorry, dear. I forgot the day, I told her. I gave her what I hoped was a dazzling smile, 
for an old guy. Senior moment, I guess. Lucy fumed. Her pupils were like saucers. You couldn't even see the blue in her eyes. Her skin was practically gray, as though she was so angry that she was freezing. I reminded you yesterday, Clifford. She seethed. I recounted in my mind trying to recall her reminding me, but I couldn't. That didn't mean she didn't. Just meant I must have forgot. I'm sorry, love. I must have not heard you, maybe. Lucy grimaced, gritting her teeth so hard I worried they would break. Clifford, I said to you, don't forget to pay the heat bill, and you told me that you would. I blinked and watched her for a few seconds, hoping she'd collect herself and calm down. I'd frankly never seen her this angry in all our years together. Yes, Lucy, I did pay the heat bill. Are we talking about the heat bill or the rubbish not going out for collection? Her chest rose and fell as she took quick, shallow breaths and her eyes darted here, there, and everywhere. Yes, she said, her voice shaking. The heat bill. You forgot to take it out to the curb. We were standing in our galley kitchen, and I'll never forget her sweet face that day, so frightened and confused. You said you would, Clifford. Lucy cried, beginning to sob. I wanted to reach for her and fold her into my arms, but electricity seemed to be shooting off her. I feared that if I touched her, she might break down. I'm sorry, Lucy, I said softly. I will take the heat bill to the dump so that it doesn't back up before next week. All right, love? Lucy cried pitifully. Wailed, actually. You said you would. She screamed. Her voice was shrill and breaking. Like the old witches of fairy tales. Not like my sweet Lucy. I did reach for her then. But she snatched up the little paring knife on the counter and lashed it around at me before dropping it and sliding down to the floor inconsolable. I got down on the floor with her and pulled her to me then, stroking her hair and kissing the top of her head. I told her I loved her. I held her till she felt better, and then she apologized and said she didn't know what came over her. I asked her if she wanted to go lay down and have a nap, and she thought that might be a good idea. You're probably thinking I should have taken her to the doctor straight away, right then. And you're right, but I was scared if I'm being honest. Fear is irrational, so I talked myself out of admitting anything was wrong. But a week later, I had no choice. She kissed me goodbye and grabbed her pocketbook and keys one rainy afternoon. She was heading out to take one of the granddaughters shopping. I was reading a book by the window, about to doze off from the comfort of the gloomy sky and pattering rain. I barely took notice of her leaving other than to kiss her and send her off with my love. And then I did fall asleep. It was only about a half hour later that my cell phone rang and snapped me out of pleasant dreams. I saw that it was our daughter, Deanna, and picked up. Hey, Pop, I thought Mommy was coming to pick up Ashley. I drew my phone back to see the time and saw that more than enough time had passed for her to have arrived at Deanna's place. Yeah, babe, I told her. She headed your way about a half hour or so ago. Did you call her? Yes, Deanna said, worry scarring her pleasant voice. She's not answering. I broke out in a sweat. Okay. I said getting out of my seat and scrambling to grab my keys, which I had left on the end table. I'm going to head out and look for her. Call me if you hear from her first. Okay, Pop. Deanna agreed, sounding near tears as she ended the call. As soon as I threw open the front door to head out into the driveway and hop in the car, I discovered my wife standing there. The lady who lived down the street, Frida... I think her name was, had her arm around Lucy. Lucy was sobbing and they were both soaked. Sweetheart, 
I cry in. A loud roll of thunder punctuated my exclamation, and Lucy jumped as if in terror. I reached out for her, and she recoiled. Near tears myself, I motioned wildly for them to come in and stepped back. Clifford, something's wrong. Frida son. Her face deeply creased with worry as she gently pulled Lucy inside. My heart shattered as Lucy wailed and struggled, not wanting to come inside. Frida and I managed to get her out of the rain. She stood in the foyer, wringing wet and mewling. I cupped her freezing cold cheeks. Sweetheart? I whispered. I found her wandering around crying. She looked so lost. Frida cried. When I went to ask her if she was okay, she doesn't know me, Clifford. What's wrong? I fumbled in my pocket for my phone and shoved it at Frida as I attempted to soothe my wife. Can you please call my daughter Deanna? Tell her she's home and under the weather. Frida looked mightily disgusted to be asked to downplay the situation to my daughter, and probably also because I failed to address what she'd said. Instead, I wrapped Lucy in my arms. It killed me that she struggled as I pulled her shivering body against me. Oh, my love. My darling. I began to croon softly, singing into her wet, silver hair. I've hungered for your touch a long, lonely time. Her small frame relaxed slightly as I sang and I was alarmed at just how frail and tiny she'd somehow become, right under my nose. Time goes by, so slowly. Frida had ended the call with Deanna, and I saw her cross her arms over her chest and watch as I sang it to and held my wife. And time can do so much, I sang, my voice heavy with emotion. By the time I finished our beloved song, she had calmed down and wasn't crying anymore. When I finally let her go, she smiled up at me flirtatiously. Well, that was lovely, Clifford. Thank you. Then she startled, seeming to notice for the first time that Frida was there. Frida, how lovely to see you, dear. You were just soaked. Won't you come in for some coffee? Frida and I exchanged a glance. Together, she and I managed to convince Lucy to lay down for a nap, and we helped her out of her wet clothes and into comfortable pajamas. Lucy fell asleep as soon as we helped her into bed, and Frida and I quietly shut her in the bedroom. Clifford? Frida asked in a hushed, urgent voice. What in the world is going on? I had no idea Lucy was sick. I frowned and snapped at her. What are you talking about? She's not sick. The old biddy was raising my hackles. All the old bats in this neighborhood like to gossip and dramatize except for my Lucy. Frida's jaw dropped. Clifford? She gasped. Are you telling me you've not had her to the doctor? Oh my god. You must get her into the doctor. Today. It's an emergency. I was just about to argue and ask her just exactly how she'd come by my soaking wet wife when Lucy had left in a car but the doorbell rang. Both of us flinched at the noise, not wanting Lucy to wake. I hurried to the door and Frida followed right behind as if she lived there or something. She sure was awfully comfortable all of a sudden. There was a cop at the door. He asked if this was the home of Lucy Thurston. And I told him, yes, it was. And you're Mr. Thurston, I assume? He asked. Yes, what's this about? I demanded impatiently. The cop regarded Frida. Are you Lucy Thurston? No, my wife's laying down for a nap. She isn't feeling well. I barked. He nodded. I see, well... Are you aware that Mrs. Thurston was involved in a car accident? Oh my god. Frida cried. I felt like tossing her right back out in the rain. Let the cat drag her in somewhere else. Maybe she'd hit her head. Maybe this was going to explain the confusion. 
But the cop went on to explain she'd had a minor fender bender when her car left the road and struck a fire hydrant. The car was even still drivable, but had been towed since Mrs. Thurston had apparently left the scene. He asked me if she was hurt in any way, and I said I didn't think so. Sir, leaving the roadway and striking a hydrant, and then leaving the scene, well, the cop explained diplomatically. These are offenses that are against the law. Frida let out a wicked level harumph and then shoved past me like I wasn't even there. She pushed out the storm door, took the cop by the arm, and pulled him up the walk a little ways so that once the storm door shut, I couldn't hear them. I watched her flail and yap for a good long while, long enough for the poor cop to start to get as soaked as she already was, but after a while, he tipped his hat to her and left. She came back inside and handed me a yellow slip of paper. Here's the info to get her car back. Pay the tow bill and be on your merry way. I felt a little less inclined to throw old Frida out in the rain, and I told her thank you. She invited herself in for the coffee Lucy had offered, and we sat at the kitchen table. I'm not proud to admit... I fell apart a little that day because I knew what was coming. Only an idiot couldn't see it, and Frida was a good friend. In fact, she stayed until Lucy got up. Then she helped me get her to the ER. Once they saw Lucy in triage, they started paperwork to admit her, and Frida took me to pick up Lucy's car. Once again out in the rain, Frida patted my arm comfortingly. Want me to come back to the hospital? Wait it out with you? I smiled weakly and gave Frida a hug. I'd never expected to make close friends with this lady I'd only vaguely known before that awful day. No, you go on home. It's getting late. I'll call you and fill you in later. She nodded and got in her car. I stood there in the rain, in the empty parking lot of the impound lot and didn't get in Lucy's car until Frida's taillights were good and gone. It was two days in the hospital, endless tests, and a stream of doctors and the diagnosis came. Dementia. By the time they told us for certain, I had already come to terms with it. I was happy it wasn't Alzheimer's, which I feared could be worse. In the end, it didn't matter, I suppose. At first, the family came together to rally around Lucy and she received the diagnosis with her usual good cheer. After all, her episodes were few and far between, so she thought it wouldn't even affect her life that much. But it was only a week out of the hospital before there was another incident, and this one really changed things. Lucy was babysitting our youngest great-granddaughters that day, Eliza. Eliza was ten, and her mother and father were going out of town for the night so Lucy was to stay the night at their house with Eliza. I had offered to go too, but she insisted on some girl time with Eliza. Lucy's mood and personality had been so normal and happy-go-lucky that day and for days leading up to it that I didn't think a thing of it. Eliza would later say that she had no idea what triggered Lucy's episode. They had been in the car on the freeway, Coming back from the shopping mall and Eliza told us that she'd simply been talking about kids at school and she remarked that a certain child was a dummy. That's when all hell broke loose. Lucy began shrieking at Eliza, cursing at her, calling her terrible names. The car veered all over the road causing a chorus of honking and squealing tires as other angry drivers narrowly missed getting out of Lucy's way and being struck. Eliza reported that her grandmother had begun punching her and shoving her up against the door, and then struggling to reach across Eliza and attempting to open the door as the car barreled down the freeway, with Eliza sobbing and hysterical, and Lucy furious and out of control, and other motorists around them making phone calls to 911. The car was finally stopped when a state highway patrol officer pulled them over. Eliza told us that Lucy immediately snapped out of her rage and became scared and confused. 
She stood outside her car with her head in her hands, weeping. Eliza was also inconsolable and simply wanted to make up with her grandmother. But Lucy didn't know who she was. Fortunately, no one was hurt from the whole horrible ordeal. At least not physically, and the cop took pity on Lucy. She was charged with the lowest traffic offenses possible. And I was able to just pay the fines and put it all behind us. Obviously, the occurrence caused many, many problems. Not the least of which was terrible trauma to Eliza. But the worst thing for Lucy was that the whole family and I unanimously agreed that it was time for Lucy to stop driving. And that she couldn't be unattended anymore. Especially with the children. Lucy was furious when she was lucid. And frightened when she wasn't because she wanted to leave and couldn't. She fought the change so hard that I just sold her car to prevent her from driving it. When she downloaded the Uber app and started trying to escape by calling Ubers, I had to confiscate her phone as well. At first, it wasn't like I was cutting her off from the outside world because the kids and grands would come around constantly to try and make her feel loved and not let her get lonely. But Lucy blamed them as much as me for what she was saw as isolating her. We began to talk in whispers and secret texts of a long-term facility. Her doctor stayed in the loop and tried to help us through this awful phase of life as much as possible. The thing was, I couldn't wrap my head around placing Lucy in a home. I think I really would have rather died than abandoned my wife like that. I know it's not really abandoning someone to do that. It's simply giving them the care they need. But to me, it felt like I'd be abandoning her. Even if I went there and spent every single day with her. Plus, you always hear horror stories of people like Lucy getting exponentially worse. And when they go into assisted living. Day by day, Lucy's episodes of incoherence increased. And visits from the kids and grands decreased. They knew she didn't mean it when she told them she hated them and to stay away. But it was such a tough spot for them to be in because they felt like their presence was only hurting Lucy. Our kind neighbor Frida stopped coming as well, at my request. She instead checked in by texting me and leaving with the promise that I could call her anytime if I needed help. I needed so much help, but I accepted none. Our contact with the outside world dwindled down to nothing. It came to where my phone was kept shut off and shoved into the back of a drawer in the kitchen. Lucy's bright eyes faded. Her hair turned completely white and began to thin out, all in a matter of weeks. She stopped eating like she should, and her face thinned out and her tiny body became even lighter and weaker. In the back of my mind, I would think of dementia patients eventually losing the ability to eat, but I continued on each day, ignoring my wife's unraveling. The day her first tooth fell out, she began to leave dead things around the house. The dentist said the tooth had been infected and had been falling out on its own, but there had been so much blood. When she walked out of the bathroom, blood flowed down her chin and she grinned with one of her top front teeth missing. She cackled like an old witch and I leapt from the recliner to go to her and see what was wrong with her. She didn't even appear to know she was bleeding or understand why I was so upset. But even after I got her to the dentist, I believe she pulled that tooth out. And it was late that night, after things had cooled off, that I discovered the little skull. I had slipped out of bed late that night, leaving her there asleep to use the john. I noticed it as soon as I flipped on the light and walked into the bathroom. I went straight to it and picked it up. It was a tiny skull, polished and smooth. I picked it up to examine it closer to see if it was even real, or perhaps some sort of weird custom jewelry. But it was real and it appeared to be something tiny like a mouse. I had no idea where it came from. Soon, I found a dead spider, placed on a piece of bread in the refrigerator. It was an alarmingly large and fuzzy black spider. 
Lucy was sitting watching the television with blank, glassy eyes when I found the spider. Next came a dead bird. This was placed inside a pot of stew I had in the Dutch oven on the stove when I made the mistake of leaving it unattended to go to the bathroom. Lucy had been reclined and reading a book, Lost to the World, when I discovered the bird and dumped the stew in the trash. Then there was a dead rabbit in the basement. This one was even more disturbing as it was gutted, with its putrid remains spilling out. Its dead smell permeated the dark and damp basement, and it was extra disturbing because it had probably been killed specifically to be left here. I didn't even know how or when she was managing to do this, but I was distraught. That's when I stopped taking her to the doctors. I was still checking in with our children enough to keep them at bay, but I didn't tell them about the dead things and I didn't tell them I was afraid to take her to the doctor. You see, I knew it was time to commit Lucy, but I couldn't bear it. I could not bear it and I knew that the doctors would eventually take it out of my hands. So I told them that I was transferring her to new doctors, and arranged for her records to be transferred to a new doctor. But I have yet to take her. Yes, I am aware that they will eventually catch on to this scheme, and I will figure something out. But luckily the wheels of the big machine turn slowly, and it is easy in American healthcare for one little old lady to slip through the cracks. The day that I found a dead rat in the shower, its guts and blood swirling in the drain, I finally confronted Lucy about it. I began to cry and I went to where I'd seated her, right outside the bathroom in our bedroom. I took her hand and had to basically drag her into the bathroom. She was instantly furious to have me pulling her, and I was really losing it myself. Why? I yelled. It wasn't really a mean sort of yell, but more a hoarse plea. Why would you do this? How are you doing this? Lucy screamed and scrambled back when she saw the rat. She threw herself against me and practically climbed my body to get away from it. How did that get in here? Get it out! Get it out! Lucy shrieked. I took her out of the bathroom and placed her onto our bed where she curled up into a ball and began whispering incoherent words to herself. I too collapsed onto our bed. I put my hands over my face and cried and cried. I sobbed until there wasn't a shred of energy left in me and then I slept. It was a dark day. It was my darkest day ever in my life. Since then Lucy has completely deteriorated. From everything I've told you, you were probably thinking that she had already deteriorated, but no. Now she is an entirely different person. Her skin is pale gray. What hair she has yet, she tears out. She sits in an armchair and winds it strand by strand around her finger and yanks it out. She flinches and then laughs at each little strand coming out. If I try to get her to stop that, then she claws at her face. Lucy's beautiful face is covered in raw, bloody scratches. She roams naked at night and throws up in the hallways. I have managed to get the kids to stay away and stop calling by begging them to give us some time and telling them Lucy is sad and embarrassed and wants to be left alone for a little while. Frida showed up in person when I stopped answering her texts and I told her that Lucy had moved into assisted living. Oh? Frida asked, looking confused. Which one? I'd like to go see her. She doesn't want visitors. I told her coldly. Frida frowned sadly. Oh, well, I understand. I'd at least like to send a care package. Which home is she in, Clifford? Frida asked, studying my face. I shut the door quietly. It feels like my world is closing in. I absolutely know that eventually someone will come in and I will not be able to hide what is happening here. And my love, my Lucy, she's all but gone. But I still can't seem to do anything but stay here inside the walls of the home we've shared for so many years that now seems like a prison. 
Right now, Lucy is screaming. She's in our bedroom. The door is closed. And I'm trying to ignore her. That's why I'm writing this. I need to get it out. She's crying like a wild animal and she screams like she's in physical pain. And she keeps saying, Clifford, why are we all alone? Why are we all alone? Lucy is in the bedroom screaming and crying because that's where I have tied her up and left her. My heart is pounding. I know that if you read this, you'll be thinking by now that I am a monster. You might understand on some level, but you will still have turned against me at this point. You'll be thinking that I've crossed a line and it's indefensible. She came at me with a knife. That's why I tied her up. She'll quiet down soon anyway. I know that's not enough information for you to be less furious with me for tying up my disabled wife and shutting her up alone in our room. Even less so when I tell you that the reason she came at me with a knife is because she was begging and pleading with me to let her have my phone so she could call our daughters. She missed them so bitterly. She didn't understand why I couldn't call them and she attacked me with a knife. I have a superficial stab wound on my shoulder, so I tied her up to figure out what to do. You see, even if I do call the girls, even if I ask them to come over and see their mother, they won't see her, at least not in the way they'd want to. No, not in the way anybody would want to. Because their mother is dead. The day of the rat in the shower, the day that I cried myself to sleep next to Lucy, I woke to find her missing. I bolted upright, confused and frightened, looking all around. I ran about the house looking for her and calling for her. My search eventually led me to the basement where I saw the single worst thing I've ever seen. My Lucy sprawled naked on the floor, her eyes gouged out apparently by her own fingers, which were bloody and covered in the carnage from her face. And then, after clawing out her own eyes, she had plunged a knife into her feebly bony chest, and she'd lain there dying on the floor while I slept upstairs. I stumbled backward and fled the basement, locking the door at the top of the steps before slamming it shut. My mind reeled. I felt my sanity slipping actually felt myself losing it, but then I heard her voice. I followed the sound of it and found her in bed asking me for water. I've never had a migraine before, but I got one then. When I walked in that room and saw her tiny form tucked into the bed, gray, decrepit, with lifeless, dull eyes, I told her I'd get her a glass of water from the kitchen. Then I forced myself to go back into the basement and sure enough, she was still there on the dirty stone floor, still laying there in a grisly, horrific manner. Lucy killed herself and then she came back, and she doesn't know she died. I sealed the basement door shut with padlocks that night and now it's been one week. The smell is terrible, but believe it or not, since she's down in the basement, it's not as terrible as you'd think. It has yet to draw the attention of the neighbors, but Lucy has started to complain about it. The Lucy that I knew is all but gone. Her ghost is angry and vicious when she appears. She elicits strings of profanity, the likes of which I've never heard. She tells me that she hates me and details all the gruesome ways she wishes that I would die. She asks me constantly why we are here all alone. Then, sometimes she vanishes and I get peace for a while. I know that it's only a matter of time before someone comes. I know that there may be some legal repercussions from my parts in all that's happened here. I know that the kids and the grands will all have to find out the horrible news that their grandmother killed herself. I know I will have to tell them. But I can't seem to care about any of that. I can't seem to think about anything but one thing. How do I tell Lucy? Do you know? How do I tell my angry and terrified wife that she's dead?
She leans a flower. I watch her through her window while I'm cloaked by pine trees. If only I could touch her. Just to be next to her would take the pain away. She sits on her chair, brushing her hair, staring at the night sky. I wish I was one of those stars she looked at. Then I'd be closer to her. I wonder what she smells like. I wonder what she's thinking. I wish I could hear her heartbeat. The first time I saw her was when she was getting on the Ferris wheel. She looked so happy standing next to Tommy Dax. Good old Tommy football hero. I suppose he was what she liked. He got to drive around in his daddy's Plymouth convertible. Hell of a nice ride. That probably made a difference, along with his fucking football jacket. I began following them around a bit that night in July, just to make sure she was okay. She looked happy enough. I knew she'd be happier with me, though. I'd treat her better. One time I actually spoke to her at the corner store. She dropped a bottle of cough medicine. I picked it up and she thanked me. I asked her if she was sick and she smiled and told me she was getting it for Ma before turning and walking to the counter. That's when I was greeted with a slap to the back of the head from Tommy. He grabbed me by the back of my hair and pulled me between the next aisle of the store. You get the fuck on out of here, you freak. He spat at me. That was the one and only time I spoke to Shailene. In September, the formal dance for Glen High School came up on the calendar. I can't remember the last time I went to a dance. Or danced. I'm not really one for crowds. No one would want to go to one with me anyway. As Tommy's son, I'm a freak. But I knew Shailene would be going. Going with a football jacket jack off. You must have liked her, but something seemed off about him. I decided to go along. When I say go along, I mean I spent my time sitting in my car, in the car park. An hour before the dance ended, the doors to the hall burst open, and out came a wave of suits and dresses that jumped into cars. Engines roared and tires rolled out to the road. I lay down in my seat when I saw Tommy and Shailene walking out hand in hand. I heard the door to the Plymouth open and close. I heard the engine roar. I heard the tires move forward. That's when I sat up and followed. They headed east, up Anne's Way End. Surely they were driving up to Finn's Point. Half of everyone from the dance probably was too. I turned off my lights and sat about 50 meters away. But the Plymouth pulled left into Stitchwan Crescent. That was a forest road, nothing but the old mill down there. I wondered why the fuck they would be going down there. Turning off my lights, just going on instinct, I kept following. A minute later, the Plymouth pulled over, and so did I. The lucky bastard was about to make it with Shailene Dwight, but why did he drive her here? It's so cold and fucking desolate. When the sounds of a beer bottle bursting on the gravel echoed, I figured out why. Up ahead I made out the figures of Jerry Winslow and Gavin Trunks. They were two team members from Tommy's football team. They laughed as they drew in cigarette smoke and breathed it out into the night. Tommy's door opened to more laughter, but in her cut with a scream. It was Shailene. Something was wrong. That's when I saw an arm move at breakneck speed toward her. Tommy had thrown a haymaker right hand at her cheek. Her head hit the left side window like a crash test dummy. I had to do something. They were going to have their way with her. That was what these pieces of shit were planning. I could run up and try to take on all three. Maybe find a branch to hit one of them with, but my heart was racing. They'd fucking kill me. I had no chance. They walked forward toward the car. Who's first? Chuckled Tommy. Then an unexpected sound called out into the night. It was a kind of roar, but not like I'd heard before. It almost sounded human. Jerry and Gavin immediately jumped into their cars. The same as Tommy. In less than ten seconds, they were gunning it back up the road at a scary pace. They drove straight past my car, 
but that was the least of their worries I could tell. I was so fucking scared. I felt like a failure too, but then I heard the sound again. The roar. I had to get back in the car and get out of there. I had to help Shailene, but I wasn't fast enough. The next thing I remember is waking up in my car. I felt like I was getting a cold. The sun was beaming through the windscreen. I felt like I was getting sunburned. What was the time? Had I slept all night? Checking my watch, I saw that it was 8 a.m. Shit. It was going to be a hell of a hot day if the sun was this temperature so early. That was my first thought. My second thought slapped me upside the head. Shailene. I had to find her. I high-tailed it out of there, feeling woozy as all fuck. Then I realized the cross piece on my necklace must have been sitting in the sun for an hour attracting heat. I took it over my head as I drove like a bat out of hell towards Shailene's house. It left a burn mark on my collarbone. I arrived. I jumped out of the car and ran to her front door. I don't know what the heck I was going to say, but I thumped on the front door. In a matter of seconds, a tall man answered the door. A disgusting stench came breezing out the door. It smelled like burnt garlic. Hello, son. What can I do for you? He asked me. Sir, I'm a friend of Shailene. Is she okay? He replied, Oh, yes, son. I take it you were at the dance last night when she fell on the guitar speaker. She's always been a klutz. A bit like her dad, I guess. Chip off the old block. She's a sleeping son. But you're a good friend to come around. He closed the door. Thank God she was okay. But she had lied. Told her parents a story. Why had she covered for Tommy like that? That's when I knew she was in love. But she was in love with a bad person. I could have marched right back up to that door and told her dad what happened. Or asked to speak with Shailene. Hey, remember me from the corner store? Yeah, I picked up the medicine for you. By the way, you don't know me, but your boyfriend is wrong for you, and you're making a huge mistake. Yeah, I had no chance, so I drove home. That was the longest drive of my life. Never mind the heat. Never mind the fucking burn mark from my cross necklace. Which stung like hell, by the way. The long part was the hole in my heart. Shailene had fallen for the captain of the football team. The most popular guy in the school. Everything that I wasn't. Me being a freak. Him being a hero. He was also a monster. And she still wanted him. What did that make me? Less than fucking zero. I slept all day until 8pm. I woke up feeling strange and hungry. I felt so damn hungry. At least the heat had wavered. I went straight to the fridge. I'd only stocked up a couple of days ago, but nothing in there caught my eye. Maybe a burger? Yeah. I'd go out and grab a burger. Medium rare. Or rare. That's what I felt like, but then Shailene jumped into my brain and overtook my hunger. I drove over to her house again. Maybe I could ask her dad if I could see her. Maybe she would talk to me. I hoped she was feeling better. I hoped she was okay. I turned into her street when I saw the Plymouth convertible, parked right outside Shailene's house. Fuck. This guy's that much better than me? I sat in my car, defeated again. I wondered how people could be so predictable. Now Shailene had let her would-be rapist into her home, and so had her dad. Is this how life is meant to be? One punch to the face after the other before the final straight right goodbye? Maybe I'm not meant to be here. Maybe life is just a random pile of shit. I slumped down in my seat. I could have crawled inside the earth right there, if not for the sound of booming voices coming from Shailene's doorstep. I perked up. Shailene stood her right eye as black as ink, her daddy next to her, and Tommy, 
Tommy rolling on the grass beneath him, cowering. You get the fuck out of here and don't you ever come back. Shailene's dad exclaimed with deathly intention. Tommy shuffled backward from the Dwight family's old house. He looked scared. Maybe it was the first time he had ever been. Then he got on his feet and ran. Ran down the road. Left his daddy's car. All I could do was just watch as Mr. Dwight took Shailene inside and closed the door again. I'd sat around again like the loser I was while well, it all happened in front of me. Mr. Apprehension. Mr. Always thinks about it and does nothing. And so I sat there. Sat there for an hour in the dark, wondering how I could not be such a fucking failure. That's when I saw movement. Beyond the Dwight family's back fence line, I saw a faint silhouette. Something crept there. It was too far away for me to be seeing in the dark, especially with my shit eyesight. At the same time as Shailene's bedroom light came on, I saw the Glen High football jacket light up. It was Tommy. He was back, but he wasn't alone. More silhouettes. He had brought his boys. Back for revenge. I had to do something. No more sitting and watching. I pulled on the door handle and its weight glided to the curb. I slipped out into the night, but something in me had changed. Maybe it had changed before I decided to do something. Maybe it had changed while I was still in the car. But whatever it was, I wasn't scared anymore. My anxiety had been replaced. Now, I was filled with something else. Something that bubbled away while I scoured within shadows toward the pack of predators. I thought it was anger. But then I fell toward the ground. The woozy feeling I had on Stitch 1 Crescent came back tenfold. I felt like emptying my guts, but I had to keep going. I rose to my feet and stumbled forward in pain. This cunt and her cunt dad are going to get him. I heard Tommy whisper, but how could I hear him? I was at least 50 feet away. His two gang army sneered back at him. I'll stand on your shoulders, Gav. Jerry, you go knock on the front door and hide. Then you two pull that pussy outside. That'll give me all the time I need upstairs. No. I couldn't let this happen. Despite the pain I felt, not this time. So I walked into the fire. Then the fire looked back at me. Tommy, Gavin, and Jerry each turned to face me almost simultaneously. They represented my future of pain. Pain that a skinny, glasses-wearing coward had no answer for. You, Tommy said, smiling. But as he said my name... My fingers throbbed crimson. The tips of my fingers cracked and bled with agony. It felt like a dozen splinters were skyrocketing out of the tips of my fingers at once. What the fuck? Then the tide rolled in. I fell under an invisible weight. The night enveloped me. The agony from my fingertips encompassed the whole being as I flapped around on the earth. The pain came from the inside out. Needles cursed into my organs. This little cunt is having a seizure, laughed Tommy, and so did Gavin and Jerry, but their laughs and smiles left their faces when I stood up. I wondered what they thought of how I looked. My eyes were pitch black when I looked into the mirror later that night. Each of their grins dropped. They all looked confused and scared at the same time. In a matter of seconds, I was on top of both Gavin and Jerry, slicing my fingernails over and into their faces, until they made no sound. But Tommy did. He cried out into the night like a bitch. His footsteps thundered as fast as I think he could hope for. When I looked up from the bloody mess my newly grown claws had made out of his friend's mangled faces, I saw him running. He gained a lot of ground in a short space of time, but it just wouldn't do. Not now. I caught him in less than a few seconds, stabbing my new fingernails into his neck. He fell straight to the ground and rolled over facing me. He was crying. Please, 
Please, man, what the fuck are you? I'm sorry. Just let me go. One precise strike to his jugular was all it took. His voice box turned to gargling blood. But there would be no biting. No chance for another life. Not for any of them. Then I heard the sound of Shailene's voice. Is someone there? She sat through her open window into the night. I wanted to tell her what I did. What I did to help her. And what could have happened. But no. I wish I was. I wish I could be that man. But I'm not. I'm just not made that way anymore. Now I was more alone than I'd ever been. That's when I heard the faint sound of leaves crunching to my right. I turned to face where it came from. My eyes met those of a stranger, but when it breathed, the sound of it breathing, I knew its faint growl. I knew its voice. It stepped toward me into the moonlight. Beautiful. She was beautiful. She looked at what I had become and smiled. I left with her. The hunger comes back every few days, but she's taught me that it's okay to be hungry. What really matters is who I decide to eat. Who we decide to eat. There is one memory that plagues my childhood. It is so vivid, so clear, so chilling that it winds in the ear like tinnitus. Gone for most of the day until the dead of night when you have nothing but the silence of the night to accompany you. The memory drowns out all other recollections of lazy days listening to Walkmen staring out at rainy weather, or movies, or school. The memory was when I was very young. I remember that we had gone to the store for my school supplies for the first time after moving to Seattle, so I should have just turned seven. My mother had gotten distracted by some other sections to stock up our new residence, so she let me run off to gather my own school supplies. With a few spiral brown notebooks and a pack of crayons in hand, I toddled back to where I had last seen my mother. The young me saw the figure of a woman in gray from behind, who then held out her hand, and I dutifully put my own little hand into it. She held on without saying a word, turned and began walking out of the store with me in tow. Perhaps I could sense something was wrong, as not a single word was uttered, nor a glance thrown at me, or the things that I now held. The figure that held my hand simply strode towards the exit in a confident manner. I started to leg, my little sneakers skipping off the tiled floor as I tried to pull my hand out of hers. But the hand holding mine turned into a vice grip, and the strides became more frantic. I tried to call out, but fear turned what should have been a scream into a whimper or a mumble. The cashier that we had passed was the one who yelled out. Perhaps the sharp-eyed lady had noticed the unpaid items in my hand, or perhaps my body language was simply too unmistakable for mothers who had their own children. Its cover blown, the figure broke into a full sprint, charging forward and dragging me along. Behind me, the cashier had caught up, and with a mutual fury shared by all people, latched onto me, pulling me back from the figure. For a moment, it felt like my shoulders would separate, but the second she stopped moving, the figure let go and took off outside in a sprint. Never once during all of this did the figure ever turn their head to look back at either of us. The police were called and I remembered my elbow had actually been dislocated at the radius, needing a doctor to pull it back into place. I still remembered my mother coming back to the store with the detective who had made an appointment with the owner to review the tapes. The detective hoped that the person who had made such a seemingly targeted attempt might be recognized by my mother, and my mother, who had been holding me crying all night before, was now completely unwilling to leave me alone if she could help it. When the video played, I was in the back being distracted by the detective's partner. That didn't stop me from taking a peek at the video. 
They paused on the only few frames that captured the figure's face. Eyes that were far too close together. A nose that seemed crudely stuck on like Play-Doh. A mouth that was only a half-heartedly etched in. Like an afterthought. These were the traits that I could make out. The detective just sighed and blamed the old videotape for artifacting. I couldn't forget it. The second time it happened, I was at home alone for a school holiday that my mom didn't get off from her job at the hotel. I was upstairs mixing Legos and Bionicles when I heard the door rattle and click. In her tone and voice, although muffled by my closed door, I heard what sounded like, come down. In the condo where we lived, I could see the door from the stairs, and from that distance I could see her face. Nothing seemed out of place to me, but at that point I had a light case of nearsightedness that hadn't yet gotten bad enough to warrant a visit to the optometrist. I thought nothing of it as I started down the stairs to greet her. That's when the figure gestured casually, like throwing her hand behind her shoulder as if to say, Come with me, outside. I got close enough to focus on her face, and that's when my fear instinct from before kicked in. Why wasn't she saying anything? The expression, the eyes open just a little too wide, the smile just a little too sardonic. Our minds are sensitive to micro-expressions, and even without processing those details consciously, I froze on the steps and felt my bowel drop. A tense moment filled the air as both of us stayed on moving while well, I tried desperately to figure out what to do. Suddenly, both of us exploded into motion as I decided on pushing off the stairs with maximal effort while the figure in front of me lunged forward, grabbing my ankles. The hand brushed up against my heel, but some frantic kicks ensured that I wasn't grabbed. The back of my waist hit the stairs hard, but at this point the adrenaline had dulled any semblance of pain. I scrambled back up the stairs, grabbing the railing to turn towards my room. Hearing stomps and feeling the wind of the figure that had recovered from her lunge and was chasing behind me. My door was open only a foot wide. With practiced ease, I slipped past the opening and slammed it shut with my palm on the doorknob, simultaneously pushing the locking button closed. Angry, furious kicks and punches rained down on the door that inch and a half of plywood separating me from what seemed like certain doom. I screamed. After a few seconds of trying, I saw ten fingers curl up from underneath the crack of the door, making scratch marks on the white paint and not even caring for the cracks and blood that resulted as it did so. Seeing that it was futile, the fingers retracted and it went back to furious banging, straining the door, and then it stopped. The shadows from the bottom make it clear it had moved away. I looked at the window behind me, dreading the moment I would see the facsimile of my mother's face pop into the window with those wide eyes and that rictus grin. It never came. The police came instead, knocking on the door and asking me to open it. I just cried on the other side of it. Evidently, the family attached to the condo had hired a babysitter and the cacophony generated by the pounding and screaming caused her to call for help. A locksmith was called and the bedroom door was unlocked. The police had gotten my mother back from work and detectives were taking pictures of the damages to the door and the scratches on the bottom of it. Nobody told me anything. I grew frustrated, but wasn't in the mood to say anything. The only snippet I caught was a fragment of hushed discussion between my mother and the detective. The word sister. Did I have a twin aunt that I had not been told about? Was that who was going after me? Weeks later, I was still not told anything. I subconsciously grew more distant, almost flinching when my mother came into the room. It hurt her, I know, but... She wouldn't answer any of my questions. I was frustrated. I know the door was unlocked with a key. The sound I heard and the detective confirmed as much. The fact that somehow a key had ended up with who I assumed was her insane sister. And I wasn't being informed really betrayed me. What happened merely weeks later changed my mind about the situation. 
Winter break with friends in the neighborhood that went to the same high school helped me keep my mind off of things. We played like we were younger, agreeing to stay out of our houses and away from video games to be outside building snow forts, having snowball fights and exploring. Like any other day, we decided to play hide and seek. I felt safe with such a big group. The seeker counted down and we started running. Leah, one of the girls in the area, had suddenly popped up behind me. I suppose she had been late and walked on towards the end of the rules session. I had gotten along well with her before, so I followed her as we ran in the streets covered by winter while the white fog of our breaths billowed out before us. We started getting farther, and a sense of unease started to creep into me as the sounds around me dropped away. Leah seemed like she knew exactly where she wanted to go as she pointed to an alley behind the fence of a house in the neighborhood. Here, she chirped out. It sounded like a bird's voice. This made me freeze. Try as I might to bury it in my heart, my recent experience was still in my mind. My feet refused to move as I watched her figure disappear just behind the wooden fence, right out of sight. Come. I refused to move, instead circling to the other side of the fence. My heart was pounding up to my throat, my ears felt stuffy, and I don't think I would have been able to hear any sounds had they happened. Part of me knew the game was up, and that no matter what I would be running, but another part of me held instead anger. I wanted to see, and the gaps in the wooden stakes offered me that opportunity. As we stayed in the deadlock, two hands wrapped in purple mittens jumped up and grabbed the top of the wooden fence. It shocked me into motion and I began sprinting back the way I came, faster than I had ever run in my life. I tried to listen hard for the sound of footsteps in the snow behind me, but there was nothing. My mind imagined the possibility of a hand grabbing my hood and yanking me back by the neck at any point, but it never came. I didn't even turn back to look. Soon I found another piece that had been trying to hide behind the bushes. They were obviously alarmed by the fact I had been sprinting toward where we had just left. I was relieved to see somebody else. I thought carefully about what I wanted to say. You guys saw Leah earlier with us, yeah? She was wearing a teal winter coat? I asked. Yeah, she ran off with you, right? They answered. Right. I completely lost track of her and we were supposed to stay together. I couldn't reach her by phone and I'm kind of worried she's missing. Can we stop for a moment and give her a call? A blatant lie, but I wasn't about to start with my history of being abducted. They called her. I held my breath since I hadn't actually tried. No answer. We quickly canceled the game and got our group back together. I felt more safe now with our friends milling about. I was asked some questions about where I last saw Leah. I gave some vague answers, not hoping to go back to the house where I had the last encounter. Eventually, we decided to go knock on the door, thinking that she might have gone home for some reason, or if not, we could at least inform her parents. When we arrived and knocked, there was no answer. Are you kids looking for Leah? Leah's elderly neighbor poked her head out her door to ask. Yes, ma'am, we answered. She and her family left early this morning to go on a ski trip. They won't be back until next week. Come see her when she's back. Such a sweet old lady, but the news she gave us happily made our hearts chill. All of us. Because almost all of us saw Leah with their group. They knew something was wrong, and I was no longer invited. Not that I had any objections. I was busy hiding out at home, panicking now that I realized anyone could come after me. For the rest of high school, I tried to interrogate my mother on the question of our family. Who were my grandparents? Who was my father? Did I have any other relatives? Every question was met with what I interpreted as excuses and dodges. She was an orphan and I didn't have any grandparents. I was an IVF baby, and she couldn't contact my biological father. I grew more paranoid and alone, but
but at least nothing else happened for the rest of high school. A year after I left for college was when my mother fell ill. When I visited the hospital, I was told quarantine was in full effect. Nobody was allowed contact, no matter how dire the situation was. The physician managing my mother's care came to speak to me. Could we step into this room for a second? He pointed at the serenity room behind me. Obviously, having been prepared beforehand. Unfortunately, all I saw of it was the sinister darkness of the room and not its inviting privacy. I'd like to stay here, please. I answered. Are you sure? I'd really rather have this talk in private. My response was unexpected. I don't follow anyone anywhere alone. I responded. I understand. Well... I have to give difficult news. We are not optimistic about her care. We'll try our very best, but you should start preparing and look into these options I have in the pamphlet here. I started roughly tuning out the rest he had to say. I could only look through the port of the glass at my mother that was on a breathing machine, unconscious, pale, and thin. After all these years, I feel like somewhere deep down inside I loved her and appreciated that she tried her best, but some part of me never forgave her for her secrets. I went back to the house and began to sort through our legal documents to get what the pamphlet said I had to prepare. Then in the back I found my birth certificate. My full name, my SSN, place of birth, healthy male, six and a half pounds, and... Twin. Twin? I was a twin? What happened to my sibling then? I made a call to the IVF clinics, servicing the city listed on the certificate, as well as the hospital. No dice. Even with the limited information they were allowed to give me, I could tell by their voices they had no clue about my mother and no records of me. The hospital. Most of the people working there had changed, but there were still a few old obstetricians that might have been there at the time, though they weren't in at that moment and I had to call back. I was getting desperate. I got back to the hospital and got a hold of the physician I spoke to earlier. I need to see my mother. I pleaded with him. I'm so sorry, but please... I pulled out my birth certificate. This says that I have a sibling out there somewhere. Mom never mentioned that. I want to know what happened to them. This might be my only remaining relative in the world and she's the only person who knows. Please let me ask her this. I'm so, so sorry, but she had just passed away less than an hour ago. We had been trying to call you in to view her body one last time and gather her effects. I was crushed. I got home and looked through the last few things my mother had on her person before she had left this earth. Among them was the locket she had always worn, a simple brass thing that I had played around with sometimes as a child when she let me. I could never get it to open, and she told me that it didn't, and I never questioned it. When I held it in my hands close to my face, it seemed to pop open the moment my breath hit the lock. Inside was a four-leaf clover that had long withered and desiccated. The obstetrician called back. After a brief conversation, he informed me that he wasn't responsible for delivering me. But at the time, an unknown male, whom others had assumed was my mother's husband, had been in the room for the birth, and had simply walked away with one of the children. The hospital had gotten severely reprimanded, but after an investigation turned up nothing, the case went unsolved. And that's it. My questions had hit a dead end. There's nothing else for me to ask. Nothing else for me to pursue. My mother had taken any answers for me and left for good. All I have is the remains of a four-leaf clover and no answers to any questions. The neighborhood has gotten awfully quiet. The house is even more so now that I'm the only one inside it. Every figure that passes by outside makes me jump. And I swear I can see two silhouettes at night standing motionless. I convince myself that they're bushes or trash cans, but those spots are always empty in the morning. Soon they are coming, and there's nothing much I can do about it.
except wait. Ever since I moved overseas, my sister and I have made a habit of sending each other care packages. Of course, there's typical occasions where we send each other gifts. Birthdays, Christmas, and so on. Those gifts tend to be simpler, sometimes just plucked straight from an Amazon wish list. But the care packages we make are special. Whenever we go shopping or travel to another place, we keep an eye out for things the other would like. My sister found some amazing bath bombs at a small village, Fete, once. The sweet floral fragrances lingering in the air seemed to me like an embrace all the way from home. Right before Lunar New Year, I found some earrings at my local night market. One shaped like a tiger mid-roar, the other a dainty red lantern. Perfect for Violet. She spammed me with a hundred selfies of her wearing them to our hometown's annual dragon dance. Seeing her smile made me happy and terribly homesick all at once. Our care packages were all like this. Careful collections lovingly selected from wherever we happened to be. Save for whenever one of us was having a bad few days. We always had at least a few things ready to send just in case the other needed some cheering up. When Violet's boyfriend dumped her the day after Valentine's Day, I sent her a parcel I had been working on for weeks. My favorite local snacks, a new book by her favorite author, a small hand-painted paper umbrella from a mountain village, a box of tea leaves from a lakeside stall, and always a letter full of warm wishes, this time on the back of a postcard showing a sea turtle swimming in a coral reef. Violet gushed over everything from the scent of the tea leaves to the intricate brush strokes of the flowers painted on the paper umbrella. Being able to keep my sister cheerful across continents made the distance seem much smaller than the 14-hour flight I made every summer. But then the virus happened. Suddenly, no more parcels. I must have bothered the poor workers at the post office a hundred times, but rules are rules. No mail bigger than a letter could be sent to my home country. Suddenly, all of the things I'd prepared for Violet had to be stowed away for who knows how long. Still, we sent each other letters, both taking the time to find the most beautiful or bizarre postcards we could. But it wasn't the same as our care package ritual, especially when I encountered my own series of bad luck. A cheating partner, a stingy landlord, an overbearing boss. I don't want to wallow too much, but it was a month's worth of woes within a handful of days. Could have been many months worth, even. Violet was still there for me online, but I'd never been able to feel truly connected to anyone through a grainy video call or a couple of texts. I miss knowing that my sister's love would have appeared on my doorstep had it not been for these trying times. I hated being stuck at home with no one left to complain to. More than anything, I missed my sister. That's why I was so elated when the package arrived one morning. It happened just when lockdown rules were beginning to ease. I still hadn't been able to send anything to Violet, but when I got home, a small lilac bundle addressed in familiar cursive was waiting for me. My heart leapt. The rules back home must have been lifted and Violet had hurried to send a gift. It was like being a child at Christmas. I couldn't wait to see what my sister had sent me. Ignoring the bills sticking out of the post box, I almost ran back to my apartment to see what was inside. Underneath the paper was a box. Glossy black cardboard. Huh. Violet usually sent colors that reflected her own sunny personality, unless she'd ordered something specific online and kept the box. Anyway, the box wasn't a big deal. I was in such a hurry. I nicked my finger with the box cutter as I tried to carefully slit open the top. A few drops of blood sank into the cardboard as though it were made from sponges. I don't know why I remembered that so vividly, but I didn't care at the time. After bandaging my finger, I was finally able to open the box. Inside were the strangest things Violet had ever sent me. 
My eyes were drawn to the necklace first. It wasn't my style, nor Violet's at all. The white stone looked far too expensive for our usual care packages. A rainbow glimmer danced across its surface whenever I turned to meet the light. An opal, I assumed. Had Violet found it at a second-hand shop? Its chain looked old and dull compared to the vibrance of the stone. Maybe Violet fancied it as a charming antique. That seemed a bit more like her. But I couldn't make sense of the rest. A pouch of black velvet revealed itself to hold a number of smaller bags, each containing some kind of seeds. They were perfectly smooth, some colorful, some dark, and all unfamiliar. Alongside each one was a typed note. Not violet style whatsoever, with just a few cryptic words. Plant to soothe a broken heart. Plant to appease another's green. Plant to get revenge upon a cruel tyrant. And more. They seemed like things you'd see in a witch's shop. The last item was a bottle of dark liquid, labeled with that same bold typing. I was surprised she'd gotten it through customs. Drink me. Nothing else. Just like Alice in Wonderland. When I opened the bottle, I found it to be utterly scentless. It could have been black water for all I knew. Strangest of all, there wasn't a letter in sight. Violet? I said aloud as I screwed the lid back onto the bottle. This is the weirdest care package you could have come up with. There was no one in the apartment to agree with me. Well, what would you have done? I decided not to contact Violet right away. With our time zones, I'd be bothering her in the middle of the night. Instead, I decided to follow whatever witchy instructions Violet had sent me. First, the necklace. After cleaning the chain, I put it on and it was stuck by how cold it felt. Even through my t-shirt, it was like holding an ice cube to my chest. Surprisingly heavy, too. I already had pots ready to plant the seeds. My balcony gets a lot of sunlight, so I had no doubt whatsoever they would flourish in no time. Maybe that's why Violet had sent them. It'd be fun figuring out exactly what kind of plants they were. I decided to start with the first three. The broken heart, the greed, and the tyrant. As they sank into the soil, I felt a strange sensation. As though I was pouring my troubles away into the soft dirt. It was strange, but not unpleasant. When I watered the seeds, I felt droplets run lightly down the back of my neck. It was a hot day. Sweating isn't abnormal. The bottle I decided to wait and ask about. I couldn't be showing up to work drunk, after all. It was a few days before I remembered I hadn't mentioned the care package to Violet at all. The knocking woke me up before dawn. I stumbled across my apartment in a daze. I worked afternoons and nights. I always sleep in. I wasn't even awake enough to question the safety of opening the door to a stranger so early in the morning. Or not bright enough. I'll let you decide. It wasn't a stranger. It was Zara, my ex-girlfriend. She staggered inside before I had a moment to snarl. Evie, what have you done? What the fuck are you doing here? Was what I came up with when I returned to my senses. Get out. Get out now, before I call the police. Evie? Was all she managed to say. I noticed wet stains down the front of her black dress. Drunk. I had never thought of Zara as a drunk, but then I'd never thought of her as a cheat, either. Get out. Go back to your other girl, whatever her name is. I don't care. Just get out. Zara vomited a torrent of blood onto my floor. Time seemed to stand still. I stared at the blood, then at Zara. Her face was deathly pale as her eyes rolled back in her hen. Trickles of red dripped down her chin like drops from a watering can. Oh my god, Zara, what did you do? Zara sank to the floor as though she was drowning in her own blood. 
She coughed, sending beads of blood everywhere. All I could do was watch. It felt like something cold and heavy was pinning me to the spot. Evie, I'm sorry. She rasped. Her fingers grasped weakly at my ankles. Evie, I'm sorry. Please stop. She broke into a fit of coughing as her grip lessened. Her teeth were pure red. I looked down at myself, splattered with the blood of my ex. One single drop rested on the necklace I'd forgotten to take off. The opal winked in the light. Finally, I broke out of my trance and scrambled for my phone. I could hear neighbors entering the corridor outside and voices began to rise. God, had she been coughing up blood all the way here? I made the phone call. Zara watched me the whole time. She no longer seemed able to speak. Instead, her dead eyes were fixed upon the opal hanging from my neck. Zara didn't make it. She'd consumed something unknown but terribly poisonous, the doctor's son. They seemed baffled. I just felt numb. A tiny part of me had still cared for Zara, after all. A bigger part of me was wondering if I'd be left to clean up all the blood. Guilt began to seep in. When I was finally allowed home, I found my apartment immaculate. I sent a silent thank you to whoever had mopped up all that awful blood. My clothes I threw straight into the bin, not worth trying to wash the blood out. I took a long shower before I felt able to breathe properly again. That didn't last very long. I didn't notice until I pulled back the curtains. The first seed on my balcony had sprouted. Large leaves, all blood red, perfectly heart-shaped. Plant to soothe a broken heart. I called Violet immediately. Hey, Evie, she said drowsily. It was still early back home. How are you doing? It's been a few days. Violet, what are those seeds you sent me? What? The seeds in the care package. The ones with all the funny labels. What are you talking about? The care package. The one you sent me. What's growing from these seeds? Evie, I haven't sent you anything. I couldn't send you anything. I could hear the confusion in Violet's voice. There's no way she was joking. And why would I send you seeds? I couldn't barely speak. It, it was in your writing. The address, I mean. Not the rest. It had my name on it. It has to be someone else. Now Violet was starting to sound annoyed. Did you call me this early to complain about seeds? I ended the call before we could begin to fight. Violet and I never fought. The red leaves of the plant seemed to shimmer in the sunlight. Did you hear about Mr. Yen? My neighbor said as soon as I stepped foot in the elevator the next day. Oscar lived directly above my apartment. Both our homes and many more were owned by Mr. Yen. One of the wealthiest, we assumed, landlords in the area. He was the exact caricature of a stingy landlord. Well-dressed. Well-fed, well-educated, and completely self-absorbed. Oscar and I often shared stories of leaking pipes left unfixed and black mold creeping in across ceilings. No, what happened? They found him in his house last night. Dead. What? I know, right? They're saying he was poisoned. Rumors are flying around about a really awful scene. Apparently his wife found him all covered in blood. Do you think he did it himself? The cold, heavy feeling was coming back again. The elevator dinged as we reached the ground floor. Evie, are you okay? You look like you're about to throw up. My voice was a mumble. I think I left something upstairs. Sorry. It took me several fumbling tries to unlock the door to my apartment. My hands were shaking madly. I hadn't watered the seeds nor the plant since Zara died. 
How could they have thrived? When I pulled back the curtain, a second plant had bloomed. Blood-red vines stretched out towards the sun. They resembled nothing so much as an outstretched hand. I threw away the plants. It didn't change anything. I heard the gurgling sound from my boss's office that same day. I didn't rush along with my co-workers to see what was happening, but I heard their screams and cries. I just kept typing at my desk. None of the words I typed seemed to make any sense. None of the calls for an ambulance were going to help. Nothing, right then, seemed to matter at all. I took off the necklace, too. I was going to throw it away, but what if some other unlucky soul finds it and thinks it's treasure? It's in that awful black box at the bottom of my wardrobe along with that bottle of dark liquid. I can't bear to think about it. The plants, the necklace, the bottle. Drink me. Sometimes I wonder what would happen if I did. Violet called me today, our almost fight all forgotten. I could hear the sing-song happiness in her voice. Evie, thanks ever so much for the care package. It's a bit weird, though. Where did you get these plants? I froze. What care package? The one you sent me. Violet thrilled. I could hear our parents talking in the background. Our mother was complimenting the perfect heart-shaped leaves of the plant. Violet, I didn't send you anything. The rules haven't changed yet. And the ring. It's stunning. She said, not hearing a word I'd just spoken. It's so cold and heavy. Did you pick it up at one of the night markets? It looks real, though. I didn't send you anything. What? I heard the sound of something heavy being put down on a table. But I just arrived this morning. The address was written by you. I'd know that awful handwriting anywhere. Violet? I was trembling so much it felt hard to breathe. You need to throw that away. The plants, the ring, even the box, throw it away. What about the wine? We already drank it. What? It's wine, right? We all tried some. None of us could figure out what it was. It didn't smell or taste like anything. Evie, what do you mean you didn't send it? The phone fell from my numb fingers. I don't know what to say to my sister. Whatever was in that bottle, is it going to poison my family? The same way Zara and the others died? Violet didn't sound sick when we ended the call. She only sounded confused. No vomiting up blood, no awful coughing. I have no idea what's going on except I didn't send that care package to Violet. And she never sent that one to me. That means there's someone, something out there who knows. What's going on? Why did they send these things? How do you even know our names? Most importantly, what's going to happen to my family? I remember the first time I truly questioned my sanity. As time would go on, I'd think back to things that were definitely red flags, as some would say. But the first time I truly believed that something might be wrong was Christmas Day 2019. I don't actually remember a ton from this day. Postpartum depression was raging through me, and the first couple of years of my youngest child's life are pretty much a blur. I remember it was getting dark. My partner and I were sitting on the living room floor with our children, playing with their new toys. That's when I just happened to notice a red, flashing light, reflecting off one of their new toys. It truly doesn't seem like anything, a room full of beeping, flashing toys, but I remember being entranced by this red, flashing light. I tried to glance around and find the source, as I was only seeing the reflection. And I could not locate where this was coming from. 
And just as soon as I started racking my brain around trying to figure out what was happening, it stopped flashing. It was silly. It was nothing. Not worth mentioning, though it could be noted as the beginning. A few weeks go by. Time doesn't really matter. I know it was fairly soon after the first incident, but as I said before, dates, times, life is just a blur. My partner and I were heading home, kids in tow, after a long, pleasant evening with my parents at their home. Not sure what time it was, but it was dark outside. My partner driving, we head down a long hill with a spotlight at the end. A road we've driven a million times before. I look ahead and notice the stoplight. It's red, but it's not a solid red light. It seems to be fading in and out. Red to black. I am all of a sudden hyper-focused on the light. Was this normal? Do red lights always fade in and out like this? And I just never noticed. But again, before I could even articulate what I was seeing, the light turned to green. A normal, solid green light. I asked my partner if he noticed that the red light wasn't solid, and he seemed confused. Said he hadn't noticed anything. These were the moments. The small instances that made me question my whole reality. It seems so silly. These are such small things. Unverifiable things. Things no one else could vouch for. Things no one around me noticed, but things in an already fragile mental state. I was in a tailspin. The front door to our home, our beautiful dream home, was bright red. The only red door in the neighborhood. This cookie cutter neighborhood where every house was almost identical, but my door was red. What did this mean? Why did I cringe every time I saw the door? The unique red door that stood out to me so much while looking at a home. The red door that I loved so much now made me question my reality every time I saw it. Red became a trigger. Again, these are silly things. Silly things that otherwise would mean nothing. But having a red door made me never want to leave the house. I didn't want to see it. I didn't want to have to open that door. I suppose this is when I started my... isolation. This also happened to be the start of the COVID pandemic. So staying home wasn't weird. Staying away from people wasn't weird. We ended up moving to a new city early in 2020. I was truly excited. A fresh start closer to my family. I'd be able to see them more. Get more help with the kids as my partner worked long hours and wasn't home much. This move didn't make a ton of sense from the standpoint of moving further away from his work, but getting to be closer to family was very important. I was struggling. I was in therapy. I needed all hands on deck. Though, as most things the last few years, the pandemic fucked that up. My family wouldn't see me or my children because of the pandemic. I went for over six months with no face-to-face -face interactions with anyone outside of my partner and children. So now I'm stuck at home with three small children. With even less help from my partner. So he worked so much and now was significantly further away. And no familial help. Our new home was less than perfect as well. It had a red door as well. Silly little things, like the children's bedroom, was always much colder than the rest of the home. They were scared of it. They called it the spirit room. They'd sleep with me. I was being touched, grabbed, climbed on all day, and slept on all night. I'd hear the scurrying of little feet running down the long hallway while my boys would sleep. I'd hear doors closing. I'd hear knocking on the front door. I'd find things had been moved from their rightful spots. My partner, oblivious to what was going on around us, he always had logical explanations for everything, but he wasn't there. He wasn't experiencing these things. I was living them, though no one around me was noticing. Why was I the only one noticing? 
I remember getting caught up in some Reddit thread about living in a simulation. I delved too hard into that realm. I had to do a keyword block ultimately so I wouldn't see this type of thing anymore. I was cognitively aware enough to know that my psyche couldn't handle it. I knew that it wouldn't take very much for me to truly believe that I was, in fact, living in a simulation. But blocking the post from coming up wasn't a fix-all type of cure. I'd catch myself spiraling. My oldest child had very frequent nosebleeds. The kind that would keep coming and coming, sometimes in his sleep. He'd wake me up, covered in blood. Red, in my half-awake stupor, I'd clean him up, get him turned back in, and spiral. This isn't real. None of this is real. The kids aren't real. My partner isn't real. I'm in a coma somewhere, hooked up to machines. I'd stay up all night afraid I'd wake up in a hospital bed being told that I'd created this life out of nothing. I'd wake up without my boys. So instead I'd lie awake with a sweaty baby clinging to me. I'd breathe in the scent of his hair. I'd squeeze his little foot. I'd calm myself. I'd say, this is real. It has to be. Can you hold something that isn't real? Can you smell something that isn't real? I ultimately decided to confide in my partner. In a more lighthearted, I'm only kind of serious, but actually it's really serious type of way. I explained the simulation thing and I expressed that I truly felt that it would take minimal convincing for me to actually succumb to the belief that I was, in fact, living in a simulation. I'm afraid, though, that I have been a little too light-hearted. He began to joke about it. He began to speak in a monotone voice at me. This isn't real. I'm not real. Wake up. And I'd laugh it off, but he'd keep going. He'd leave for work and tell me, I'll be back later. Or maybe not, since I'm not real. I'd tell him to stop. I'd tell him it scared me when he acted this way. It made me question my entire life. Every move I made, I was on the edge of reality. Teetering back and forth, I knew it was a difficult balancing act, but I didn't want to tell anyone else. I didn't want to be vulnerable again. I didn't want anyone else intentionally making me question my reality. So I'd lie awake at night, sniffing my baby's heads, squeezing his little feet anytime I needed to be brought back to reality. I ended up having to drive out of town, a few cities over, to pick up my sister from the airport. It was the longest I had been away from the kids in years. Probably the longest I had been alone and even longer. I don't remember much of this drive. It is a pretty barren road in the desert, not much for sightseeing. But off in the distance I saw a spotlight. It was red. It was fading in and out. I lose memory from this point. I awoke in the hospital. I had crashed, apparently. Single car accident. I suppose it was a little apparent that I wasn't in a great frame of mind, or maybe they suspected I had a brain injury. They asked me so many questions. Is there anyone we can call? I said to call my partner, but I couldn't remember the number. How could I not remember his phone number? It's been his number for ten years. How could I not remember? I asked if they had my phone. His number would be there, but it wasn't. Maybe something happened to my phone in the accident. It's fine. It'll come back to me. Can you verify the make and model of your vehicle for the police report? Ah, uh, yes, I remember that one. A Toyota Sienna for sure. Lots of room for the car seats, but I clarified the kids weren't with me, just in case they'd worry. I was met with confused looks. The vehicle we pulled you out of was a Ford Focus. Did you borrow someone else's car? I was confused. I didn't quite know how to answer that one. I definitely did not borrow someone else's car. I definitely was driving my van. Neither I nor my partner owned a Focus. He drove a Dodge Ram, which I had actually never driven before. The only car I would have been in would be my own. I had a moment of what I thought was clarity, and I remembered that my car insurance information was saved on my phone. I always made sure to have an updated copy of my insurance card saved. 
just in case I didn't have cell service if I were to get pulled over. I pulled up my card and to my disbelief the card read 2014 Ford Focus SE. I broke down. I was sobbing. I was irate. I was so angry. Nothing made sense. None of what they were telling me made sense. I believe they ended up sedating me. I woke up to my father sitting on the edge of my hospital bed. I'd never seen him look so unnerved. He looked so much older than the last time I had seen him. He looked so tired. Eyes sunken in. Frail. Gray in the beard. Little white chest hairs popping up through the top of his button-up shirt. But when he saw my eyes open, he lit up. We've been looking everywhere for you. How long have I been here? What's he talking about? We've been trying to find you for years. I can finally bring you home. I asked where my partner was. Where are my boys? Why aren't they here yet? Aren't they worried about me? Are you taking me home to them? He looked so confused, mixed with deep sadness. He said, Sweetie, I'm not sure who you're talking about, but I can get you home with me and Mom, and we can figure out everything from there. We've all been looking for you for so long. Everyone is going to be so happy to see you. What was he talking about? We came over for Sunday dinner almost every weekend before the pandemic hit. He knows his grandsons. He knows my partner of literally almost 10 years. I was angry. I screamed at him. Did he talk to you? Did he put you up to this? It's one thing to have my own partner poking fun at my grip on reality, but this is too fucking much. Where are my kids? The nurse has come in and dosed me with something. I fought the sleep. I don't want to sleep. I'm mostly in the hospital now. My dad comes to see me often. He brings me pictures of my nephews. He tells me stories of what's happened since we last saw each other. But I don't believe a word that comes out of that man's mouth. I have figured out how to hide my pills away to make sure the nurses think I'm taking them. I'm usually able to pull it off for a while and stay up all night trying to figure out what is happening. But eventually I'll crash. Then I'll wake up at my little house with the bright red door, with my minivan parked out front. That's where I am now, laying in my bed with my sweaty baby lying on me, smelling his hair, squeezing his little foot. I will always find my way back here. Family road trips are fun, especially when there's no adults involved. Well, that wasn't entirely true. My oldest cousin, Farhan, is an adult technically. He's 22 and a half, and he's always been the most perfect, flawless, golden child. So, of course, our parents were okay with him taking the rest of us on a little road trip. Zero parental supervision. Just the four kids. And the trip itself was a success. We had mounds of fun at the resort. The only downside was that I'm pretty sure my youngest cousin peed in one of those swimming pools while I was right next to him. On purpose, because he thought it was funny. But whatever. We did shower at the end. It was nearing 10pm now and we'd been on the road home for about an hour. We were supposed to be back by now, but a couple of unexpected flat tires had slowed us down. Our parents admittedly got a little iffy when we let them know. They'd hoped we'd be back by 10, but I was sure we'd be fine. Ferron would take care of us. Can I have the chips? Rafia fumbled her arms over my shoulders from the back seat, feeling around for the coveted food. I groaned. No, I told you I'm not opening the bag yet. I'm saving it for later. When's later? Whenever I get hungry. Why is it when you get hungry? What about my hunger? Cause the chips are mine, duh. I bought them. Rafia plopped back in her seat, pouting. I rolled my eyes. Nine-year-olds. 
Tushar, our youngest cousin, giggled at her from his booster seat. Haha, no chips for you. Shut up, Tushy. It's Tushar. Tushy, Tushy, Tushy. Guys, shh. Can you hear the GPS? Ferran poked me. Calm them down. What? Why me? You are the second oldest. You are the deputy. Turn right in one mile. The GPS chimed in with a random direction every now and then, but mostly it just felt like we'd been driving forward and forward for miles. Maybe it was just the darkness. We weren't exactly in a very urban area at the moment. All I could see around me were dark, eerie outlines of trees and such. Sometimes we pass fields of crops too, as one does in Bangladesh. There wasn't even any other cars near us. Just us, a long winding path, and a fairly cloudless night sky. Turn right, the GPS piped up. Alrighty. We drove on straight for a few more minutes. I'd given in and handed Rafia the bag of chips because I couldn't deal with her pestering anymore. She crunched them quietly while Tushar tried to nap. I figured his small six-year-old body had had enough. The GPS piped up again after like 10 minutes of driving. Turn left. Okie dokie. I grabbed a few chips from Rafia and thought maybe I should try and nap too. I wasn't sleepy, but I was majorly bored. We had played stuff like I Spy and 20 Questions on the way here, but at this point we were all pretty sick of car games. Turn left. Um... Ferran frowned. There's no turn. Left where? I looked at the GPS. The screen was clearly showing a left turn. I looked outside. No left turns. No fork in the road at all. Just a straight ahead path. Um, maybe it's a glitch. Frick. Have we been driving the wrong way? I don't know. Try resetting it. Ferran restarted the device and punched in the address again. The screen flashed up again in our faces and I blinked. Turn left. It chimed. The route displayed was the same, with a left turn and the non-existent fork in the road. Where even are we? Rafia asked. I shrugged. In between Comilla and Dhaka somewhere. Those are both places in Bangladesh, in case you didn't know. I looked at the location on the screen. Oh no, we're right by those woods everyone says are haunted. What? Rafia shrieked. Stop scaring her, Ferran muttered. They're not haunted, Rafia. It's just a dumb story. Yeah, try telling that poor missing kid that. Basically, there was some big news story a few weeks earlier about a missing kid in this place. Eight-year-old boy, dark hair, last seen in a Pikachu shirt and shorts. Ran away from home at night, thought he could stay in the woods, and then no one ever found him. They did find his backpack that was dropped around this road, and since then, people have been making up stories of haunted woods. If you ask me... Maybe he's still lost out there, or some animal ate him, or he got kidnapped. No need to jump to dramatic conclusions. But hey, it was fun to scare little cousins. Rafia was glaring at me now, and I smirked at her in response. I'm so confused. Ferran scratched his head. Should I turn left? Into the forest? It's not really a forest. Rafia put in. I mean, it is, but over here there's less trees and stuff. And look, there's a small trail. The car would totally fit, right? I'm not... I don't want to drive the car in there. Look at our surroundings. It's dark and creepy as hell. Ferran replied. What if there's some wild animals and stuff? And the trail is for walking, Rafia. I explained. Rafia scowled. So, maybe it's a shortcut. Maybe it's a quicker way home. The GPS knows better than you. 
I want to see the animals. A sleepy Tushar chimed in. Turn left. God, shut up, you stupid machine. We get it. I snapped. Rafia and Tushar giggled. Ferran looked lost in thought. Look, how about this? I can go check out the trail. What? I guess it might actually be a road or something that got overgrown by grass. Maybe Rafia's right and it is a shortcut. We all peered out the window into the area. It didn't look like it was ever a road for cars to me. Definitely a hiker's trail at most. Not to mention how eerie and unsettling it looked in the darkness. Surrounded by trees with winding, creepy branches that look like hands trying to grab you. I didn't like the idea of going in there. I don't think you should go. I murmured. Ferran had already turned on his phone flashlight. I'm not. I'm just going to shine the light in to make sure we're not missing some hidden road. Okay? He ruffled my hair. Stay in the car. Turn left, said the GPS again. I groaned at first and then glanced at the machine. Something felt very slightly off about that last turn left. I was about to restart the thing when it piped up again louder. Turn left, turn left, turn left. What the hell? Ferran murmured. He pressed the power button multiple times, but to our surprise, the screen stayed on. Turn left. It said. And then it said it again. Who is that? Rafia cried. I'd realized why the voice had sounded off earlier. It was no longer the original robotic GPS at all. It sounded... human. Turn left. Turn left. What the hell? Turn it off. Aisha, try turning it off. Turn left, turn left, turn left. It was positively screaming now. Rafia covered her ears while Tushar started whining. I don't like it. Make it stop. What's the matter with it? You need to turn left right now. We stared at the machine in horror. I don't know a whole lot about how technology works, but I'm pretty damn sure they aren't programmed to say stuff like that. Turn left right now. It shrieked. The voice getting more and more hoarse. Something about the urgency in it was getting to me. I blinked a few times. Was that fear I detected? Is it haunted? It's the ghost from the haunted woods. It's gonna get us. Rafia cried. Turn left. Tushar yelled. Just turn. Make it be quiet. I'm not going in the... A wild animal can't be worse. Then the GPS yelled some more for us to turn left. Ferran turned left. The car stumbled through the grass and rocks and loudly screeched to a stop in the middle of the trees. And a cold silence settled around us. Nobody said anything for a few seconds. I tried to slow my breathing and looked at the cursed GPS screen. It stopped. Tushar's small voice squeaked from behind us. Ferran turned around. Are you guys okay? He said gently. Rafia and Tushar nodded, looking scared out of their lives. I wanted to hug them so bad. Ferran nodded. Okay. It's okay. We'll get out of here soon. I noted his subtle expression change. From comfort to confusion. I turned around too, as did Rafia and Tushar. We all stared out the back window of the car, towards the street we had just swerved out from. I frowned at first, not sure what I was seeing. It was dark enough anyway, and now even our headlights weren't there. We only had the moonlight to go off of. What was that? Some kind of shape on the street? A shadow? Clack, clack, clack. What the hell? Clack, clack. It was coming from the street. With every clack, the sounds got closer and closer. Tushar and Rafia hugged each other while I grabbed Ferran's arm. 
Clack, 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 clack. Closer, closer. And then it finally came into view. I say it because to this day, I don't know what it was. All I know is that it was big, deformed, and had giant claws dragging along the ground. At least, the ones on its front limbs were dragging on the ground. The claws on its legs, I assume, were the culprits behind the clacking noise. They smacked against the ground in every step it took. Nobody said a word. It moved into full view of us, and I thought I could see something dripping off its entire body. Slime. Blood. The drops made little splashing noises as they slithered off its grotesque figure and fell on the concrete. A sickening moan escaped its mouth. Raffia stumbled backwards and Ferran winced. Tushar clutched his stuffed giraffe as hard as he could, but none of us looked away from the creature. It let out a sickening moan again. Thick fluid was sliding out of its mouth in mounds. I was suddenly beyond grateful it was dark. I had no desire to have a clear view of whatever the hell that was. I dimly made out the silhouette of teeth. Large, jagged bits that could have easily ripped my flesh apart. It let out another awful moan. And then, clack, clack, clack. It was moving forward. Clack, 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 clack. I thought I heard Ferran finally start breathing again. Tushar seemed to loosen his grip on the giraffe, and Raffia sat upright. Clack, clack. None of us made any noise until the last clack had died out. Even afterward, for a few seconds, nobody spoke. Recalculating. I nearly jumped out of my skin. And all three of my cousins did too. I almost laughed and turned back around to the now welcoming bright screen of the GPS. Proceed to the route, it said. The usual robotic monotone back now. The fork in the road it was showing earlier was gone. Now it only showed the car in the woods just slightly far off from the streets. Proceed to the route, it said again. Rafia giggled very slightly, and even I cracked a smile. Ferran exhaled in relief. I never imagined I'd be so happy to hear that drab robot voice. Proceed to the route, said Tushar quietly, and smiled too. I am, buddy. Gotta back out first. We backed out of the forest, and as per the instructions, proceeded to the route. Ferran situated the car on the street again. Rafia finished the last of the chips and handed me the bag, noticing something in the process. Who's that? She asked. What? Who? In the rectangle mirror. She pointed at the rearview mirror, and I looked. A little boy of about eight was looking at us through the car's back window. Dark hair and a Pikachu shirt. His skin and eyes looked cold and dead, but for some reason... I wasn't scared. The child smiled, and a familiar voice we'd heard earlier from a certain GPS floated around us. Turn left. I'm glad you listened. I'm glad we listened too, little fella. I know that this might sound crazy. Heck, I experienced it firsthand, and I can barely understand it myself. But I can't stand by and do nothing. I can't tell you the name of this place, or even the city it took place in, because I'm afraid they will find out who leaked this information. I don't even know if that place was the only one where this happened, but I beg you, don't take your children to any of those places. I used to work in a pizzeria with a huge playground for children, for their birthday parties. This one was huge and famous for having everything. A ball playpen, a spooky obstacle course with hanging punching bags, painted with glowing skeletons and spiders, an obstacle course with a smoke machine. 
five slides of different shapes and lengths, and the subject of my confession, the inflatable castle. To call this an inflatable castle would be wrong, but I don't really have any other way to describe this thing. It was a cross between a slide and an obstacle course full of punching bags the size of adults, so children could run through or just punch them until they calmed down after their sugar overdose. It was simple but effective, with light green colors covering its surface along with blue lines for the inflatable tubes forming the side. Children loved this thing, and looking back, I think it was because it attracted them. I was a newbie in this place. Originally, I was simply tasked with taking care of the front desk, greeting the customers and calling the cleaning ladies to any section of the playground that needed cleaning after the children got too excited from eating too many slices of cake in a row before running everywhere and throwing up everywhere. That was supposed to be my only responsibility, but the um, asshole I had as my manager we'll call him Dick, always forced me to do all the degrading and menial tasks he could think of because I refused to kiss his ass like everyone else. Taking out the trash, dealing with complaints from parents about how their little angels asked for a chocolate cake but got strawberry flavor and stun, or being yelled at by a parent because we didn't take refunds on a toy. A 15 puzzle with a drawing of our mascot that costed $9 because it had already been used. I had to keep a poker face as this angry, overgrown potato threw it against the ground and stomped it so hard I thought he would bring down the entire building down with his weight. You know, the usual. This happened during one of my afternoon shifts. I was standing at the front desk, lost in my own thoughts, and staring at the giant clock hanging on top of the entrance as it ticked down to the end of my shift. The mascot plastered on it mocked me with his dumb, goofy smile as his arms acting like the clock hands barely moved at all, dragging on my eternal agony. The place had been closed for today after our latest guests left, a single family having a birthday party in one of the rooms. The kids were running everywhere as their parents ignored them by getting wasted on the bar. Dick walked down to the front desk, turning the corner with his smug expression that could only mean one thing. He was going to give me more shitty tasks to torture me. I kept my poker face the best as I could as he told me that our boss told him we would have to check on the safety of the inflatable castle. Of course, what he meant is that I would have to do this shit while he banged one of the female co-workers in the locker room. I waited for him to leave before silently calling a shit-faced bastard and headed for the castle. To enter this section, you had to go through the entire playground. We didn't have a back door or a shortcut because whoever built this place was an idiot. Entering through the ball pen and crossing through the dark tunnels with the glowing skeletons, snakes, and spiders. I was scared of this section because of my arachnophobia and I had to rely on a flashlight because this tunnel didn't have any lighting. Probably because it was cheaper, as they always wanted to keep this section in the dark. This was the fastest route, as the other way to reach the castle would have been to climb in the upper tunnels, go through the obstacle course, and take a spiral side down into a second ball pen before entering again to bypass the scary tunnel. Did I mention that the architect was an idiot? I didn't want to risk being stuck in the slide, as that thing was made for children, so my only option was to face my fears as best as I could. The castle was built with different sections of inflatable parts to make the walls, the floor, and the slide. I don't remember how it worked, and I didn't care enough to ask, since my only true purpose there was to make sure there weren't any holes air leaks, or lost items like toys or shoes. One time we even found an iPhone stuck between the folds of the walls, but nobody reported it as missing, so Dick took it to the lost and found box. To this day, I'm sure he pawned it online. This thing was like moving through quicksand, barely able to stand my weight because they only used enough pressure to keep children afloat. 
most annoying part was cleaning up the plastic balls that always ended up here as they would be stuck between the folds or be pushed through the safety nets of the castle's windows until they snapped the strings, forcing us to cover everything with a plastic tarp until they fixed it. I made sure to look for any issues, but the entire thing was fine. I found some socks, a toddler's shoe, and a bunch of balls scattered everywhere, but nothing out of the ordinary. That is, until I found a hole in the rift between the wall and the ground. It wasn't a puncture as the air wasn't leaking out, but it looked like one of the anchorage points had gotten loose. I made sure to press and touch the area around it, but it refused to budge or change shape at all. It was a small hole about the size of my hand, which meant any kid could get their foot stuck inside and get hurt. Or worse, stick their head inside and suffocate. I didn't want to deal with that scenario, so I put my hand inside to try and reach for anything to hold on, but I couldn't find it. I was lying on the ground, my entire arm reaching down into the hole, but no matter where I touched, I couldn't feel anything. No plastic texture, no concrete walls, nothing. That's when I realized something wasn't right, and I took my arm out. This hole looked strange to perfect. I don't know how else to describe it. I tried to shine my flashlight onto it to see the bottom, but the only thing staring back at me was pitch black darkness. I stared down, confused, when it accidentally slipped from my fingers and fell through the hole. The light quickly vanished without a trace or even a sound, even though it should have hit the wall or the floor. The hole seemed to react to this as it widened open a few inches before shrinking down back to its original size. A sudden sense of dread invaded me as I realized something was wrong. I didn't dare to look inside, fearing that something would appear and drag me down too, so I tried something. Holding one of the plastic balls in my hand, I made it roll towards the hole and watched as it widened just enough to make it roll inside before going back to its original shape. I threw a couple of balls again, and it repeated the same pattern as before, growing and shrinking all the same. This isn't a hole, a part of my mind told me. It's a mouth, and it's hungry. I didn't want to believe that, but it was hard to ignore what I was witnessing, especially after I already inspected its insides. I slowly walked away trying to avoid disturbing whatever it was, but at this point it didn't really make a difference. I had entered its territory, messed with it, and threw things into their maw. They probably knew about my presence, but didn't care at all. Why was that? I didn't want to think too much about it, so as soon as I reached the exit, I jolted out of the playground. By the time I realized what I was doing, I was sitting on the ground and covered in sweat. I couldn't believe it. I refused, but I couldn't shake it off. I tried to convince myself that I simply imagined things. That I was too tired and half asleep, so I simply imagined this thing. Just in case, I told Dick that I found a possible hazard on the castle. If he could see it too, then it would mean it really existed, right? If it wasn't there, that would mean it never happened. He asked me about the problem, so I told him it was a hole in the castle between the wall and the floor, and his attitude changed. His grin quickly shifted into a frown, telling me that I could go home for the day. I was surprised, and when I tried to ask if something was wrong, he simply yelled at me to get out of his face and leave already. I was afraid. I didn't know what I had gotten myself into, so I went straight for the locker room to change back into my clothes and headed to the exit. I passed in front of the inflatable castle one last time, as the locker room was in the same hallway overlooking it. I tried not to look back as I left, but my curiosity got the best of me. I didn't want to turn around. My brain was yelling at me to get out already, but I didn't listen. From the corner of my eye, I saw what looked like children staring at me from inside the castle. They weren't moving, jumping, or even making any noise at all. They were pressed against the windows, 
their eyes peering through the safety net as I continued to walk away. I tried to act as if I didn't see them, but a part of me knew that they noticed. Even though I barely caught a glance at these kids, I realized that something was very wrong with them. None of them had any color. They all looked like they had been thrown in a vat of bleach until all the colors had been extinguished and turned into marble statues. I kept walking, trying to act as if I hadn't experienced anything out of the ordinary, with my heart threatening to jump out of my chest as I tried to erase these events from my mind. It was useless, and I know this. They've been scarred forever in my mind, and I can sometimes see their emotionless stares when I close my eyes. Nothing has happened since that day. At least to me. I could barely sleep at all that night. And when I finally managed to close my eyes for more than a few seconds, I was awoken by a phone call from my boss saying I was fired because of bad conduct or some bullshit. I don't remember what they said, but I received a message telling me that I was fired and banned from the premises. And same goes for any other location of their franchise. Apparently I had tarnished the goodwill of the company with my insubordination and unpleasant attitude. Which I can assure you is a complete and utter lie. I tried to contact them, but my phone number had been blocked by the company, and any emails I sent to them were answered with the same excuse. Unable to shake off the feeling that I had stumbled across something I shouldn't have, I looked up any info about the company online, but I didn't find anything unusual. Articles, videos, newspapers. Nothing came up at all, and that worried me. There was no way this business could be so perfect. There had to be something bad about them, like an accident or some unlawful practice, or maybe some mentions about the same things I had witnessed, but I couldn't find anything. Exasperated, I gave up on my quest and tried to leave everything behind me, move on with my life and all that stuff. That is, until one day when I received a letter in my mailbox. It looked suspicious at first glance, with no stamps or addresses at all. All it had was my name on the cover written with a red marker. Whoever left this wanted me to find the truth, so I took it inside and ripped it open, pouring its contents on my desk. A dozen of papers fell down, ranging from printed documents to photocopies of what I presumed were the original newspaper clippings. All of them were related to my workplace, with most of their info censored. Names, photographs, dates. The person behind this only left me breadcrumbs to investigate for myself, probably to test how badly I wanted to know the truth. All the reports and clippings talked about accidents and disappearances that happened at the pizzeria, all of them involving customers or children, children vanishing without a trace as they played, complaints about children sneaking in the playground at night, strange noises coming from inside the castle, workers being fired for all kinds of reasons. In a single year they had gone through 20 replacements most of them having been fired for the same reason I was. And the missing children. Jesus. There were photos of kids ranging from 3 to 12 that had gone missing inside or around the location. There were reports all over the country, with a list of names listed under every pizzeria. One page was full of mugshots of these children, and among them were the same ones I had seen watching over me inside the castle didn't make sense. Most of them had been missing for years, even in other cities, but I knew it was them. I could remember their faces, their hairstyles, their clothes, everything. They hadn't aged a single day since they went missing. Worried about what might happen, I kept these documents with me. I dumped them inside a trash can and set them on fire, including the envelope they came with. I stared into the fire until all that remained were ashes, trying to make sure there wasn't any trace left of them. I know I'm a coward, but I can't do anything about this. Covering these incidents? 
taking so many measures to hide the truth and what I experienced. I can't deal with this. I'm sorry. I wish I had the courage to post any info that might help to expose the truth, but I can't. The only thing I can do is to beg you, please don't go to these places. Don't work for them, and most of all, don't bring your children to any parties. It doesn't matter if they hate you for it, or if they don't understand why you're doing this. It's the only way to keep them safe. This may be the last thing I ever write before I'm dead, or perhaps even something worse happens. My friend waits just outside my door waiting for my decision. He said he's going outside to enjoy himself and give me some time to think. Take your time, Jason, but not too much. I'll only wait so long, he said in his now distorted voice. Why here, you ask? Because I don't think anywhere else would understand or care about the danger this poses. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me start at the beginning. It started a few days ago. It was the last year of high school and me and my friend Brian had checked out entirely. It was Friday afternoon and we were walking home, which usually meant our usual route of going to the park, hanging out, and maybe getting a little stoned, then heading home. On our way to the park, we noticed a crowd had gathered. I went up to Jenna, a fellow classmate, and asked, So what the hell is going on here? Oh hey Jason, it's super weird. This big fucking apple tree just kind of appeared out of nowhere last night. Don't you come through here to get to class? No, we just pass by here to enjoy the scenery as we go home. So what's the big deal? It's just an apple tree. I looked at Brian and he looked a little pale. Dude, you alright? Huh? Oh, uh, yeah. Don't know why an apple tree would weird me out. I was a bit stunned by that answer. You better be more worried about passing your finals than that fucking fruit, dude. I turned back to Jenna. So again, why is there a crowd? Apart from a giant tree just popping up overnight. Well, someone ate one and started tripping hard, talking about past lives and speaking different languages. The weirdest thing, though, it never seems to run out of fruit. That all seems pretty fucking weird. Maybe I should try... I was cut off by Brian. Don't. He said. He looked like death. He was sweating profusely now and looked half ready to vomit. Let's just go. I didn't say anything as we walked around the crowd and out of the park. Damn, Brian. You look like you're about to pass out. What? Brian cut me off again. It's wrong, Jason. It shouldn't be here. Not in this town. Not on this earth. Not in this universe. Promise me, whatever you do, don't eat one of those apples. Not a bite. Brian, I think you're... Promise. Okay, okay. I promise, I promise. Me and Brian were silent as we walked to his house. I didn't want him to walk home all by himself, plus my house was just a block away. As I was on my way home, I had a sudden urge to go back to that tree. There was still quite a crowd, though most had left by this point. I saw people gathering bunches of apples and leaving. I looked around and noticed nearby there was a nice juicy apple just laying in the grass. I stared at it for what felt like hours, remembering the promise I made. Also the possibility of seeing what kind of person I had been in a past life. Without even realizing it, I was holding it in my hand. As if in a trance, I was slowly bringing it to my mouth. Just as I was about to take a bite, this feeling, like an inescapable dread or something akin to when you're just about to fall off the side of a cliff and time slows to let you ponder your last remaining seconds hit me like a bullet. Suddenly up was down and the shade felt like it was brighter than the sun. I threw up as ice and acid hit my gut at once. 
Someone took notice because as I finally came to, I had a small crowd of my own. They asked me if I was okay, and I did my best to brush it off as a mild case of heat stroke. Someone gave me their water and I downed the whole thing. Some random person insisted on walking me home and, honestly, I felt in no position to refuse. I got home and was greeted by my mom, who at first was about to lecture me for being so late getting home, but then anger turned to sympathy as she saw my face. Honey, you look white as a ghost. Are you okay? She thanked the person who walked me home and I explained that I had just needed to rest and that it was just a bit of heat stroke. She made me drink about a gallon of water before she let me go to my room. I don't know how, but even then... I still felt dehydrated. Lying in my bed, I kept thinking about me and if my experience was the same as Brian's. Every time I thought about it, I got that feeling like I was going to throw up. Think of it like this. Have you ever felt like something was watching out of the corner of your eye? Except the more you tried to understand the feeling, the more you feel like something is watching you from behind your own eyes. I was so unnerved that I got no rest at all, and sleeping was basically out. I decided that if I couldn't sleep, then there was a good chance Brian couldn't either. I decided to call him and see if he was still up, and sure enough, he was. Hey Jason, what's up? Dude, I almost ate one. I felt just getting to the point was important. I think he was about to chastise me, but I cut him off. I think the same thing you felt is what happened to me. Like everything in the world just turned wrong and my mind and body couldn't decide what reality was. None of us spoke for about a minute before Brian finally said, It's evil. Pure and simple. Meet me there tonight. Bring a lighter. I tried to talk, but he hung up. I was going to call him to protest as I didn't want to be charged with arson just before graduation. But this gut feeling I had told me something worse was going to happen if we didn't remove that tree from this town. I met Brian at the entrance of the park. He had a backpack with him and I showed him the lighter we used to light our joints. Good. He said, let's hurry up and get this over with before anyone sees us. We got to the tree and I looked at my phone. It was 1 a.m. Brian must have seen me looking because he said, Thank God it's Friday, right? We both laughed. He took out a small canister that smelled of gasoline and poured it on the tree. I approached it carefully and lit the tree with one hand out while protecting my face with the other. It lit up quickly and we ran like hell. We weren't going to stay and risk getting caught. I think I didn't wake up till almost one. I looked at my phone and holy shit was Brian blowing it up. I called him, but before I even had a chance to speak. Where are you? Are you okay? Um, yeah, what? It didn't work. It didn't fucking work. I remember how frightened he sounded. Like the end was just around the corner. It got bigger. The fire made it fucking bigger. Now some local company is trying to take ownership of it. Check the local news. I turned on my TV to see our local news lady talking to some woman from a food company located in our little town. Yes, we believe this tree is a miracle of God. We want to share this miracle with the whole world. To see one's past lives could teach us so much about human history and help us not to repeat our past mistakes. I dropped my phone. How could this have happened? Doesn't wood burn? It took me a second to realize that Brian wasn't talking to me. Dude. Dude. I came out of my trance and picked up my phone. Now what? I asked. There's a forum. People in the town like us who know that shit is evil. We're ending it tonight. I could only imagine what he meant. Are you in? Something about this felt wrong for some reason. Are you in? I... I don't know. I mean, the last time we thought we were doing the right thing, it just made it worse. Brian gave a... Ch and hung up. Don't get me wrong. 
I knew the danger this tree posed, or at least my gut did. I honestly wished at the time I had gone. Maybe I wouldn't be in the predicament I am now. I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking I should be there with him. We always had each other's back, so why was I hesitant now? Suddenly, as if a switch were flipped, my brain turned inside out again and that inescapable dread was back. I ripped open the door, ran outside while picking up the car keys and got in the car. My parents ran at the car with my dad asking what the hell was wrong with me. All I could do was yell out the word apples and put the car in reverse. I think I ran more than a few reds as I was fairly sure a cop was chasing me. I finally made it to where this food processing plant was and it seemed like no one was there. The cop pulled up behind me as I parked and had his hand on his gun. As he was approaching my car, a large explosion followed by a sonic boom launched out of the building. The windows on the car shattered and I was lucky I didn't lose an eye. I looked out towards the building and there were a large number of people coming out of the explosion. One was Brian. He looked like he was dead on his feet. I called out to him and he gave a slight smile as he collapsed. I ran and checked his pulse. Still alive. I picked him up and put him in the car. My house. He said in a hoarse whisper. Dude, we gotta get you to the hospital. It looks like that explosion knocked out that officer. So let's just get you some help. My house. He said a bit more forcefully. I hit the steering wheel. Fuck. I put it in drive and took him to his place. His parents were shocked to see their baby boy looking like death warmed over. We have to call an ambulance. His dad's son. His mom called 911 and was explaining the situation. Brian was trying to get up, but his dad was trying to get him to stay laying down. Gonna puke. Was all Brian could say before he pushed his dad away with enough force to send him flying across the room. Oh my god. And holy shit. Was all me and Brian's mom could spit out before Brian started vomiting up what looked like applesauce. Whatever happened at that processing plant, copious amounts of those apples somehow found their way into my best friend's stomach. Some guy came with explosives. He he was planning on killing anyone inside. Uh, I tried to warn anyone inside but got knocked. He threw up again. Woke up inside. Was on a catwalk. Tried to get up. Pushed into a vat. Couldn't hold my breath. His scream was louder than anything I'd ever heard from him. His mom was in tears but was too afraid to approach him. Then something terrifying happened. His body began to change. His limbs elongated and his mouth began to grow rows of sharpened teeth. His skin became so black that it seemed to absorb light. It took me a second to realize that the room had gone completely dark. Oh my god. Brian's mom yelled. What used to be Brian stood up, though not completely as his new frame was taller than the ceiling. I heard a scream come from outside and instinctively turned my head. By the time I looked back, I saw the back of Brian as he chased after his mom who had tried to escape this house and maybe, like me, hoping to escape this reality. I just stood there for what felt like hours. I finally snapped out of it when I heard Brian's mom screech in a way that it is best not described. I'm not ashamed to say I pissed myself. I inched toward the front door slowly and put my back against the wall next to it. I slowly looked out to see something that, if I hadn't already emptied my bladder, would have. Not just a scream, but screams, echoing out into the night as several grotesque forms of all shapes and sizes were chasing after the panicked populace. Brian and a few others were deep in concentration as they feasted on what was growing pile of corpses. I ran for it. A stupid move, I know. But reason had left me, and I'll be damned if I wasn't going to see if my parents were okay. I saw something beyond nightmares. Not one shred of our little town seemed to be safe. I heard a scream, and again couldn't help but look. I'd been seen. 
I thought I was done for, but a corpse flew through the air, and this thing with wings crumpled to the ground. I looked, and Brian had his eyes, or what was a distinct absence of light and where his eyes should be on me. I started running again. I made it home. It was empty and trashed. I heard some noise from the back, and Dreadhead sees me again. Out of the back door, I saw one of those things. It was gnawing on some bones. Only a scrap of skin still clinging on my mom's skull told me what I didn't want to know. Jason. I heard the distorted voice of Brian say, If it's any consolation, I am truly sorry. I guess after so long being repressed, we needed to eat. I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to scream or cry or beg or any of it. I just went into a rage. I picked up the biggest piece of debris and swung. It hit Brian square in the jaw. He just knelt down further. I took the debris from my hands and pulled me into a hug. Dread like that when I almost ate the apple. I pushed him away and ran into my room. I'm not even sure if I escaped on my own or if he let me go. A second later, I heard him again. Jason, I need to tell you why. Why what's happening is so important and so amazing. He explained how demons were the core of millions of souls. That their master had them seek forgiveness and be allowed to atone by living righteous lives through constant reincarnation. Their true task was to weaken humanity. They would have no idea why they do the things they do, but forming the basis of our current world apathy. Then when the tree comes, one their lord grew, to eat of it and remember their mission, then leave to make ready the invasion. I'm not going to let you be killed, Jason, but I will give you a choice. He slid half an apple under my door. Join us willingly. Or I bust down the door and you join us unwillingly. I'll give you some time. I finally understood. At my core, I was a demon. It didn't matter how good or loving I was. I was always moving toward this goal without even knowing. Now, we've come full circle. I've thought about ending things on my own terms, but why bother? I'm sure no matter what life I reincarnated into, he'd find me. He is my best friend, after all. I purposefully kept the name and location of this place a secret. I don't know how much of this place will even be around after tonight or if anyone will be left. But for your own good, don't come looking. All I'll say is this, too. If an apple tree happens to appear in your town out of nowhere, run fast, run far, and for the love of God... Don't let anyone eat the apples. Goodbye. Does anyone else remember the game of locks? It was one of those online games for kids. I remember playing it as a reward in elementary school. You would travel from location to location, interacting with colorful NPCs, and solve puzzles to break the locks that kept them trapped. I'm asking for a friend of mine, Ethan. Called me the other day and asked about it. It was so out of the blue because Ethan and I, we haven't talked in years. We lost touch after high school, I guess. But we barely got through pleasantries before he starts asking me about the game. Did I remember it? Do I ever think about it? That kind of stuff. Before he said the name, I hadn't thought about the game of locks in years. Not since middle school. Maybe it was Mr. Petrock who first showed it to us. Ethan and I were both considered gifted, and twice a week the two of us and a handful of others would shuffle out to Mr. Petrock's classroom for special classes. It all felt like games, really. Problem solving and out of the box thinking. But whoever finished early was free to jump on one of the dusty PCs along the back wall, where Mr. Petrock would let us log into the game of locks. 
Ethan and I debated for a while about whether or not it was a website. I remember clicking on the desktop icon, a pixelated brass key, but he remembers it opening a web browser. A shortcut, maybe. If so, there's nothing about it still around. We even tried using the Wayback Machine, but nothing came up. He says he called me because he was having dreams about the game. In them, he's seated at a large table with characters from the game. The mini-eyed sloth, Xerthas, the undulating, the speaking crawler, etc. When the hateful Dodger walks in, the Dodger, who wears a loose-fitting jester's outfit, and whose oversized face is set in a permanent scowl, acts as the guide in the game. He walks you through the controls when you log in, gives you hints, introduces you to each new area of the map, things like that. Anyway, he walks in and starts talking to Ethan, telling him how much they've all missed him. He showers Ethan with praises as dinner is brought in on silver trays. In the dim torchlight, the Dodger cuts slices of some indeterminate roast while the sloth brings out casks of honeyed ale. Ethan eats and drinks his fill. When the dinner is finished, the assembled characters are still telling Ethan how smart he is, how funny and clever. They tell him that the puzzles he solved weren't for just anyone. Only smart boys and girls were allowed to play the game, and only the smartest were able to solve all the puzzles. They croon at him, meat and ale dripping from their open maws. The Dodger reminds Ethan that he got the farthest in the whole class, that he was the only one to reach the floating islands of Carthun, where Iktalus Aten lays trapped beneath the stones. He tells Ethan that Mr. Petrock has left their service and that they are in need of a new Seneschal to break their chains, to free them and their king, that he's been chosen. Only, I remember the day that Ethan reached Carthoon. We were both playing, and I was only a level or two behind him because I'd had to go pee. When I got back from the bathroom, he was at the great gates that barred entry to the islands, and he was stuck. Instead of getting back to my game, I stopped to help him. We finished the puzzle, but the bell rang as I went back to my own computer. Mr. Petrock came and checked our progress, and his face lit up when he saw Ethan had made it so far. He told me to head back to homeroom and kept Ethan behind to discuss some things. I don't know why I didn't say something then, about how we'd worked on it together. I do remember lingering in the doorway, trying to catch Ethan's eye, but he was too giddy at the extra attention to look my way. I was furious at my best friend's betrayal. Mr. Petrock no longer had Ethan play the normal games with the rest of us, telling him to focus all of his class time on the game. The rest of us were still allowed to play when we finished, but what was the point? Glancing over at the fractal patterns and geometric puzzles on Ethan's screen, I knew there was no point in being the second to reach that level. It wasn't long after that Ethan's seizure started in. He was diagnosed with some rare form of epilepsy that had remained dormant up to that point, and taken out of class for the rest of the year. Mr. Petrock was more reserved after that, and he limited how long we could play the game. I went to his classroom after school one time, hoping to play some more, and found that the door was closed, despite the narrow window being blocked by a sheet of black construction paper. I could see light pouring from the crack beneath the door. It shifted between blue and purple, pulsating in a way that made it difficult to look at for a long while. I pressed my ear to the door, but heard nothing. I tried the handle and found that it was unlocked. I eased it open, my heart pounding in my ears to find... nothing. Mr. Petrock was just seated at his desk, head bent down. There was a lit candle sitting in front of him and he quickly blew it out when he saw me. He smiled and asked if there was something he could do for me. I stuttered out something about looking for a jacket and left. 
Anyway, Ethan says the dreams come every night, with the hateful Dodger and the others urging him to find the game and solve the puzzles. They promise him wealth and power. He never gets any rest during these dreams, apparently, and I could hear how tired he was in his voice. He says he's starting to hallucinate, starting to see the characters in real life, hearing their whispers, seeing their forms behind shower curtains and through keyholes. He was hoping that I had heard something of the game, that I could help him find it. Which is why I'm posting here. Has anyone heard of the game of locks? I'd love to track down the website or a hard copy. The only thing is... Well... I don't think Ethan deserves to beat the game. He had my help, but I don't think anyone else knows that. And I don't think I deserve to either. But my son, Sean, is getting ready to start in his own gifted class. He's a bright kid, maybe the brightest, smarter than me in every respect, and he's really, really good at puzzles. Attending my younger brother's funeral was something I never thought I'd have to do. At the age of 18, he was still growing into himself, getting ready to take on the world. He was getting ready to leave our small town and go off to New York for college after graduation, but things started changing for him in those last few months, it seemed. He'd once been top of his class, sociable, confident, expressive. In the months leading up to his death, he'd become withdrawn. He started failing his classes, became snappy and paranoid. He constantly curled in on himself, and he glared at everyone around him. My mom seemed to shrug it off as teenage hormones, but I thought there was something seriously wrong with him. He trusted me with a lot of things, and one of those things was his recent paranoia. He told me that one day while he was taking a shower, he'd sneezed. But despite him being home alone, someone had told him, Bless you, in a hushed tone. He'd seemed so paranoid about it, but I'd brush it off at the time as stress over his upcoming finals and told him not to worry too much. He'd tried to argue, tried saying he kept hearing it, even weeks later, but I'd told him to drop it. Now he was dead in a casket in front of me. Pale as a cloud in the sky, they'd ruled his death as a heart attack despite him having no previous heart conditions, and even our mother wouldn't believe that, not with how we'd found him. Blood leaked from his nose and dried all over his face, eyes wide open and empty staring a hen. His mouth was sitting gaped open, and his back was resting arched off the bed, arms bent oddly beside him. I still remember the scream my mother let out when she had gone upstairs to check on him. My wife had comfortingly wrapped her arms around me as we'd walked back to the car following the service, but I had hardly acknowledged it. Too distracted by my thoughts and my younger brother's sudden death to concentrate on anything but this sudden misery. I'm sure I could have done something differently. Maybe if I'd talked to him more... Tried getting him out of the house. Tried helping him keep up with all those studies and exams. Maybe I could have changed things and kept him from disappearing like that. Those were the thoughts going through my head for the few weeks surrounding the service. I'd soon come to find out that listening to his concerns would have been the best thing that I could have done. A bit more backstory on my town, I suppose, would shed some more light on this subject. We came from a small, peaceful little town outside of a major city with a population of a little over 2,000. Or at least, it had been a little over 2,000. You see, my brother was one of many increasing cases of heart attacks or heart failures plaguing our town over the last year. We weren't sure how it started, but people were having them left and right. And with it, our population had dwindled down to about 1,000. I know it seems extreme and hard to believe. 1,000 deaths in one year. And almost all attributed to strange heart attacks. 
I found it hard to believe too, but then again, I'd also found my brother's concerns hard to believe in the beginning. I'm not writing this story to try and sway you or convince you, because I know some people will choose not to listen. I am writing this as a warning to all of you. Don't follow in our footsteps. Don't make the same mistakes that we did. On the third week following his funeral, it had happened. I was exhausted after a long day at work, stressed and aching, and I had wandered upstairs to take a nice hot shower. Eyes closed, hands washing out my hair. I'd felt a tickle in my nose, and lo and behold, I sneezed. Then I heard it. Bless you. It was so soft and quiet, I almost missed it. And in a momentary haze, I'd assume my wife had heard me and answered me. Exiting and drying off, I'd pass her on my way to the closet with a quick thanks. For what? She glanced at me in confusion and I returned her look. You know, for saying bless you, when I'd sneezed earlier. I threw on my pajamas as she chuckled and shook her hand. The stress must be getting to you, hon. I didn't even know you sneezed, so I didn't tell you that. She shook her head again as she passed me, pressing a kiss to my cheek and telling me to get some good sleep tonight. But if she hadn't... No, that would be ridiculous. There was no way. There was no way my brother had been telling the truth, right? I sighed as I settled down for the night, chalking it all up to stress over my brother's death and my mind playing tricks on me. It had to be a figment of my imagination. That was it. I'd be fine. Spoiler alert, it was not a figment of my imagination, and I would not be fine. Even as I find myself typing this out, I don't know how much time I have left. I was an idiot. I probably still am, but I'm trying my hardest to get my story out there so all of you can prepare yourselves. The members of our town that haven't sneezed in the shower are beginning to think that the rest of us have gone crazy. That we're hallucinating. That some sort of illness is spreading like crazy. If only they knew. If only they experienced what we were experiencing. That little voice doesn't stay a quiet little whisper, driving you slowly to insanity. Oh, how I wished that were the case. How much more preferable that would be. No. It grows louder. It starts off as a whisper, a little hush when you're in the shower, and then every time following that it grows stronger. When I was making my breakfast the next day, it was still fairly quiet, brushing against my ears. When I was driving to work a few days later, it sounded like someone speaking from outside my car. When I was at work, it sounded like someone was saying it from down the hall. Louder, 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 it continuously grows. I can't take it anymore. It's gotten to the point that it feels like whoever is saying it is right behind me, yelling it into my ears. It makes me curl in on myself, makes me shudder, makes tears bloom in my eyes. I can feel it. It feels like fingers dragging themselves along my brain, digging in and pulling. I don't know how loud it will grow to be. There are other symptoms as well. Insomnia, loss of appetite, occasional to frequent nosebleeds. Dizziness, nausea, the list goes on and on and continues growing the closer I get to my approaching doom. And fuck the paranoia. The paranoia claws at you from the inside. Even as I'm sitting at home alone, I can feel eyes on me. Hear bated breaths. It tears you up from the inside. It drives you mad. It seems that my brother's change in appearance had made so much more sense. I wonder if blood loss is how we die, our blood emptying from our noses until there's nothing left inside. They started as little drops of blood every now and then, a little nose bleeds. Nowadays it flows, streams out of my nose and stains all of my clothing. It's the sneezing that's the worst though. 
no longer gentle sneezes. As the voice grows louder, the sneezes grow more intense. Blood shoots out, accompanying any snot, dizziness, and nausea rack you. And if you aren't lucky, you'll end up vomiting or at least dry heaving post sneeze. It's painful and it stings and feels like dying. I currently feel like I'm dying. I don't know what to do anymore. All of us are alone. All of us that have sneezed in the shower. Our loved ones abandon us, calling us crazy or trying to isolate themselves as they don't catch whatever illness we have. My wife, who I'd previously told about my brother's claims, believed me to be insane, saying it was stress and that his own delusions had become my own. It was crazy to me how the woman I once loved and held so close could now come to look at me with such fear and disgust. Although, how could I blame her? I'd lost weight. I'd become erratic. I didn't sleep anymore, and even the smell of food made me start to gag. She hadn't even tried to file for divorce. She had simply walked out the door a few weeks ago and told me to never speak to her again. We have nowhere to go. Nobody to turn to. Even doctors won't try and help us as they say there's no feasible cause for any of the symptoms. At least not that they want to try to look into. I'm sure they think us all as crazy as our loved ones did. So again, I'm writing this for you as a warning. Do not, under any circumstances, sneeze in the shower. I don't know how far the problem is spreading. I've already seen articles of increasing heart attacks a few cities over. If only they'd known, but now at least you do. I beg of you, spread the knowledge around. Tell your friends. Tell your family members. All they have to do is hold it in. Get out of the shower if you must. Shut it off. Run a few rooms away. Finish the shower later. I promise you it's not worth it. You might think of me as crazy and stupid as they all did, but we know. Those of us that have done it know. I can feel it. I can feel it growing closer, clawing at me, scratching at me. I think I only have a couple days left. To anyone that doubted me, I wish you believed me this one last time. I can already feel my nose starting to itch again, the blood starting to build up. I've stopped trying to hold them in. There's no point in prolonging the inevitable. I fear there's no cure from this. Not once it's set into motion. If this is the last thing I do with my life, I hope it works. Goodbye, Aaron. God, if only I'd listen to you. And goodbye, Lucy. I hope you can still find a way to be happy somewhere, even if you think of me as a monster to be avoided. Goodbye to all of you as well, that have heeded my words, that have made it this far. Please, I beg of you. I can't stand the thought of anyone else suffering the way I have. Resist the urge to do it at all costs, and maybe you won't become one of us. Signing off from the world, and soon, from my life. Farewell. I dreaded going to get groceries, but I had to at least once a month. I observed the outside from my window. It looked cold. Some clouds, but precipitation seemed unlikely. More importantly, there was no one to be seen. I'll wear a coat, but unfortunately no hood. It's unnecessary today and would just draw attention. I dressed up and retrieved my wallet, cell phone, keys, and pocket knife. I unlocked each lock on my apartment door and left, carefully relocking them behind me. These damned stairs. It took me a long time to plot it out, but I'd finally perfected my route down them. Left, middle, left, right, right, left, right, left, skip to center, left. They creaked away, but I avoided the really bad spots. I cracked the lobby door open and peeked through. There were several people walking along now, two across the street and one on my side. Cars ambled by. 
I closed the door, waited a minute, opened it, and stepped outside. I couldn't peek twice. All but one of the people had moved on. A man in a gray overcoat. He was now standing a little bit down the block, leaning up against a chain-link fence. He must be watching me. I steadied myself and descended the stone stairs with mock confidence. Turned sharply left and began walking. I reached the end of the block and had to wait for the walk sign. Ugh. At least it would be acceptable to look around, and I did. I pretended to check my pockets and turned around to look back at the man. He was still leaning against the fence, not looking at me. Better. I turned back around to see that the light had changed. Shit. How long had it been that way? Just a second? Two or three? If it was more than three, I'd look suspicious. But at least I had the excuse that I was checking my pockets. Always prepare an excuse. I hastily crossed the street, exaggerating looking both ways in order to take in my surroundings. Two cars were lined up to cross the intersection toward me. Their drivers seemed to pay me no mind. One was looking down at his phone, and the other seemed to be bobbing his hand. Do any of them pay attention while driving? I glanced over my shoulder again once across the street to check on the man in the coat. He was still there. He was at the edge of my vision now, so I can't be sure. But I think he was looking in my direction. I shuddered and walked a little faster. The rest of the way was about as smooth as it could be. I only had to stop for one more light and no one spared me a glance. Not bad. Now I had to actually go through the store. I went in and grabbed a basket, looking down to avoid the camera. The first aisle was junk food, so I grabbed a pack of cookies. I went around to the refrigerators in the back and took a half gallon of one of the many types of milk. Down the next aisle, a box of macaroni and some sauce. Next, a box of something or other. The shopper's eyes bore into me, and I was quickly running out of patience for choosing things carefully. I just wanted to go home. I hurried down the remaining aisles, grabbing a few more increasingly random things and some fruits and vegetables. I finally made my way to the registers and unloaded onto the conveyor. Of course, someone immediately got in line behind me. That always seems to happen. I could feel sweat prickling my neck and back. She scanned the items, one after another. It seemed to take an eternity for the cashier to scan and bag everything, and I'm pretty sure she shot me a few strange looks. It's fine, though. She was too busy for me to stick in her mind. I paid with my card and hustled out of the store, heart racing from the stressful situation. I walked around to the back of the building and took a moment to lean up against the store wall and breathe the cool afternoon air. Peace and quiet in this empty alleyway, away from prying eyes. After I had regained my composure, I carefully checked around the corner and with no one entering or exiting the store, I walked to the front with my purchases and turned left to head home. Just before turning, however, I spotted something that made my eyes dilate with worry. I couldn't be certain it was him with the quick glance I stole, but it certainly seemed likely. The man in the gray overcoat. I stiffly turned my head as eyes shot through my veins and my mind raced with fear. I started walking, steps quick and sharp toward my home. I got into a rhythm and felt that I was making good progress, and I didn't need to stop for the first light. The second one stopped me, though, and I found myself short of breath. The skin on my back still crawled and I almost didn't have control of myself as I turned ahead to look back. I knew I was breaking the rule. I didn't have an excuse, but I needed to know. There he was, heading my way, moving at a steady, deliberate pace. He was looking right at me. Shit. I turned around and, seeing that no cars were coming, brazenly defied the walk sign. I pushed my feet forward and pulled my body along with all my strength. 
I already had his attention. I didn't want to draw that of any others. A fiery determination welled up inside of me, pushing down the fears telling me to start running. I took long strides and was so keenly aware of my surroundings that I felt like I had eyes all over my head. I was certainly going to be alright. I am better than him. I quickly came to the last intersection with its angry red light. I stopped and decided to check behind me once again, and in an instant, my temporary confidence was shattered. There were three men now, walking on naturally fast in an arrowhead-like formation. They were about half a block away. My eyes shot wide open in terror as I broke into a run. A car horn blared right next to me, and I heard squealing tires, but I didn't care. I ran for my life. I reached my door and slammed my key in the lock, turned it, and tore it open, shutting it tight behind me. Through the small window in the front door, I saw seven or eight of them, all dressed in long, dark coats and concealing hats, standing like racked pool balls looking right at me. I backed away from the door and ran back up the steps, unlocked my apartment, and went in sealing it up tight behind me. I dropped a bag of groceries in the trash and shed my clothes down my pristine, unblemished skin. I walked to my sparsely populated bookshelf and pulled it aside, once again laying eyes on my steely pod. I walked in and hit the button on the wall, the semicircular door sliding shut behind me. The lights came on one by one, illuminating the various control panels and pilot seat. I pulled in my knees, reversing the direction of the bend in my legs, cracked my neck to the left and right, allowing it to elongate. I stretched backward, allowing my spine to revert to the proper shape and my second pair of arms to emerge from my chest plane. I made sure to unfold them slowly and give the phalanges a minute to unfurl. I stretched and moved all of my various appendages around. It's been a while and I don't want to pull a muscle. I couldn't allow myself to bask in the freedom of my true form, though. I took my place in the seat and started flipping switches and pulling levers. The small room changed around me in word to life, but... In a moment, I'd be able to go. Time to relocate. I don't know about any of you, but I like to run and walk for miles sometimes. Most people enjoy going for a 15 or a 30 minute jog. Me? I can walk for a long time. Recently I moved to a small town. No more big city beach walks for me. Now it's all in the countryside. Farmsteads and quiet forever stretching open roads. So you can imagine my walking and running abilities have taken advantage of this. Once I swear I ran so far that the sun took an extra few hours to set. None of this is important, I'm just bragging here. What is important is what happened yesterday. I woke up, ate the health breakfast, got dressed and ready for a long walk. I reckoned I'd make 100 kilometers that day. The day was perfect. Blue skies, clouds, but not the kind to worry about. Birds and not too hot of a sun. I started down the old farming land highway that no one ever uses anymore, as it's quiet and has spectacular scenery. Walking down this road, I get to an uphill. My Nike's not making a sound in the quiet of the morning. Farming lands all around me with beautiful Dutch settler-style houses dotting the distances. Because of this place being so... out of the way, one could easily find snakes in the road or in the shrubbery next to the road, and various other animals from rats to turtles, whatever you could think. Getting atop the hill, I reached for my bottle without stopping and taking a small sip. Conserving resources is important out here. I'm on the open black tarmac, looking as far as I can see. Mountains and valleys in the distance making the background farmland on my right 
In an old forestry land on my left that hasn't been tended in decades, I hear rummaging sounds in the bushes when I pass by, and know it's obviously whatever sorts of animals live in there, but nothing too big to be afraid of. That's when I first saw him. A man, maybe six foot three, skinny and aged between 18 and 20 something. He was standing about 50 meters from me behind the fence of the forestry farmland by one of the burnt out trees from last summer's fire season. He was wearing a hoodie that could be considered a cowl, as you couldn't see his eyes just the grin of Razor's sharp fucking teeth smiling at me. In hindsight, I don't even know how he could see me with his hood pulled over his eyes, but as I walked, that smile followed me and I could swear I saw those teeth biting his own bottom lip, drawing blood at each sharp point. I felt extreme panic rise in me, and goosebumps cover me up so I started jogging. I would have turned around and gone home, but that would have meant being in his eyesight for longer and him possibly seeing where I live. So I started jogging on the street wide black tarmac, once used by farmers and cattle trucks, now just for the occasional tourist. I looked over my shoulder and saw the hills descend had hidden me from his view, which I felt good and scared about at the same time because I don't know where the fucker is. Around 20 kilometers away, I stop for a break and keep my walking pace. As the old saying goes, if I can't run, I can walk. If I can't walk, I'll crawl, but I'll never stop moving. I was about 30 kilometers into my day and the sun was blazing down on me. Birds had gone and the chirps were gone with them. Walking, I made out lots of creatures, crickets, dead snakes, Roadkill, ants. That's when the sun made me feel like an ant, crawling on the surface of a carcass. I looked behind me, still feeling sick from whoever I saw back there, and I was pleased to see nothing. Nobody. Just me and the road. Intel, of course. A car. I first heard the car before I saw it. Out here, a car can be heard for miles before it reaches you. I saw it coming from far ahead, and down below the hill I was descending, again that went around a bend at the bottom. It was a white Ford pickup truck. From a little away, I could tell there was a family in, and they weren't driving very fast as people coming through here usually do. They flashed their lights at me in the daytime, which was weird because I was walking on the shoulder of the road and so I thought it was just a greeting. As they passed at a snail's pace, I could see something was wrong. The father of the man driving made no eye contact, and neither did the woman next to him. They simply stared at him. The man's hands on the wheel with blank expressions. The part that fucked me up was the daughter around eight years old in the back scene. She was carrying on frantically like shouting silently and point to down the road trying to mouth me something but I suck at lip reading. Whatever she was saying it made me terribly uneasy and as I kept watching the car pass me in slow motion, I looked at the parents again and the father and mother had turned to look at me with pressed together lips smiling widely and their eyes stretched way bigger than they should stretch. My back broke out in goosebumps and I almost pissed myself at this image. The little girl was now laughing hysterically at me at flipping me off with both fingers. Then the car was past me and I could only see the canopy. I knew they were all watching me in the mirrors. The girl probably turned around in her back seat just to show me the fingers some more through the back window. I stood there for a while. The first and last time that I stopped running throughout that whole day. I couldn't believe what the fuck just happened. I wanted to turn around then and there, but I thought I'd rather not head in the direction where they're going, so I kept forward. I was walking now, unable to shake the images of those people in my mind. I was utterly scared and talking to myself, not knowing what's going to happen out here. I took my water and drank some. When I put it back and looked forward on the straight, I could see a figure about two kilometers ahead of me. Jogging at a casual pace, hoodie on over their head, 
The fear I felt in that moment is indescribable. I wanted to die and at least make it quick compared to whatever it was what was happening to me panned out to be. I was walking, still trying not to keep up, but he was slowing down, I noticed, and so eventually I'd be side by side with this thing. Something inside me came back out, fight or flight, they say, so I considered my options. I'm screwed either way. I thought to myself, this guy has made a mistake, thinking he can take me on these rounds. I thought to myself, bud, I'm going to run you into the ground. That's when I tightened my pack, put my bottle inside the bag, and crossed the street. When I got across, I could almost see the side of its face, but I was a bit too far. I started running. Good at first as I caught up in my heart, adrenaline, anger, and fear all combined into a sour ball of an intoxicating drug I rushed forward, sprinting like a prey from a predator. I flew past him, leaving dust behind me. I didn't take the time to look at his face out of fear of losing my game while going past, and also because I could feel that face looking at me but not looking. Just that hooded face with its everlasting smile of sharp teeth turning with me as I came past and went forward, and probably kept with me all the while. I could keep this up for some time, but there was still the unanswered question. How the hell did Mr. Shark Teeth get by me all the way to this side of the road? It made me feel defeated, but like I had lost already, and he's just playing with his food basically. I wanted to slack, but I thought if I did that, I'd have no chances at all. As long as I kept moving, I can survive. After some distance, I slacked a little, still jogging, but keeping my energy. I risked a glance behind me to find the single most terrifying face, not a kilometer behind me, right fucking on top of me. He was literally five meters away, grinning away. Pale white skin, broken pieces of glass for teeth it seemed, and the hood covering the eyes I would never want to see. This scared me. I started peeing. My bladder just gave and I pissed myself while my legs kept running on autopilot mode, and my brain trying to understand what my eyes are seeing. He measured up against me. Side by side we jogged and I kept looking at him. My face stuck to those teeth, too scared to move except my legs. After a while I couldn't slow down or pick up pace out of fear of the unknown. I just kept right next to him, or it. Looking forward now, his face was turned to me and if I had a full bladder I'd probably had gone again. From down the throat, I could hear him not breathing while running but whispers. His lips were wrapped tightly to the outside of the gums but the whispers he made inches from my ear while running next to me made my skin crawl and goosebumps filled my skin all over. The voices came from deep inside its throat, not saying anything I could understand or hear properly. After running almost 10 kilometers with this thing at my side, the sun was going down and I would have been on my way back already, but that's when it said something. Not in any kind of voice I've ever heard, but to put it in example, I'd say it sounded like speaking while snorting like a pig simultaneously on every word. It said, I'm going to rip your head off and eat your eyes out of your skull. Then I asked, what does it want? It said, to play a game. It said game drawing it out like in a teasing, mocking way. I said, okay, what game? Then it replied, whoever gets to the crossing at the town ahead first wins. Neither of us spoke again. Neither of us spoke again. It was dark and we were still at it. I knew if I lost, it would kill me and probably fulfill its whispered truths. When I saw the crossing up ahead, I sped up, almost sprinting, but so did he. I was getting tired, and this thing had seemingly untapped amounts of energy. Just when I thought of getting over the fences and into the farmlands, a sudden loud thud came from my side like a bag of potatoes hitting the ground. A beastly shape flew out in front of me in the dark. 
I could see well in the stars and moon it was an enormous fully grown deer that had knocked Mr. Sharky to the ground and probably broke his neck because I looked around and he wasn't moving. I sprinted to the end of the road and made a left to another direction that would eventually lead me home. Somewhere along the way, some farmer stopped and asked me why I was out here all by myself. I couldn't say anything because I'd seem crazy, and all I wanted was a ride at that point. They put me in back and drove me home where I got to tell my parents everything. Screw running and small towns. I'm heading back to the city. I'm a sheep farmer from down under. Dingoes and wild dogs can be a real pest with livestock, so I'm no stranger to losing a few sheep here and there. However, if you don't deal with the problem quickly, you can lose up to a third of your flock in any given year. Recently, we've had a pretty bad spell of drought, and I've been highly motivated to make sure I don't lose any more money. The event took place about two weeks ago. I was rounding up livestock with the assistance of my beloved Australian Shepherd, Cody. He's a beautiful purebred Kelpie that is mighty efficient when it comes to running operations on the farm. The sheep listen to him and he need not bark twice to get them into line. The same chain of command existed between us. On this particular morning, I noticed some damage to the field's boundary fence. A large hole had been dug beneath the barbed wire and traces of what looked like blood had dripped onto the dirt surface. This was a pretty good indicator that a dingo had snagged one of the little ones. A quick head count confirmed I was down on one of the lambs. I recall being slightly jarred by the dingo's movements. The dragging of an entire animal was extremely unusual and seemed like an unnecessary arduous task. Typically, they would leave behind at least some remains. I justified this occurrence with dingoes being renowned for being merciless killers and strange in their motives. Sometimes they would kill a sheep for the fun of it. With this in mind, I excused the strange behavior as another one of the many abnormal characteristics of the pest. Naturally, I was quite furious about the incident. How is it that humans can be so high up the food chain and still find themselves being knocked down by a wild animal? I needed to reassert my territory. You can always use poison to eliminate a dingo threat, but there is no guarantee it would work. And I didn't want to risk Cody ingesting such a thing. I couldn't forgive myself for that. I was desiring a quick solution to the problem and maybe an act of vengeance, so I decided to sit out on the farmhouse's porch that evening with my rifle. Growing up in rural Australia had gifted me with a very precise aim, hunting being a favored pastime of mine. If I missed, the sound of the bullet would at least let the dingo know this area wasn't theirs to prowl. The porch looked out over a 100 meter stretch of field that separated the farmhouse from the untamed bushland. The luscious green grass starkly contrasted the tangled shades of brown branches that swallowed the horizon. I assumed this is where our thief was coming from. I spent the afternoon carving out a double-pointed wooden stake. At 50 centimeters in length, the sharpened pole could be planted into the ground firmly with a chunk of meat attached to its top. I placed my lure onto the field soil, halfway between the farmhouse and the wilderness. The 100 meters had been transformed into a death strip. Twilight came and I settled into my seat. I held my rifle firmly in my right hand as I gazed towards the meat stick. Cody sat beside me, arguably more alert. Although he was an attentive dog, I had never seen him so focused. He stared at a point separating farmland from bush, never breaking his eye line. His ears pricked up to every sound nature spat out. They revolved around his head like tiny radar dishes. He whimpered. Usually when you live somewhere alone and isolated, you find yourself conversing with man's best friend. You don't need to worry, Cody. I whispered, petting his black fur. You're on the side of the better hunter. 
A branch snapped. Suddenly, Cody pounced onto all fours and began barking out into the field. I snapped my head back to the wooden pole and raised my rifle. The meat was gone. I scanned the farmlands but found no sign of whatever snatched the lure. It couldn't have been a dingo. That was too quick. Something would have had to run that stretch within a matter of seconds. My mind raced to what other possibilities could be plausible. There were no conclusions. How had it slipped away? Cody lost it. With each bark, I felt there was an ever-diminishing chance of catching the thing. The sheep had begun to race around their paddock, triggered by the familiar sounds of his yelps. I grabbed his collar and managed to get him seated. His paws danced nervously on the wooden panels as his eyeline remained locked. I could feel his tiny heart pumping in his chest. Cody? He didn't look away. This was bad. He always listened to me. Cody. He quickly flashed me a look before turning back towards the strip. He saw it again. I knew he saw it because he erupted once more into a series of barks. I swirled and followed his line of sight. Something else was attached to the pole now. Something I hadn't put there. I couldn't make sense of the white blur at first until I saw its bloodied leg. The missing lamb. It was still alive. A makeshift rope of bark and vines had been tied around its neck, connecting it to the pole. It bleated out in pain and confusion. The most unsettling part of this visual was that it seemed the rope had been decorated with small daisies running along its length. Whatever had done this was far too fast to be human, far too intelligent to be any creature. As I was about to run out and reclaim my missing property, I observed the warning sign and stopped. Scrawled in the lamb's blood across its wool was a singular word. Bait. I dared not fall for my own trick. It was mimicking my own tactics. I had never been taught how to hunt such a thing. It had became awfully quiet. It was dark now. Cody had finally stopped barking. Instead, he sat looking at me in a way he never had before, almost as if he was reevaluating me. Until that night, I didn't know dogs could do that. A piercing whistle cut through the cold air, emitting out of the bush. The sweat on my palms made the rifle slippery to grasp. Both Cody and myself looked out into the thicket and watched as a cloaked figure stepped out into the moonlight. The dark robes it wore looked like they were a part of its body, melded into its flesh. I was right. It wasn't human. The figure lifted a gray and scabby hand into the air. Raising the stolen chunk of meat, Cody glanced at me. Cody? No. He slowly began walking off the porch, gingerly placing each paw. The figure whistled once more, beckoning him. Cody, stay, I yelled. He didn't listen. Cody ran out across the grass, passing the lamb, and sprinted his way towards the thing. I aimed my rifle and hovered my finger over the trigger. I was ready to shoot. The hooded figure moved the meat in front of Cody's nose and weighed in. Cody sat down obediently. The meat dropped to the ground. Cody pounced and started to inhale it. The hooded figure leant down and began to slowly pet him. It was looking directly at me, white eyes staring into my soul with every stroke of my dog's fur. I couldn't believe it. I dropped my rifle. Cody had chosen the side of the better hunter. I've been renovating my grandfather's house after his death and have found several things that confounded me and some that amused me. You see, he was an artist and a really good one at that. He created several sculptures, paintings, even some machines that could have easily won him some award had he been brave enough to show them off. Sadly, he was also a bit reclusive. 
but I faintly remember him sending my family a letter every season with a small animal, carved by him obviously, attached to it. Nevertheless, he also had a bad side. First of all, he was the biggest perfectionist to walk this planet. There is a place where it's healthy, and it drives us to be better. But his perfectionism was through the roof, and extremely unbeneficial. Secondly, and this is the thing that annoyed me the most, it was his immense need and want for money. Not only was he greedy, but he had never spent a penny on family outings. Even the carved animals he had made for us was made from the wood of the tree in his backyard. Now that you know a bit about him, I won't waste any more time and get into the particularity that happened today. So, as I was cleaning his drawers and mopping his bedroom, I stumbled across his secret diary. It looked like it hadn't been used for ages, obviously contradicting the truth. I, being the curious and intrusive person that I am, read the last few entries of it and it shook me to the core. I'll copy his last six entries because they're the weirdest of them all. First letter, 2021-1121. Finally, no one believed in me, but I proved everyone wrong. The famous Louis Caballo sent me an email this morning asking me to create a giant painting that would resemble his carrier from start to finish. I have never been this excited to start working. He even promised me a large sum of money. 10 million fucking dollars, that I could not turn down. It all seems so surreal and I still pinch myself, waiting to wake up in my old, stained bed and walk on my moist, plain carpet. But after this, it will all change thanks to the generosity of Louis. I already planned some things. I'll be starting tonight and create a quick sketch for the painting then begin the artwork two days later on Saturday. Hope I still have it in me, as I haven't really done anything noteworthy the past few months. At first I even pondered the validity of the email, as why would someone as famous as Louis Caballo want a painting from someone as insignificant like me? However, that doesn't matter right now. What does matter is to make an exceptional job, one that will be remembered even after my death, one that would imprint my name in the history books, and one that would make me an icon and an idol for the young generation. Second letter. 2021-1124 I started working on the painting yesterday, and to be completely honest, it's been pretty rough. I've caught myself losing focus not really having motivation, and sometimes even painting without properly realizing that I'm doing it, creating a mess on the canvas. I blame it on the fact that I haven't been active that much recently. Being as old as I am without any big or prominent creation has left a bad stain on my name. Sometimes I think about my life choices and regret them, as I could have been a celebrated artist had I been more talkative and proud of my work. Now I feel like this is the last chance to actually do something worthwhile. If I can do this correctly, I won't feel like my whole life has been a waste, and I can retire and live a comfortable lifestyle until my inevitable death. If I fail this as well, I will die knowing that no one has been proud of me, knowing that I haven't done anything notable or even noticeable. I don't want that. Who wants that? No one does. Third letter, 2021-1202. I don't understand what's wrong with me. My smooth lines have turned into rough messes of random colors and my characters look terrible. I've been doing this for the past week, non-stop, but I just feel like I've made no progress at all. And even if I did, it could be discarded because of its quality. I've been thinking of taking a break for a few days, but how would that help me? I've been on a break for the last five months doing nothing. I look at my older creations in disbelief and wonder, where did all my skill evaporate to? I should still be able to paint things I'm proud of and things that people would buy. Would people pay for this? Right now it looks like a mess. 
with colors placed haphazardly throughout the canvas and my muddy footprints in some corners. I just feel so disorganized and don't know what to do about it. I think I'll still have to skip the carving session for my grandchildren this year, as I have to be completely devoted to this piece of work. I really hope it will only get better from here. The clown masks that I've drawn when I was younger are placed on my walls, and looks like they're laughing at me while I'm failing miserably. My other paintings that are placed throughout the house usually give me inspiration. Now they just look like things that mock me for the work I'm doing now. I know it's not that great yet, but... And then he crossed out. You don't have to rub it in my fucking face. And then we get back to the actual letter. It should get better. It will get better. It must. I'm doing all I can, and I'm known for my stubbornness. If I put my mind to something, it will work out in the end. You can count on that. Fourth letter. 2021 12 26. I've become a mess. I'm starting to be forgetful and inattentive. I've also started dreaming about really dark and eerie images. This night, it was the image of my family holding knives at the dinner table, ready to... And then he crossed out, slice me into multiple pieces and eat. Then we get back to the letter, kill me. I've also become really paranoid. I swear I'm hearing movement in the house and sometimes even hear things whisper. It usually happens during my painting time. The faces on the walls start changing shape and once I've caught them talking to each other. No one would believe me though. That's why I'm not telling my family. I'm probably just really stressed and paranoid anyways. Sleeping is going too well nowadays either. There's this voice inside my head that just won't shut up. I took sleeping pills, but they haven't been that effective. And since I wanted to feel better about myself and my work, I took some paintings off the walls. Even if it looks a bit emptier, at least now it doesn't feel like I'm... And then he crossed out, being made fun of. And then we get back to the letter. I should aim for that level of accuracy. I mean, the reason I put them up is because they came out perfect. This painting won't be perfect. It doesn't have to be. I just have to make it semi-pleasing and I'll get paid. What do they know? These famous, snob, and spoiled celebrities that don't know real art anyways. They won't ever know the pain and struggles us artists need to put into our work. And then he crossed out. They're talentless, only fueled by pitiful emotions. Pathetic. I deserve to be in their place. I deserve to be that rich and famous. I should be there. Not Louis Caballo. Then we get back to the letter. I think I'll take the clown masks down as well. I keep spacing out and staring at them. Also, some dolls that are placed disorderly in the room. I keep staring and staring at anything that isn't this painting. My only moment of tranquility. Anytime I'm focused, or trying to be as it doesn't really work anymore. My head hurts and I lose my train of thought and ideas. It's horrible. I just really have to finish. And once it's done, I can be comfortable. I could even upgrade and buy a better house or a car. Heck, why not buy two with that much money? Fifth letter. There isn't a date on this entry, but I believe it's somewhere between January the 4th and January the 25th. I broke them. It wasn't on purpose. I just impulsively did. The masks, I've tore them down, but they keep laughing and staring and getting ingrained in my mind. I found my hammer and smashed them. It stopped now, but I'm scared. They could come back any time. I called my family today just to check on them. It was nice to hear their voice. It really calmed me down. Maybe I did go down the wrong path. Maybe I really should have accepted a better and more stable job and spent more time with my family. The paintings in my house have also been taken down. I took them to my garage and lit them on fire. It was good to watch them burn. Sometimes it's good to release your past. 
They give you false and inaccurate expectations that you should follow. I think that's bullshit. We evolve. We shouldn't rely on our past self and past experiences. The world's moving and it never stops. I've also moved my bed to the painting room. I have no real motivation of leaving this room. Why would I? Anything outside is just a reminder of my depressing life. That pretty, colorful vase I made when I was 22. I just wanted the money, but since no one bought it, I decided to keep it. The paintings that don't exist anymore, they're still up on eBay, where I keep lowering the prices month by month so someone would buy them. But no one does. Am I really such a huge failure? Am I not deserving of a good life? Maybe I was too narcissistic. Maybe I don't actually have any skills. Especially not in painting. Alright. The painting. I've decided it would look better with my muddy footprints on it. It expresses my emotions towards Louis and the other celebrities that got lucky in life. I feel like it's a nice addition to it. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I mean, what do you know? You're just someone that appeared on TV once, said a sentence to make the audience laugh, and now have a whole army of delusional, stupid, self-centered, special people behind you. I also keep seeing figures from the corners of my eyes. Honestly, while it should be scary, I find it really comforting. I've never been too close to my family. I didn't even visit them this Christmas. Seeing... Those things in my house just adds a layer of safety and comfort. At least I know that I'm not all alone. At least there are still things that care about me. Sixth letter. 2022-13 I finally finished the painting today. I'm really proud of the final product. It contains my blood, sweat, and tears. The figures also agree with me. They have taken up a form that is unique to them, and I think it fits them. There are three of them, and they are always watching me. They pay attention to me. They don't ever let me have a moment of silence to myself. They just keep whispering and whispering, and I like it. Finally, I'm being noticed. People adore me and my work. They... I began calling them my friends, appreciate me, and give me new and wonderful ideas for my other creations. They requested me to tear down the wallpapers from the walls, which I happily obliged to. What kind of sick celebrity wouldn't comply to the demand of their followers? Well, I guess most of them, but I'm different. My friends can finally see. I'm not envious anymore. I'm happy with what I have. And then he crossed out the word lies. Other people just have to find my work and see the inner beauty within them. It's not hard. You just have to be perceptive and accepting to new and rational ideas. Needless to say, I'm satisfied. And then he crossed out the word no. With how everything turned out at the end. I'm content with life and my followers. I'm not lonely anymore. I finally achieved what I wanted to, and now I can finally unlock the door, go up to my bed, and rest. I deserve it. My friends will keep me safe from anything. Goodbye. And good night. As I watched in a horrified near paralysis, the frail 62-year-old Patricia Hansen, the very same Patricia Hansen who would invite you over for tea and homemade cookies at any given opportunity, gouge her own eyeballs out of their sockets with her dull, nailless fingertips, said nails having been chewed down to the quick daily over the previous six months. Right in the middle of our daily, group meditation session while screaming at the top of her lungs. I've looked upon the face of our god. Our god is a dung beetle. The devourer comes. I began to realize we were in this thing too deep, and I doubted we would ever make it back to normalcy. Normalcy. What even is that anymore? 
I wondered as the white-coated residential assistants swarmed into our small meeting space and attempted futilely to restrain Miss Hansen. And do we even want it? Our living conditions at the sterile, beige, and sepia-toned care home were far from normal. I almost wished, if only for a second, that my body were still riddled with the cancer that, just one year ago, was destined to take my life. Not only my life, but those of my co-residents. Just a year ago, we were two dozen middle-aged and terminally ill cancer patients, allegedly beyond the healing power of modern Western medicine. Cervical, ovarian, prostate, liver, pancreatic. We had the worst of them. When an opportunity arose for a different, potentially life-saving treatment, I initially hesitated, as did some of the others. A cross-world trip to the Himalayas where I could very likely die and would potentially not get to see the prime childhood years of my daughter, Katie. Well, it didn't seem like an attractive option. But I ultimately realized it was at least something because staying in my current situation meant a sure and certain death. To take the trip to Nepal was hope and the promise of more of Katie's tiny hugs and butterfly kisses. We lost one of our lot on the way out there, 45-year-old Joshua Taylor. A pancreatic cancer patient was nearly denied the trip due to his ill health, but he would made a last-minute, nearly miraculous turnaround and was cleared to go. In the final days, his medical recliner was several away from mine on the flight out. That guy really liked fishing. He'd expressed some hope that we'd get a chance to fish some raging mountain river at some point in our experimental treatment. Poor guy went out choking on a torrent of blood, which suddenly began spouting profusely from his mouth at 35,000 feet. The Nepalese monks welcomed us with open arms. After our hired transport managed to get us over the rugged terrain to their mountainside retreat, they didn't speak much English, but somehow we didn't need language to communicate with them. They knew what we needed before we did. Mostly what we needed, it seemed, was peace and quiet. Simple, decent food, and hours and hours of intense meditation. Through their teaching, we learned how to go deep within ourselves. At first, simply to isolate and manage our aches and pains. Then later, to, after a couple months of training and several more losses amongst our cohorts, seek out and destroy the cancer cells that were consuming our bodies. Once we'd learned this final, miraculous step, our recoveries began to take off. Beyond physical healing, we felt complete with both mentally and spiritually. We then began to learn further secrets and tricks of meditation that allowed us to not only go deep within ourselves, but to group meditate, wherein we would handle the burdens and challenges of each other. In the end, the 18 of us who left the monastery were in the best health of our lives. Still, our doctors did not let us return to our homes and scheduled routine, but prescribed extended, secluded, follow-on treatment at the Maple Hill Care Home. Only the story could have ended with our full healing, but it didn't. As it turns out, that kind of deep group meditation is not just fulfilling, it is also highly addictive. Daily, when our group would meet for therapy and peer support in the home's small conference room, we would launch into hours-long group meditation sessions, in which our minds would meld together and solve the problems of the world. Individually, we were capable, but as a group, we could push ourselves leagues deeper than we could ever reach alone. For most of us, these were overwhelmingly positive experiences. But for the silent others, some went to locations in the spiritual realm that they never desired to see. It was a few weeks after we'd started these sessions that ovarian cancer survivor Kathy Threat ended her life with a bedsheet noose. We didn't connect the dots at the time. Kathy had been missing her family, and the home's no-visitor policy had been especially hard on her. She'd frequently shared this sentiment with us. 
However, I'd seen a darkness in her thoughts during our group sessions that I think may have been more of the reason for her fatal decision. And she wasn't the only one. Brandon Leitner heard the voices of his deceased mother speaking to him as he tried to sleep at night. It was even so bad that he could feel the warmth of her breath in his ear. Jamal Stevens would occasionally debate audibly with himself the exact thickness of the veil that separates our living world from the realm of the dead. Apparently he could both see and touch this veil. Still we pushed on into the deepest depths of our souls, like meditation junkies. Unfortunately, Miss Hansen's exercise of removing her physical eyeballs was not helpful. No. The vision she wished to be cleansed from was not something sensed by physical eyes, but more the domain of the inner eye that we had all developed and cultivated over the past year. As they transported her away to the ER, writhing and kicking upon the gurney, my sympathies went with her. But as the doors closed behind them, I felt relieved that the residential assistance hadn't ended our session short, and I sensed that same relief from the others. Instead of ending our session, we simply intertwined our fingers, bowed our heads, and plunged once more into the often terrifying depths of our souls. It was the first time in almost ten years I had even set eyes on my hometown let alone my childhood home. Smaller than we remember, huh? My brother Archer said to me as we pulled into our driveway, This whole town is smaller than I remember. I responded with a small laugh as we parked and exited the truck. The nostalgia almost made me forget the reason we were there. Start with their room and get it over with, my brother said somberly. It took me a moment to respond as I sat there, staring over our old living room. The sight of each picture frame being a gut shot from Tyson. Keegan? Archer said, snapping me out of my daze. I looked at him with a simple nod, and with that we went to our parents' bedroom, clearing out all their belongings and dividing them between the two of us as promised. We tried to lighten the mood talking about funny memories, but most of the time it just led to us missing them more. We then moved on to our respective bedrooms. It was one of the few enjoyable moments as it mostly consisted of reminiscing on my old things and enjoyments. I'm gonna be real, I went full 8 year old and played with all my little knickknacks. You'd be surprised how much you'd want to play with your toys after not seeing them in nearly a decade. Seriously, the LEGO Star Wars playsets kicked absolute ass. After, about nearly three hours of recreating the entirety of the Star Wars prequels, it was back to the depressing setting. Me and my brother had met back in the living room, so that too much may be cleared out. I never thought I'd hate the feeling of being in my own home. It made me nauseous. It felt like my heart was physically snapping with each photo and sentimental item I was forced to look at. The hatred of my home would only grow from there. As I went to move my dad's old 1940s TV when color was still considering groundbreaking, I noticed something that made me feel rather uneased. I picked it up, doing so caused my thumbs to press up against a warm screen glass. I only pondered it for a second before... Archer once again broke me from my train of thought. You take the attic, I take the basement. He asked as he filled yet another box. Yeah, sure, I said as I boxed the television. I thought about it for a little, but chalked it up to Archer watching a classic childhood movie. I was in my room for a pretty long time. With that, I left it there and made my way to the attic pulling down the old rickety ladder, and the moment I poked my head in, I was hit with the most disgusting scent I've ever smelt. Almost so bad I puked the second it hit my nose. After half a bottle's worth of Febreze, I was ready to climb up and finish my job. After a few minutes of literally cleaning house, the smell returned. 
Assuming I was getting close to the source of it, I figured I'd try to find it and fix it with the second half of that bottle. And sure enough, I found it. Three dead squirrels. Two being bitten in half. My first thought was, oh, fuck, that's disgusting. Then turned to, what did this? I didn't take much time to think about it at first, prioritizing not wanting to smell the rodent corpses. I quickly finished collecting the boxes and bags before leaving the attic, folding up the ladder and closing the door. I then began pondering about the cause of the squirrel crime scene I stumbled across. To be honest, I was a little unnerved about it, but I reasoned with myself. It must have been a bobcat, or possibly a snake. I mean, our town was basically on a mountain. We have had plenty of encounters with smaller predators. Oh, how wrong I was. My brother and I once again met in the living room, and my sense of unease was drastically increased as we did so. Did you want to hear some crazy shit? Archer asked me. I nodded and he proceeded to tell me about open cans of food and wine bottles. I began questioning the squirrels again. There's definitely no way a bobcat could use a corkscrew or can opener. I told him about said squirrel, and he agreed it was weird, but convinced me the two situations were unrelated. It was probably a bobcat in the attic, and mom and dad probably just started using the basement, he said. This definitely put me more at ease, but still suspicious, because my parents never ever ate or drank down there. They'd always bring it back up, but it was the most logical explanation at the time. After clearing the house of all the belongings and loading them into the pickup, it was already sundown, so we decided we'd spend the night at home, as our apartment was an almost two-hour drive. After a dinner of whatever leftovers we had from our lunch, we picked up on our way here, and a long period of just talking about memories. We prepared to head to Ben. As I laid in my old bed, I was awoken by a loud scratching from above, along with the sound of a slight pitter-patter like small footsteps. I looked at the clock, which read 2 a.m. Still assuming it was just a regular bobcat in the attic, I simply groaned and tried going back to bed, but the noise kept continuing. Deciding I wasn't going to get any sleep till I caught the thing, I got out of bed, grabbed a flashlight and my old man's pellet gun, and made my way to the attic door once more. I climbed up and began scanning the area till I began to hear the little footsteps and scratches once more. I followed the sound, readying my pistol as I got close to the sound. I continued till it was practically right next to me before turning my flashlight and catching the creature that had been the cause of all the strange occurrences we've come across. Damn sure wasn't no bobcat. My hand began to tremble slightly as I looked at this creature. It was humanoid and about three feet. Closer to four, actually, as the thing stood in a hunched-over crouch. Its feet were extremely disproportionate to the rest of its body. Large, long feet leading to a pencil-thin ankle. The same situation went for its arms and hands. Its head was large, too large for its body, along with missing a bottom jaw. Its skin looked leathery and dry, almost like an elephant. What was left of the thing's mouth? wrapped around his head from end to end, being lined with what looked like at least two dozen small, jagged, pointed teeth. Its eyes looked completely dead, closer to pure gray than pure white, as if they were filled with clouds of smoke. At first, all I could do was sit there with my light set on it, paralyzed with complete fear and confusion. I was almost unable to comprehend this thing had even been in front of me as I tried to process whatever the fuck I was staring at. However, my paralysis was quickly lifted as I heard the thing let out a high pitch and gargly screech before moving its way towards me in an unnatural manner. Its body moved like a living rag doll trying to run like a regular person, bending and contorting with each step towards me. My fear was briefly replaced with adrenaline as I lifted the gun and put three pellets in it before dashing for the ladder and locking the attic door. 
I quickly woke my brother up and told him we needed to get the fuck out, and there was no time to explain. I began rolodexing through my head what I was going to say to him, and as we entered the truck and pulled out, sure enough he asked me what was wrong. My brain landed on a huge gas leak in the kitchen. You didn't smell it on the way out? As I pretended to call the cops and report the situation. I mean, what was I going to say? There's a goblin, monster thing in the attic. He looked at me before shrugging. Guess not. He responded as we drove back to our apartment. I couldn't tell you what the fuck it was I saw. I couldn't tell you why the fuck it would eat squirrel when it's able to break bottles and can seals. I couldn't tell you how it managed to use the TV. All I know for sure is it was much more intelligent than its appearance would lead you to believe. And I'm seriously starting to doubt my parents died of natural causes. After all, how likely is it a couple in their mid-fifties die in their sleep on the exact same night? Some people like to act like their childhood was perfect, that the cliché blurry memories that sit in a photo book in their mind were their only experiences during their developing years. The misleading neon lights that lead to anecdotes of Play-Doh and kindergarten recesses tease them into thinking that their early years were filled with joy, laughter, and universally shared experience. They were normal. Their parents were fine. Well, I did not get the fortune with a present father, my mother made up for it with a constant abundance of gifts, general sweetness, and basically allowing me to get away with anything. Encouraging some mischief, even. It seemed as if every problem present in my life was swung away by the wrecking ball that was my mother. Today, this assumption was broken down in my hippocampus like dynamite to a 19th century brick wall. Last week, my mother died. Of course, it was unfortunate, but that is not the topic of my recent experience. Recently, as her only child and her being an only child herself, I had to sort out her home. I went through boxes and boxes of jewelry, china, corny decorations, and fake flowers. I left the attic for last because I knew some of the toughest things were going to be upstairs. I also tasked my work buddy, Davin, a man I've always thought of as the most straightforward and tough man I knew, to help me move all of these things out of the house. We both slightly were overweight middle-aged men, I had to slowly climb up the pull-down attic ladder. As we entered, we were immediately met with a strong fragrance of dust and mold. Cobwebs filled the whole attic with cardboard boxes littered about. Has she entered here in the past ten years? Possibly not. A near life-size Santa doll also sat in the decrepit crawl space. We both got to work shifting through the boxes before bringing them downstairs. David found some miniature angel figures, Doctor Who memorabilia, and ammo for a missing gun. I found an old jack in a box, an NES, and an extremely torn kite of which neither of us had an answer for why it could have been saved. There was nothing else of note that we had found except for the last one. All of the boxes were shifted through and extracted except for one in the corner. I had avoided this box, not for a reason of location, for I had actually started near the box but because of the noticeable stench that surrounded the box. It smelled as if someone had roasted a rat, then threw it into a soiled toilet. Words have trouble describing how it filled your nose and dropped you to your knees. David had the idea of spraying some deodorant spray, which helped minusculely. I took some of the rubber gloves I had found on the other side of the attic and slowly opened the box. I had a sigh of relief for all I saw on top was a photo album. I lifted the album off to see a towel covering the bottom of the box. As one of those with those positive childhood delusions, I decided to skim through the album and see what I could find. 
The first photo depicted a dark night sky with stars I could no longer find in the sky in my own urban apartment. The photo was clearly rushed, though, for there was large streaks. It seemed someone was actively moving the camera as the button was pressed. Below it, another photo featuring me sitting on the curb. A sip of parchment labeled it as me waiting for the bus. Some other photos filled the next few pages that are without importance. My mind was at ease with the flashes of old memories I had not thought of for decades. This was until the next photo. The window of my childhood neighbor, Mr. Robin, as he adjusted his suit in the mirror, I recognized it as taken from the second story bathroom window, the only one with a sight into Mr. Robin's house. If me and my neighbor friends ever took a step into his yard, he would burst through the door with a cane in hand and a bellowing voice full of profanities. I never enjoyed his seemingly omniscient presence, as he often found time to chit-chat with my mother, but I never quite despised him. I also remembered him passing away when I was eight years old. That's when my mother had to explain to me what death was. Mr. Robin was an odd old man. I had no explanation for this photo, for I never remembered handling the camera. My mother would never let me. And of course my mother would never take a creepy photo of our neighbor. Maybe I snuck the camera once. But then why would my mother frame it in the photo album? Unlike most of the other photos, only being shared with the night sky one, there was no label underneath explaining the contents. This broke my brain in more ways than one. But I had to move on. I was going to get no explanation without looking further considering the fact my mother was currently in a funeral home morgue. Another set of boring childhood memories flooded by as I kept turning the pages. I then found a third image, a set of curtains taken from the outside of a home. A home whose patio wall I recognized as the curtains had robins plastered on them. I remembered these as belonging to Mr. Robin, which I remembered because I found the similarity amusing when I was little. This time I opened my jaw, less from the contents of the photo, but the continuation of this odd saga of my neighbor's home. What was worse was a second photo, with the curtains slightly withdrawn, and in the opening between them sat Mr. Robin reading the newspaper. This time I dropped the book. I called for David. My voice, for the first time in years, was quivering as I showed him the photos. He showed a slight concern, but made an excellent point in the fact maybe she had gotten permission and was doing these photos for him. For what? I am not sure, but really any explanation other than a story of something sinister was greatly appreciated. I kept moving. Birthday parties, basketball games... Weddings of distant relatives I couldn't recognize. More memories flowed past my busy mind. I wasn't even looking at the normal photos anymore. I was just searching for any sort of explanation or another lead to what these photos might mean. A few unexplainable but less so creepy photos passed by. A wedding ring I did not recognize. A lantern glowing in a forest held by my mother's hand. An open book. These photos matched in the unexplainable and lack of labels, but less so in what seemed to be the stalking of Mr. Robin. My heartbeat had slowed, but my interest was peaking. I kept turning and turning. That was until I found the photo, possibly the worst one I had seen. I had a pretty sheltered life, taken from what was clearly the inside of a closet. Between the crack of the door, there was Mr. Robin laying alone in his bed. My face went numb. My heart rate doubled. I started to hyperventilate. David was busy in the kitchen but told me later he had a bad feeling at that moment and went upstairs to come check on me. He noticed me pale in the face and staring down at that darn book. 
He put a hand on my shoulder and saw the photo himself. Davin, a man I had only known from comments about the weather and ramblings on his life that carried me through the boredom of my day, gasped as if he had seen a ghost. He stumbled backwards, but was able to find his way back up straight. Something's wrong with your mom, man. That or you were a demon child. There was one thing I knew about my childhood self. I was a scaredy cat. Even if I absolutely loathed Mr. Robin, I would never had the idea or the guts to sneak into an old man's home. And it was clear the height of this person was not a small child. I had no doubt in my mind that was my mother. I had reached the last page and below that was one last image. A small human shaped dirt mound on the ground. As if a hole that was just buried right next to it at the dead of night in a lantern right nearby. My mind was so numb at this point I could think of nothing but to lift the towel from the bottom of the box. In it a human finger and a ring attached to it. I fainted but luckily David was there with me and brought me to the hospital. David, fortunately, did not tell the hospital staff of the situation and explained I felt sick all day. They chalked it up to dehydration and stress. I am now laying in my hospital bed. In the meantime, I had horrible nightmares that I am too afraid to speak of, but in them I realized something. In the dream, there was a carbon copy of what I remembered as my mother's camera, and in it, I knew how to use it perfectly. After I awoke, memories I had long repressed came back to me like an avalanche. I did despise Mr. Robin. I used the camera. I conquered my fear. Tomorrow, I will be released from the hospital. Tomorrow, I will have to clean up the rest of my mother's home. Tomorrow, I will have to pay David. Tomorrow, I will have to destroy the photos. My mother always encouraged my mischief. For privacy, I'm going to call myself Rex and my grandparents Granny and Grandpa. My grandparents live on a farm in Australia. I would stay with them a lot as a kid because my dad left when I was young and my mom is an alcoholic. My grandparents were weird. First, my grandparents had a set of rules. Rule 1. Every door and window, including the doors inside the house, must be locked by midnight. Rule 2. No one can go into the forest. Rule 3. The fireplace must never be used after dark. Rule 4. If you hear screams, ignore them. Rule 5. No music can be played outside. These rules were told to all the visitors they got, and breaking any rule would make you banned from visiting them. They were very religious too. A cross on every wall, and they would pray five times every hour. The first event that was really strange happened during a sleepover at their house in the middle of winter. I was nine years old and never questioned the odd rules. I just figured they knew best or something. I was playing in the backyard with their dogs when I heard a scream. It sounded like a girl. I knew the rules. Must ignore it. But it got louder and louder. I went inside and told Grandpa, Oh, just ignore it, son. It is nothing to worry about. I played inside for the rest of the day. That night, I went to bed and the doors were locked, but I needed to pee. I knew I couldn't wait till the morning. In desperation, I unlocked the window and went outside to pee in the bushes. When I was out there, I heard the screams again, but it was closer. I heard it again. It was right behind me. I turned around and saw a girl in a white dress. She screamed again and I ran to the window and climbed back inside, locking the window. I didn't tell my grandparents. Two years go by and no weird things happen during sleepovers at my grandparents' house. But I felt more rebellious against my grandparents' rules. I went to my grandparents' farm to stay for a week. 
One night, I decided I didn't like being locked up, so I decided to climb out the window and go into the woods. I took a torch with me and walked for a while, and I found a small pond. I heard a scream behind me, and I turned to see the same girl I saw two years ago. She screamed again. I did nothing. She screamed again. Stop it. I yelled. She stopped and ran at me, pushing me into the pond. She then started to laugh. I got out of the water and looked at her nervously. She smiled and said, Hello, my name is Lucy. Hello, I'm Rex. I replied nervously. She walked off into the forest and I went back to my grandparents' home, confused. I decided to sneak out again the next night. I walked into the forest and I saw Lucy sitting under a tree. She looked at me and called me over. Follow me, she said with a smile. We walked and talked for hours. We walked to an abandoned house. We went inside. I woke up in my bed at my grandparents' house. I was confused because I didn't remember coming back to their house. I didn't sneak out at all after that for years. When I was 16, I was in bed at my grandparents' house and remembered Lucy. I was confused since I never really knew who she was. I decided to sneak out the window and I walked to the abandoned house. I walked inside and I looked around and walked into a kitchen. I noticed the fridge was open and something was looking in it. Lucy? I said. It stopped and looked up. It was not Lucy. It was big, and it was like a reptile but humanoid. It walked up to me and I ran to the door. I walked into something. Lucy, I said in surprise. It was her, but she hadn't aged at all. She smiled and took me back inside. We missed you, Rex, she said with a chuckle. The lizard person smiled and looked me in the eye. I started to remember the first time I was here. I knew what was about to happen. Lucy grabbed a knife and handed it to me. She grabbed another knife and stabbed herself, screaming loudly. She started to shake and she grew into a large lizard with horns. I thought for a moment, Lucy, Lucifer. I ran outside. I could hear them behind me. I got back to my grandparents' house and I got into the window and closed it. I told my grandparents what happened and they explained that the abandoned house was used by some demonic cult. They successfully summoned the devil. The devil has no real power so the cult disbanded. They then said I had a sister, but she died before I was born. My father left because of her death, and my mom became an alcoholic to deal with it. She was murdered by the cult and the ritual they used to summon the devil. They then told me I was never allowed to visit them again for breaking the rules, but I was okay with that. I haven't visited them since. I have seen them at family get-togethers, but we don't speak about it. In May of 2019, I was getting ready to go on vacation. We were going a couple states away and my parents had rented a house from somewhere for a couple months over the summer. As I was picking out clothes to put in my suitcase, I felt my phone buzz in my pocket. I set the shirt I was holding down and opened the Discord notification on my screen. Someone with an illegible username and a pink and white profile picture had sent me a friend request. I know what you're probably thinking. Hey dumbass, that's a stranger on the internet. You probably shouldn't talk to them. And I agree, but I was on a couple different gaming servers and I didn't think too much into it. A lot of people sent me friend requests so we could play together. Anyways, so I accepted the friend request and immediately got that little sticker of Wampus from the girl who introduced herself as Lindsay. We talked for the next hour or so until my mom yelled at me to finish packing. I told Lindsay I had to stop texting for a bit and she asked why. 
I told her I was going on vacation and put my phone down for a couple of hours to finish what I needed to do. After dinner, I picked up my phone again and saw 32 messages from her. I was a little weirded out, but thought she might have just been the type that sends a million messages for one thought. Or maybe she had sent me some TikToks. Fast forward about a week, and I had just finished putting my stuff in the dresser I had in the house my parents rented. Lindsay and I had talked all day, every day since we met, and now wasn't any different. I threw myself down on my bed and pulled out my phone. Me. Hey, I'm back. Sorry I had to put my stuff away. Lindsay. That's alright, silly. I know you'll always come back to me. And hey, maybe we can meet up sometime soon. I live in that area. I frowned at my phone, trying to remember if I hadn't ever told her where I was going. I quickly read back through all of our messages and didn't find anything. Eventually, I had convinced myself I had told her on call and forgot about it. Me. Yeah, that would be awesome. Maybe you could come here. We have a pool. Lindsay. Maybe I will. A couple weeks passed by and everything seemed normal. I was actually starting to have a crush on Lindsay. We talked often, called every night, and we told each other everything. One day, my dad took me out to a lake and we spent all day there, just messing around. I was having fun and didn't check my phone until I was back at the house and at that point, it was dark. When I turned my phone on, I had over 100 messages from Lindsay. At first, the messages seemed playful, but they started getting more and more hostile as time went on. The last message she sent said, Fine, if you won't come back to me, I guess I'll have to come find you. I'll admit, I was freaked out. No girl had ever obsessed over me like that. I texted her asking what she meant, and she immediately played it off as some creepy joke to scare me when I came back. I believed her until it happened again and again over the next couple weeks. The breaking point was when I didn't talk to her for a full 24 hour period. She sent me really hostile messages for a while and even tried spam calling me after a couple hours. The message that scared me the most though, was her last. She sent me a picture of the house from the road. I couldn't even play that off. I knew for a fact I had never told her the exact address of where I was staying. Suddenly, she called me. She must have seen that I was online. Lindsay, what the fuck is wrong with you? Where are you? All I heard was an unhinged giggle through my phone and water splashing like someone was kicking their feet in the pool. I looked out my window at the pool, but it was dark and raining outside, so I couldn't see anything. Suddenly, I heard her get off the call and lightning struck. To my horror... I saw her sitting at the pool, grinning straight up at me. I ran through the house to get my parents and told them there was a random woman at the house and begged them to call the cops. My mom called the cops while my dad went outside to check. He came back in and said he didn't find anyone, but cops were already on their way. I was terrified. Luckily, we were leaving to go home soon, so I was silently praying I could just leave all this behind been almost three years now. I blocked Lindsay and tried to forget about her, but I still see her sitting at the edge of the pool in my dreams every now and then. The cops never found her. My parents have agreed that we'll never go back, but sometimes I still feel like she's going to find me one day. This happened to me at the beginning of 2021. I don't remember the exact date, but it was still winter. I was working at the time and my schedule was always 7 days of work and 5 of rest. Every break I would spend at my country house, which is a good 40 minutes walk away from the nearest town. I have never been so scared of being alone. I actually appreciate the quiet. Anyways, it was only me and my dog. It was windy and cold, and I had the fireplace running so the room was pretty warm. I usually keep the door open, just slightly because of the fire, but since it was so windy, I had it closed. 
mind you, I had to lock it or it would stay open. And I only kept the window that had bars, quiet like a prison cell, open just a little. I can swear on my life that the door was closed and I was warm and comfortable. So I kept almost falling asleep, only wanting to stay awake to finish the movie I was watching. Once the movie ended, at about 1 or 2 a.m., I kept procrastinating going to bed, because I would have to go outside and it was too cold. I fell asleep at some point and woke up to someone knocking at my door. To give you some context, everything around my country house is fenced, to the point where it's almost impossible to get in. Much less at night, so I obviously thought it was a family member because they have keys and since I locked the door, they couldn't open it from the outside. I looked at the clock and was able to read the numbers. I checked the TV and could read the subtitles. I know it wasn't a dream. I got up, opened the door, and found something. Someone that was definitely not a family member. There he stood. I always think of it as a male, an inhumanly tall and lanky, arms and legs stretched to the point of looking like almost a wire. I couldn't even see his face, he was too tall for his frame to fit fully. He ducked and his face came into view except there was no face, and no hair, just a shape that somewhat resembled a head. He spoke, his tone gentle as that of a friend. That freaked me out even more. How did he speak without a mouth? May I come in? It's a ruthless night out there. I nodded, too scared to even have a fight or fly reaction. Moved away from the door to let him in. He graciously ducked inside then stood his full height, touching the ceiling with his hand. I tried not to show how scared I was, thinking it would be worse if he saw it, although my eyes did widen despite the best efforts. My dog, too tired after a day of running, playing, and jumping around, stayed asleep. I took that as a good sign. It would be going crazy if he was dangerous, right? The lanky man decided to sit down by the fire in a very small chair, only used to stroke the fire since its legs were cut shorter than usual. It looked almost comical. The seat was directly in front of where I had been sitting. Too scared to accidentally offend him, I sat back there and simply watched TV while pretending I didn't feel him staring at me. He didn't talk at all. After a few hours, he raised from the seat, walked to the door, and patiently waited until I joined him. Thank you for letting me warm myself, he said before ducking and leaving as if nothing had happened. I sat down intending to not leave the room until the sun raised. I fell asleep at some point and woke up when my dog had a nightmare. He's really loud. The door was open, the keys still hanging where I had last put them to lock the door. The door was open, but I swear I had closed it. To this day, I still wonder what would have happened if I hadn't let him in. I still spend my days at my country house knowing, or hoping, that I will just need to be kind. I want to tell you all about my experience. It may not be that scary to read, but for me, it was, and my family. I have never posted here or anywhere, so bear with me. We have always loved hiking and being outdoors. I was excited when we moved to our new house because there is a huge area filled with trees for us to wander through. Up behind the woods, you can hear gunshots, as there is a shooting range nearby. No big deal, but it's not like they are hunting in my woods. It's just me, my husband, and our 11-year-old son. I will refer to them as Hubs and Little B. It was a beautiful Saturday in the summer. The only problem was the darn mosquitoes and gnats swarming around trying to get a quick drink from us. We bathed ourselves in bug spray, 
packed some bottles of water, snacks, more bug repellent, and the usual small first aid kit, and headed out into the unknown. It was nice and relaxing. The trees gave us much needed shade as we trudged through the woods, trying to create our own path. The only thing I was worried about was running into a bear. Living in New England, it's not uncommon to see one roaming around. I couldn't shake this feeling that we were being watched. Hubs could tell that I was a little bothered by something, so he suggested we find a spot to sit for a few and relax. Little B didn't like that, but he had no choice. We found an old, downed tree and sat down. I thought I kept seeing something out of the corner of my eye peeking at us from behind trees, but when I looked, there was nothing. Must have been my mind playing tricks on me. Too many horror movies. I tried to think of something else, but I thought I saw it again. So I pretended to look in the opposite direction and then quickly turned in the direction I thought I saw something. And I saw it. It was someone wearing a white hood ducking behind a tree. My heart started pounding and I started sweating. I had to stop and quickly think. I didn't want to scare my son, so I told them I wasn't feeling good and wanted to go home. Little B was not happy. He was having fun and wanted to explore. Why can't you just go home and dad and I can keep going? He complained. Hubs looked at me and shrugged implying he agreed with Little B. I couldn't think of a good excuse fast enough. Because I don't want to walk back by myself and... I was interrupted by the sudden soft sounds of laughter. Their eyes grew wide as they heard it too. Yeah, alright, let's go. Come on, Little B. Hub's son. His tone was shaky. We grabbed our stuff and took off towards the road. We could hear footsteps in the bushes and trees behind us. Whoever this was, was enjoying this. Us being afraid and trying to hurry out of the woods. Every few minutes the laughter would start again, growing louder and more menacing each time. I was terrified, but I tried not to show it. My son was scared and Hubs and I had to be the protectors. I kept seeing him from my peripheral, but how? It sounded like he was behind us, but I kept seeing him besides me. Was there more than one? Was this even a person? What the hell was going on? The edge of the woods was in sight. I was anxious to get us all out of there. With the laughter coming from all around us, we started running. As we ran out of the woods, I felt a strong breeze hit my face that whispered to me something I will never forget. The soft, soothing voice brushing by my ear whispered, It is not that easy. Ever since I have stayed far away from those woods, I don't know what that voice meant, but I still think I see the white hooded figure out of the corner of my eye when I am home. But when I turn, there is nothing. The worst part is, it keeps getting closer. At first, I'd see it through a window, kind of. It'd be in my peripheral, but gone when I looked. Then it would be in the other room. Finally, today, I could see it through the half-open closet. This time, it didn't disappear when I looked. It just lurked in the dark. I ran. I am afraid of how much closer it will get, or what it will do. I don't think it is going to be very friendly. I'm a relatively new parent. I know that I don't know everything, but I do know this behavior is not normal. My daughter just turned one and was happy and healthy most of the time. She woke up in the night crying like all babies do, but the crying changed. Before, when she was a newborn, she would cry for milk or comfort. But starting a few weeks ago, she began screaming in terror. Every night, at the same time, 3 a.m., she would sit upright in her crib, huddled in a corner, staring at the same spot in her room, screaming. Nothing my wife or I did could get her back down, except take her out of that nursery to sleep with us. 
Once we noticed the scratch marks on her arms and face, we quit trying to put her down in her room, opting to bring her ours at bedtime. At first I thought she was doing it all out of childlike fear of the dark, but now I don't think so. She continued this nightly ritual for weeks, no matter where we put her down to sleep, sitting up at 3am, staring and screaming at something we couldn't see. Always the darkest corner of the room, always empty when shined with light, but... In the dark, shadows play tricks on your eyes. I would imagine shifting, writhing. Maybe it was her contagious fear that had me seeing things. I hope so. I never heard her cry like that any other time, but I did notice a change in her after a while. She wouldn't smile anymore. She stopped eating her favorite foods. She seemed so anxious all the time peering around corners before entering rooms, or just staying curled up in one spot all day. We took her to a doctor, we explained her behavior, and checked her health. She wasn't sick, as far as the pediatrician could tell, but she was diagnosed with anxiety. I didn't know babies could be clinically anxious, but being a parent teaches you a lot, I suppose. There's no medicine to treat the mental health of a one-year-old, so the one doctor just told me to be extra patient and to be sure to give her lots of love and attention. But she didn't seem interested in that. We held her, kept her near us, but it was like she didn't even notice. She stopped willingly going to bed, fighting her sleep for hours until it took her, just to awaken again at 3 a.m., the first morning I woke up without a nightmare episode, I was so relieved. I thought the night terrors had passed and that my daughter would return to normal soon. Until I rolled over to look at her. She was sitting, staring directly at me, smiling. Not the cute, innocent smile of a baby, but a deranged, unnerving smile. One that a cracked person would wear. A look that should never be on the face of a one-year-old. I could immediately tell she had been awake for hours. Bloodshot eyes framed in deep bags. Cracked lips dried out from hours of smiling. I picked her up but her demeanor didn't change at all. Not for the rest of the day. No eating. No nap. No dirty diapers. Just a horrible smile. We should have taken her back in right then. But I am ashamed to admit that we didn't. We wanted to give it one more day. I don't know what the doctor would have done, but maybe it could have prevented what came next. She fell asleep early that night, something my wife and I took as a good sign. We kept her in the bed with us, comforted by her steady breathing, until 3am. I woke up with an odd sensation. A slight turn of my head told me why. My daughter was inches away from my face. Smiling that same unhinged smile, I shouted in surprise and backed off. So did she, but in the most unnatural way. She scuttled backward, faster than I had ever seen her move. Right off the side of our California king, but there was no thud signaling her fall to the floor. When I looked over the edge of the bed, she was nowhere in sight, so I peeked under it. There she was, grinning at me. That look should never be on the face of a child. I knew it wasn't her anymore. I'm not a religious man, but I decided right there that I should be calling an exorcist in the morning. The way she had moved away from me, had presumably climbed down the side of the bed, it was not natural. My wife woke up then. When I heard her rouse, I rose from my place on the ground and my little girl shot out from under our bed like a spider, quicker than any baby could move. My wife and I screamed. We followed her into the nursery, where it took us a moment to locate her. She was sitting in the darkest corner, atop a tall bookshelf in her closet. We only found her because of the muttering. She had said her first words months ago. She was a smart kid, ahead of the curve, but... This wasn't babbling, or the one to two word sentences to toddlers. This was chanting, 
raspier and deeper than her voice should have been able to go. She was tearing at her arms and face with her nails, staring and grinning at us. I was afraid, but also angry. Angry at whatever had a hold of my daughter. I tried to grab her, but it was like she wasn't a baby anymore. She was so quick and agile. She dove between my outstretched arms and landed on my chest. She clawed and bit at my throat as if trying to tear it out. I stumbled back and pushed her off me. She hit the ground hard and I stopped. She began crying, her normal, sad little cry she reserved when she got hurt. Hope filled my heart as I approached her, but of course it wasn't her. Again she lunged at me, this time attacking my face, but my wife was ready. She caught my once innocent child and attempted to restrain her little arms. My daughter contorted her body and my wife lost her hold. I know kids are flexible, but the way she didn't. It's been playing tricks in my mind over and over, bending unnaturally, cracking loudly as if her little bones couldn't handle the strain, and the way she loped off after, almost injured. We haven't seen her since. I think she got into the vents. The main one isn't hard to reach. We keep hearing thumping and strange outbursts, like a manic child hiccuping with excitement and the cracking. Each time I hear a loud crack, my heart breaks. I think whatever it is knows that. It's hurting her to terrorize me. I don't know what took my daughter, but all I want is her sweet little self back. More than anything, I don't know where to turn. Maybe the Catholic Church? The police? Please help me. The sun is rising and I think she is getting antsy in our vents. I need help. Please. I just want my daughter back. The temperatures dropped in late October and by mid-November, all but the last straggling leaves were left on the branches of the trees outside. That's how it was every year, and after the leaves fell, the snow came. Sure, there were isolated cases of the stuff throughout November. Even a snowy day or two in October if you were unlucky, but it rarely stuck, and the snow that did stick melted away soon after. No, the bad stuff wouldn't ever come until December hit. I hated the snow. Every year the snow would fall and every year it would bring with it roaring winds and temperatures that dropped well below freezing. Walking in the stuff is hell. It freezes your toes and the air nips at your face and hands. After a trek in the snow your lips freeze so that it becomes hard to talk. Coming out of a blizzard is a kind of chill that seeps into your bones and takes hours to properly shake out. Even as a child I hated the way the others would gallivant through the stuff. As if it were some kind of godly miracle, rain after a drought. But I could see it for what it really was. Each snowflake has six sides. Each snowflake has intricate patterns that seem only a cosmic artist could produce. And yet the same properties of snow that allow this to happen are the same ones that allow it to accumulate on the earth. In the snow, everything is cold. I could never stand it. I watched the others throw snowballs at each other and shuddered at the thought of it myself. To have the tiny white crystals climb across my face, find their way into my clothes and along my naked skin. To feel the frozen touch of Jack Frost and his delicate torture is what I hated the most about the stuff. So why then would I live in such a place as this? I lived in a cabin with my wife, Kate. It was sufficiently far enough away from town that we had the privacy we wanted and the ease of living that we had grown accustomed to. The town was close enough, maybe 15 or 20 minutes by car. We had bought the place only a few years prior, but we both had fallen so in love with it. After three miscarriages, a chance of peace is what we both needed, and with Kate's inheritance, we had the means. 
The cabin was meant to be a place where we would spend our springs, our summers. The back opened to a beautiful field that filled with wonderful looking wildflowers when the temperatures rose. And encircling us was a ring of tall evergreens and leafy trees that helped to provide shade in the summer. At first we left the cabin when the temperatures fell. We would spend the cold months away in a more sheltered environment. But when catastrophe hit the family and she lost her inheritance, the cabin was all we could afford to keep. I had to keep up a job in town and spent the autumn with her in our little stretch of what used to be paradise. Kate soon fell in love with the area in the fall, but I couldn't be so easily swayed. It was harder for her to garden in the season, but she supplemented this with walks in the cool autumn air under the falling leaves. When the snow came around, I was filled with misery. Every year the storms would come, and every year we would have to weather them out. They always hit hard and always hit long. The valley was shaped in such a way that the northern wind would be funneled into a pinpoint and become trapped behind the mountains. When the snow came, it came hard. I dreaded the winter. We would spend the days in the dwindling light of the fireplace and wait until the shaking of the house finally stopped, and then we would head into town. We'd buy what we needed to survive the next storm, and then we'd lock ourselves in once again to await the next onslaught. Kate made the best of the situation, but I never could. One year we spent Thanksgiving at Kate's sister's house. It had been a while since we'd done so, and she invited us to stay for the winter. She had just gotten through a divorce and she'd have extra room for us to stay, and so it was decided we would stay the winter there. And we did the next year too, and after she remarried, she managed to find space for us despite the growing family. December had begun. We were late. We only had a few hours left until the storm started, and they started early this year. Earlier than every year before. Kate was busy packing in the room. I was gathering personal items out of the kitchen and living room. Late. We were running late. We needed to be out of here by tonight, out of the valley by tonight, or else we'd have to bunker down for a while. And I didn't want that. I couldn't have that. You almost done up there, honey? I called. From the staircase came a shrill reply. Almost. I'm just looking for... Oh, never mind. I found it. I heard the suitcase hit the floor above me and begin rolling towards the flight. I headed up to meet Kate at the top. You all done? She said. I nodded as I picked up the giant suitcase. Alrighty, let's go. Don't have to tell me twice. We began moving the luggage out to the pickup. There was snow in the ground, where there had been for a while, but it was only an inch or so thick. Nothing I couldn't handle. Not yet, anyway. But on the air, I could feel a breeze beginning, something just beyond the mountains that I couldn't quite see yet. I checked the back. Everything was loaded up and ready to go. I closed it and climbed into the driver's seat where Kate was already waiting for me and the passengers. What took you so long? She joked, just saying my goodbyes. And here I was thinking you hated it here. I chuckled. She always knew how to lighten the mood. I hit the ignition and the truck rumbled to life. It was frozen on the inside, but before long the windows began to melt and the interior began heating up. The truck jerked forward and then rolled onto the frozen pavement, following the black tracks of several journeys into town before us. Except this time, we wouldn't come back. Not for a long while. The sun dropped early like it always did around this time of year. Not that it could be seen behind the white sheet of clouds, anyhow. By the time darkness was upon us, we were almost out of the valley with good time, too. Kate shifted in her seat a little, then started looking around her. What did you lose? I said, keeping my eyes on the road. I... She checked underneath her. Where's my ring? Your ring? Yes, my... My wedding ring. 
Did you leave it? I think I left it. Well, we can't go back for it. We have to go back for it. What did I just... Milo, we need to go back. She had urgency in her voice. But we need... We have to go back. It's just a ring, honey. But it's our ring. I knew she wasn't going to let up. As indifferent as I was to the idea of leaving the ring for until we got back, I knew Kate wasn't the same way. She was a sucker for all things tacky, especially when it came to our relationship. Especially so since the miscarriages. And it didn't help that she had a habit of taking off the ring subconsciously and leaving it places. If we go back now, we'll be stuck. Only for a little while. The first storm isn't usually that big. I groaned. I knew we were going to have to go back eventually. Okay, okay, fine. But if the power goes out tonight, I'm blaming you. She hugged me, and I nearly swerved off the road. The truck pulled over and we got back on the highway the opposite direction. Not many cars were driving, but the few that were on the road were heading out of the valley. We were driving into the maw of the storm. Snow began to fall, lightly at first, but by the time the pickup pulled into the frozen driveway, giant snowflakes were already swirling in the growing wind. We pulled the luggage inside so it wouldn't freeze, and I powered up the heater. Although we'd only been gone a few hours, the house had already lost much of its heat. Kate ran upstairs to find her ring, and I got the fire started. Grumbling silently to myself about having to stay here, but trying not to be mad at Kate. After all, she saw the ring as a symbol of our strength as a couple. She only wanted it because she loved me. After a few, Kate stumbled down the staircase and joined me by the fire to warm up, ring on her finger. The thing glinted in the soft firelight, and for a moment neither of us said anything while we warmed ourselves up, just enjoying each other's company. I should get something started for dinner. Kate stood up and walked behind me into the kitchen. The fire crackled softly while the wind outside began to press on the windows. Need anything from town before it gets too windy? I heard her move through the kitchen and she checked the pantry. No, we have some dry food and cans here that'll work. I settled in for a long night. Hopefully we'd be able to leave by the morning. Kate cooked us some noodles and we retired early. The house was sufficiently heated that we could go to sleep in our own bed. Unfortunately, the cable was having its own share of problems due to the weather. But the VCR player worked fine, and we sold it in for watching a movie while we fell asleep. In the night, I could hear the wind pick up, and even felt the house shudder a few times. But inside, we were fine. I was awake well before the winter sun was. Already I could tell that the storm hadn't stopped or showed yet. We could be out of here after noon if we were lucky, but it was more likely that we'd be stuck another day. I cursed to myself. We still had enough cans to feed us for a while, but the food was mostly bland generic ingredients. Kate preferred having exotic ingredients to cook with. In spring, she would grow her little garden and cook us delightfully intricate meals dressed with strange spices that I picked up for her in town. They weren't always good, but most of what she cooked was delicious, especially if she knew the recipe well. More often than not, I found myself coming back for seconds. I waited in the kitchen until I could notice light outside. The cloud cover blocked most of it, but before long, there was a definite increase in visibility just beyond the window. Kate was a light sleeper. She would be awake sooner or later. I watched the snow whip by the window and freeze the glass wherever it could. The wind whistled a mournful song as the sun rose and began to heat the air ever so slightly. Steps on the staircase alerted me to Kate's presence. She crawled into the kitchen and rubbed her eyes before sitting down next to me, eyes facing the window. Sorry, she said. Sorry for what? Making you turn the car around? We should have left. I will be fine. What's one more day, hmm? Just don't lose your ring again, you goof. 
The wind made the house shudder. You'd better call Cynthia before the phone line goes out. I reminded Kate. Tell her that we'll be a day late. She agreed and made her way to the phone. The day moved slowly by. We made do and watched more movies on tape and took advantage of the power we still had. When the light outside began dimming once again, we noticed that the wind outside had slowed considerably. We would go to bed early and leave first thing in the morning. We should have had enough time to get out before a, another bombardment came. The night came and we went to bed early, holding each other under the comforter to keep warm in the coldest days of the year. Morning came and, to my relief, the sky was mostly clear. The snow had stopped but had added several more inches to the ground cover. Nothing the truck couldn't handle, though. Kate was already awake and making us some food. The electricity had apparently gone out in the night, but all it took was a restart from the fuse box to get things heating up again. In an hour, we had everything in the car, and we were ready to hit the road as the sun snaked its way into the southern sky behind the mountains. I climbed into the driver's seat and hit the ignition. The car shuddered. I hit it again. Nothing. Again. Again. Nothing and nothing happened. Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Shit. I hit the wheel. Start, you stupid piece of... Kate looked uncomfortable. We'll be fine. I'll check the hood. I reassured her. I cursed some more when I got out. I popped the hood and checked everything underneath. It all seemed functional. Something was wrong somewhere else. Maybe the age of the truck was finally catching up to it. I shut the hood and wrapped my arms around me to warm myself up. And that's when I noticed the scrapes on the side of the truck. No, not scrapes, I decided. Scratches. Deep and seemingly deliberate, but I hadn't noticed them before. Three of them parallel to each other, but not inorganically straight, leading underneath the car and increasing with intensity as they moved. I groaned to myself and dropped to my knees, instantly soaking them. Then I pulled my coat over my head and rolled onto my back before dragging myself under the truck. The scratches continued here, much deeper and incredibly destructive. What began as thin lines were now deep gouges across the bottom of the pickup, destroying several vital systems and emptying out the fluid. I couldn't just patch this up. I pulled myself out from underneath and stood up brushing the snow off my clothes as best as I could before knocking on the window and beckoning Kate to come out. What's wrong? Her voice came out soft. Our ride's busting. Some kind of fucking animal got trapped underneath and destroyed it. I tried cooling myself off. I knew Kate hated seeing me angry. What kind of animal would do that? I shook my head and took a few deep breaths. We can still get out of here, but we need to be quick. The neighbors might be willing to give us a ride into town. If worse comes to worse, we can rent a car. We moved inside to warm up, and I headed to the phone book. The neighbors. Home phone of the Griffiths. The line beeped. I tried again. Nothing. Somewhere along the line, their phone went down, but not ours. The universe was really testing what I was willing to stand. I called myself before relaying the news to Kate. I'm going to have to head over there. I told her, slipping my coat on. What? No, it's cold out there. I'll be fine. I'll be back in an hour, no less. At least let me come with you. I shook my head. You're tiny. You'll freeze. Don't worry about me. All right, she said, sitting down. But if you're not back here by 10, I'm sending the cops after you. I smiled. I'm sure you are. The door closed and the smile on my face froze into a scowl. The cold immediately siphoned any remaining heat from the inside away from my exposed skin and into the frigid air. I hugged myself tighter and began the trek to the Griffith's place. 
I followed the road and listened carefully for any stray cars that might drive by. The closest neighbors were in the opposite direction of town, but the road did eventually meet up with a bigger road somewhere down the line. The only problem was that it headed up into the mountains, so whoever would be driving down here was either heading home or decided driving through the unplowed snow in the mountains was a better option than taking the long way around. The cold remained constant throughout my journey. I felt no noticeable difference in temperature even when the sun peaked above the cloud tops and landed on my face. I trudged through the snow for several minutes until my legs were tired and then I kept moving. All the while, not a single car came by. Nobody was going anywhere. Either everyone had already left or weren't planning on it anytime soon. My toes began to feel the cold despite my double layering and thick boots. I knew I would be fine, but the cold still bothered me. I wouldn't be able to get relief for a while now, so the best I could do was ignore it. And to think at this point, we could almost be to Kate's sister's place. My thoughts turned to the truck. Whatever animal had somehow gotten stuck under there must have been quite large to create those marks and to have gotten stuck in the first place. My best guess was a bear. Maybe a bit on the smaller side as far as bears go, but still a bear. It wasn't unheard of for a bear to deface property sometimes. Kate and I had our fair share of bears ripping into our trash bins, but nothing on our car before. Maybe it was looking for shelter underneath, and when it discovered the space was just a bit too cramped, freaked out. Whatever the reason, the animal must have been there pretty early in the night because there weren't any tracks left over in the morning. I trudged on and checked my watch. It had been more than a half hour. I would be there in a few minutes. I crested a hill and saw the roof of the house rise above the treetops surrounding it. I crossed the road and headed down the path, now snowed over and apparently devoid of any car tracks. Good. They should still be there. I moved through the unshoveled snow and under the evergreens until I rounded the bend and the house loomed. It was larger than mine and Kate's. It had to be, naturally. The Griffiths had three kids. Climbing onto the porch, something felt off. The house looked empty. No lights were on. No smoke coming out of the chimney. The windows were iced over, implying an apparent lack of heat inside the home. But the car was still in the driveway, underneath a few inches of snow. I slid to the door and gave it a knock. I waited and hit the doorbell. Frustration began boiling up in me. Why weren't they home? They were always home in the winter. I looked around. They obviously left some time before the storm hit, but how, I didn't know. Maybe someone picked them up. Perhaps they had another car I didn't know about, but they had no garage. I stepped back and weighed my options. I could try walking to town. That would take hours at the speed I was moving. Going anywhere without a car would take hours. I could wait by the road and hope someone came by. No, that wasn't reliable. I was running out of time. Before long, we'd be trapped here for another three days, and I couldn't fathom it. No, we had to get out. The Griffiths had entrusted me with the house key one summer while they were away, but I didn't have it. Damn it, I should have grabbed it. I figured they would understand if I maybe went in to find their car keys. They were always more than helpful, but there was no way I could ask permission first. Just ask for forgiveness. I checked around to see if there was a spare nearby. No dice. So I turned around and begrudgingly began the journey home. I had assumed I'd have a car to ride in on the way home. I wouldn't be back by 10 o'clock. Maybe 10.30 if I was lucky. Hopefully Kate wouldn't get too worried. I hauled my ass back to the cabin and shook the snow off my frozen boots. Kate heard the door close and called to me. You're late. Turns out the neighbors are missing. Kate's face appeared from around the corner. What? Yeah, gone. 
I popped off a boot. But we might be able to drive their car to town if I can get in the house. Another boot fell to the floor. You can't take their car. We need it. They'll forgive us. She crossed her arms. Yeah, but that doesn't mean they should have to. You got any better ideas? I can feel my voice getting louder. Silence for a minute. Fine. Kate said in a low voice. But at least let me go this time. I sat down in front of the fireplace and began warming up my digits. No, it's okay. I'll... I sighed. I'll go. Just give me a minute to warm myself up. Kate sat down next to me and put a hand on my shoulder. I groaned internally at the thought of going back outside. A half hour or so passed and I prepared myself to head back out. I opened the door and to my horror, I saw fat snowflakes falling out of the sky. Damn it. I slammed the door. What? It's snowing again. I kicked off my boots and pulled off my hat. I can't make it over there before another storm hits. I'll have to wait. Kate said nothing. I sat down in the kitchen and sighed, watching with anger as the snow fell quickly and settled neatly on the already thickening snow cover outside. Kate poured me some tea and busied herself in the kitchen, rearranging plates and spices so that everything looked nice. The sky darkened and the wind began picking up while we made ourselves some lunch and tried in vain to find some form of entertainment. The house began shaking and by dinner time a full-on blizzard had made its way into the valley. We ate our bland food and I retired early, hoping that when I awoke the storm would let up but knowing that that wouldn't be the case. The forecast all said the storm season was going to be bad this year. Something about the ocean being a different temperature than it usually was. I let the wind drive me to sleep. I slept in despite my attempts to wake up. The house was noticeably colder and the sky was still dark. Enough forces worked against me that I stayed in bed and under the sheets longer than I should have. Not that there was anything else to do anyway. I climbed out at around 10 and made my way downstairs. The power was out and the floor was cold. I lit a fire and settled in front of it for a bit before looking for something to eat. As I sat and ate my toast, I thought about Kate and my honeymoon. Oh, what I would have given just to be there right then. Sunny Bahamian days and swaying mangroves on the winter at night. Even the nights there were warm. I was willing to bet it was 90 degrees. I abhorred the storm outside. Kate came down later than me and rubbed her arms. It's cold, she said absently. No shit, Sherlock. Power's out. She sat by the fire and I brought her some toast. Gas should still work. We could make coffee the old-fashioned way. But you don't like black coffee. I told her. Yeah, but you do. We stared at the flames for a minute. Gonna need some firewood soon. I remarked. Weren't planning on being out here for so long. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Well, I didn't mean it like... Relax, stress case. I'm kidding. She stood up and headed into the kitchen. In the day, we found some board games and played them while we waited out the blizzard. As the sky grew darker, we lit some candles to light up the area a little bit. We also brought down bedding from upstairs and made ourselves a comfortable little nest in front of the fire. Well, as comfortable as comfortable could be in a place like this. We fell asleep to the sound of crackling embers and wobbling windows. I woke up, cold and groggy. The fire was out. It was still dark. I loaded more logs and got the embers to light. I soon realized that the wind had all but stopped. Looking out the window, I could make out a few stray snowflakes drifting past. 
but they were few and far between. The storms were taking a break. This was my best shot of getting back to the Griffiths. I checked my watch. 3.40 a.m. I climbed out of the nest and wrapped Kate up with the extra blankets before finding my clothes and getting ready to head out. I slipped on my coat and began to tie my boots up. Then the scratching began. Somewhere in the walls there was a scratching between me and the outside. Something was moving around. It didn't scare me, but it did startle me at first. After all, we lived practically in the woods. Rodents were common outside, especially when the temperatures dropped. Scrape, scrape, scrape. No, this wasn't a rodent. Something bigger. A raccoon, maybe. Whatever it was, it was bothering me. I walked to the wall and kicked in. The noises stopped immediately. I swung around and headed for the door, grabbing a flashlight on the way out, and stepped into the snow. The few snowflake stragglers that were left fell lightly and gently, not like they had been before the storm. As I breathed into the frozen night air, any that were unlucky enough to cross my breath melted away or were blown off course. Landing somewhere nearby, I began my journey through the snow. The flashlight guided my steps in the dark. A cone of light illuminated the snow in front of me. As the light swung from side to side, branches on either side of the road came into view briefly. Each was weighed down by a layer of snow and each was frozen in place in the bitter cold. No cars had come through here recently. Walking in the middle of the road, I saw no tracks apart from my own. The snow gently crunched underneath as I marched forward lifting my feet higher than the snow and then stepping back down into it. The snow was almost a foot now. Not a horrible amount, but enough that it caused problems going through it. For one, it took much more effort to walk through it. It was the kind of thick snow that liked to stick together, perfect for making snowballs, and perfect for maximizing misery. I pushed forward. And I realized that it was going to take me much longer to get back to the Griffiths unless I could keep up this speed, which I knew I couldn't. I could already feel my legs being tired from the effort. I grumbled and shivered to myself. Snowflakes fell softly on the ground before I kicked through them. All was silent but the sound of my icy breath on the air and my boots in the snow. An hour later I had made it to the house. It was still dark, and I was still tired, but I finally made it. I stepped up the snow-covered porch and pulled out the frozen keys. The lock clicked, and I stumbled inside, kicking my snow off on the mat. I called out just to make absolutely sure that no one was home, and then got to work finding the car keys. I found them hanging on a hook by the door, and I was about to leave when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. A broken vase lying on the floor. That was odd. Why hadn't they cleaned it up before they left? Maybe it had fallen after they left the house. It wasn't clear to me how this would have happened. Clearly nobody had been here for a while. It was just as cold inside as it was outside. I turned away from the door and moved farther into the house. More things seemed out of place. Objects were strewn about. Chairs tossed over, cabinets open, almost like there had been some kind of struggle or an animal had been wandering the home. A bear, maybe. How could a bear get in here? And could it still be inside? I turned the corner and saw that the back door was open slightly. Any animal could have gotten in and ransacked the home while the Griffiths were out. It upset me to think that they would come home and find their belongings trashed. I moved to the door and shut it, but it was already too cold in there to make a difference. I moved the flashlight around the room and scanned the damage. Yes, lots of damage it seemed, but it also seemed like some of the mess was caused by habitation. Things were strewn around, yeah, but not everything was out of place. Certain objects seemed to be sitting around as if they hadn't been picked up and put back before the Griffiths left. Now, why would they do that? 
Plates were still on the table, too, as if the family had been interrupted during family, and food was still on the table. Butterflies began to fly in my stomach. Why would they leave the food out? And if they had, wouldn't the animals have eaten it? I looked closer. Some small bread loaves, butter, pasta, salad, half eaten and frozen to the plates. How long had this been here? It was cold, sure, and that would extend how long it could stay fresh, but the power had only been out for a few days. At most, this food had been sitting out for a few days before that. The Griffiths were here only a day or two before I had come looking for them. So why? I moved around the house more, looking for more details. The more I looked, the more I found. One item after another found its way into the flashlight's beam. Things were on the ground that shouldn't have been. A knife was missing from its place in the rack. I followed the mess to the staircase and my flashlight caught a glimpse of something that made me stop in my tracks. Blood. Dark red and stained into the carpet on the staircase leading up. Lots and lots of blood. More than a person should lose. It moved up the steps growing wider and wider. My heart beat in my chest. My breath was caught in my throat before I could reach out. More blood, following the staircase up. I stepped slowly up each level following the trail, past the staircase growing even more wide and all-encompassing. Smear marks began, like someone had been dragging themselves along. The beam hit something. A shoe. No. A foot. Attached to a leg, frozen and stiff. Attached to a body. Attached to a... Oh, God. Joel Griffith. Who always seemed so cheery and helpful to strangers. Who I saw at church every Sunday. Who house sat for us every winter. Was dead at my feet in a pool of his own frozen blood. I puked and stumbled backwards. My flashlight transfixed on the mess of flesh in front of me. He was on his stomach, reaching forward as if crawling towards something. Or... away from it. His leg had been slashed horribly on the back, where I assume most of the blood had been coming from. An artery had been cut open and he bled to death. His eyes were still open, frozen and dull, and his torso... What used to be his stomach was spilling out onto the floor, dug out from the side. I sprinted down the staircase four at a time, slipping at the bottom. The images flashed in my mind. I hit the door and tore it open, leaving it as I ran to the car. I fumbled for the keys and slotted them in, my hands shaking uncontrollably. The car clicked and I jumped in and hit the ignition without waiting for it to warm up first. The wheel slid on the ice and it lurched backwards, nearly hitting a tree on the way out. The car spun into the main road and I hit the gas heading for Kane. The windshield was iced over and I could hardly make out what was in front of me. I hit the de-icer. I tried to steady my breathing. Whoever had done that clearly had been gone for a while. I was safe, unless... Oh god. Unless they were in the back seat, I swung around and checked for passengers. I was fine. I was being paranoid. But where could they be? Why hadn't anyone called the police? The other family members must be dead as well. I never looked to check on them. So then the killer was long gone. That was enough time to get out of the valley. Or find a new victim. I pushed the pedal more and raced for home, trying my best to make out the road in front of me. Kate. Kate was there by herself. The windshield began to melt, giving me a view of the snow ahead. The high beams illuminated the world in front of me for a brief moment before the trees were swept away. Behind me, snow was jettisoned into the air. Had to get home. Had to get home. I ignored what logic told me about driving in the snow. 
Nobody else was on the road. I could afford to break a few laws to make sure my wife was safe. Almost there. Just another minute, and then I could be there. Then we'd be out of here and we'd alert the police. Kate and I would be fine. We'd be... Something appeared in the headlights directly in front of the car. Instinct made me swerve, but I was going too fast. The car slipped and went into a spin. I tried desperately to regain control of the vehicle while I was pressed to the window, but it was no use. I ran into the woods and the car shook violently up and down and began knocking me around. My head hit the wheel and everything went dark. Somewhere in the far off recesses of my mind. Something horrible was crawling out of the darkness. My head rolled forward and pressed up against the airbag. Slowly, my eyelids broke open and blinked to life. I saw light. It was light outside. As my eyes adjusted, I realized how cold it was. My fingers and toes were numb. How long was I out? A few hours at least. I tried opening the door to find that it was stuck. I crawled over to the passenger side and the door clicked open. I rolled out and used the car to balance myself as I stood up. Snow was falling. The branches above me were scraping against each other as they moved in the breeze. I shivered. Where was I? Images from the night before flashed under my eyelids. Driving in the snow. Driving from... The neighbors. I crashed their car. Not that it was their number one problem at the moment. Being dead and all. I trudged through the snow as best I could. I was weak, but I felt the only pain was in my head. It ached whenever my heart beat, and the light made it hurt more, but all things considered, I was lucky. Very lucky. I looked over at the car. Cracked windshield, pinned up against a tree. It looked like the several bushes that it crashed through managed to slow it down enough before it ran headfirst into a log. Extremely lucky. I trudged farther. Following the car's path of destruction through the woods 50 feet back led out of the road. I could still see the tracks from last night, but they were disappearing fast. And so would I if I stayed out here. I needed to go. My head throbbed and I nearly hurled. Which direction? I collapsed at the side of the road. The tracks led this direction, so I had to go that way. I shook to my feet and took another step before stumbling forward. Something wasn't right. I was too weak. I needed... I needed... An angelic song sounded somewhere. In my hand, distant and beautiful. Where? Oh God, I was dying. The song changed. It became more real. Words began forming. It wasn't a song after all. Someone, someone was here. I opened my eyes and saw a blur on the white snow moving towards me. It was yelling at me. No, calling at me. For me. It grew closer and now I could hear it running through the snow. I knew that voice. The clouds in my head disappeared as the figure came into view. Oh god. Oh my god, Milo. Kate dropped down to my side. Her eyebrows were all crinkled together. What happened to you? Are you alright? Answer me. I rubbed my throbbing hen. Slower, princess. My brain feels like a train wreck. She checked me out. Oh god, you hit your hen. What did you do? Come on, can you walk? I... I think so. Just help me up. Kate steadied me on her shoulder and took me towards home. The wind made me shake. My teeth chattered. Light reflecting off the snow made me wince. The door creaked open and Kate brought me in front of the fire and drew the curtains so that it was dark. She brought me some water and before long I was asleep again. 
I woke up that evening with a less than painless headache, but I was functional at least. I could make sense of where I was and how I'd gotten there. Slowly the pieces of the puzzle fell back into place in my mind while the storm outside raged on. Kate came into view and sat down with a plate of mashed potatoes and beans. You should eat. I tried to sit up and eat the food. How do you feel? She said tenderly. Like a million bucks. I gritted my teeth. You feel like telling me what you were doing out there? I thought about it for a minute while I downed some water. I was getting the car from the Griffiths. What? When did you leave? How long were you out there? I rubbed my eyes. It was early. Really early. Four, I think. I woke up and it was calm outside. So you just left? Without saying anything or leaving a note? Yeah, I know it was stupid. I'm sorry. I just didn't want to stay here for any longer. I... Well, it looks like we'll be stuck anyway. Milo, you really scared me. I had no idea where you were when I woke up. Do you know what you did to me? I said nothing. How'd you hit your head like that? Crashed the car. I said shamefully. You what? Oh, quieter, please. How could you do that? We can't afford to fix someone else's car. They're going to kill us. She sounded more stressed than angry. She wasn't an angry person. I don't think they will, honey. What makes you so sure then? I rubbed my forehead. Because they're done. The fire crackled in the absence of our voices. Jane's expression turned from stress to disbelief. What? Yeah. Found Joel on the ground. Bled to death, I think. Kate covered her mouth with her hand. I think... I think it was a murder, Kate. Came in and killed the family. That's why I was driving out here so fast. I was afraid they might be here. Kate said nothing. Suddenly, I didn't feel like eating. We'll be fine, Milo. At least for now. Nobody would be out in that storm. I turned my head to look out the window and instantly regretted it. I ground my teeth and held my head. Whoa, whoa, relax there. Don't move around so much. You have a concussion. She helped me lie back down. Get some sleep. Try to anyway. There's not much you can do to protect me if you can't get over this. Yeah, I... Okay. I'll try to sleep. Kate took the plate away from me and kissed my forehead before heading into the kitchen. That night, I dreamt I was back in the car driving. The speedometer told me I was doing a hundred, maybe more, and still speeding up. I was late. I needed to be somewhere. It wasn't home, but it wasn't out of the valley, away from the storms. It was somewhere else entirely. Somewhere I didn't want to think about, but I knew I had to go. The snow whipped around the windshield and impeded my view of the road, but I didn't care. I had to go. Faster. I needed to go faster. The headlights caught a glimpse of something standing in the road and it hit the car. Blood erupted on the windshield. The car skidded to a halt and I jumped out, following the tracks of blood in the dark. The snow was stained red and the tires had dragged it along, smearing guts along the road. The trail ended in a mass of writhing flesh and bones and hair, twitching in some parts. I scanned the corpse. It was the remains of Joel Griffith, torn to pieces by my own hand. His eye had a tear in it and his teeth were scattered among the red snow. A trail of intestines had been dragged for a few feet by the car being buried somewhere off. From what was left of his head, jawless and gaping, I heard him groan in unimaginable pain begging me to kill him. But I couldn't do it. 
I backed away slowly at first, then turned to run. A howling screech followed me, but it wasn't Joel. It wasn't human. I woke up the next morning to the sound of wind shaking the house. I checked my watch only to realize it was broken. It must have gotten banged up. In fact, my whole body was starting to ache very dully. I must have gotten all banged up. A quick inspection confirmed that I was covered with bruises. I spent the day being cared for by Kate. The storm didn't let up, and it didn't let up the next day either. We couldn't stay here much longer. We hadn't prepared for staying, and now that there was no way into town, I tried not to think about it. We'd find a way. We had food for another two weeks at least, if we could ration it, but we wouldn't need to. We'd leave as soon as the storms let up. I groaned. Well, at least when I could move again. That night, Kate and I were lying by the fire wrapped in blankets and waiting to fall asleep. The rest of the house was cold, especially the upstairs where our bedroom was, but by the fire it was warm enough, and the kitchen was bearable for a while. The house could retain some heat. Kate? My son. Hmm. I didn't tell you why I crashed the car the other day. Sure you did. You were scared and driving too fast. Yes, but I swerved off the road. The road is icy. I saw something. Kate didn't say anything. I stared into the flames. There was something in the road standing there. I saw it and swerved to avoid it, but... You lost control, Milo. You know you aren't supposed to drive like that in snow. How fast were you going? I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. Fast. You're lucky to be alive. I know. You can't do stuff like this. Especially in winter. Especially in a place like this where there's deer and stuff. It wasn't a deer. Well, whatever it was. I don't know what it was. I assure you it was something. An animal, Milo. Like the one that was trapped under the truck. Like the one that was inside the Griffith's house, I thought. Regardless of what it was, or how stupid you were being, I'm glad you're alive. Yeah, me too. The fire curled in on itself and flicked bits of heat my way. Outside, the storm raged. The next day, the wind had died down a bit, but it was still too bad to leave the house. My headache was getting better, but it still pained me to move around. Kate made sure I drank enough water while she busied herself around the house, adjusting things and rearranging items so that it all looked presentable. She did it to keep her mind busy. I knew, but there was no one to impress with it. It was mindless work while we bided our time. The sky grew dark, and the sun went down once again. Some place above the clouds and the blizzard. Somewhere out there, out in the snow, was a killer. I knew it. The day after brought with it clear skies and calm weather, with the occasional gusts. I was feeling good. Enough to move around by myself, but I still couldn't go outside, and I tried to keep the moving to a minimum. But unfortunately, there was a problem. We would be out of firewood by the night. We had a lot of it stored up, but in the end, wood burned fast. Very fast. Without a reliable source of wood, we'd freeze. In my current state, I couldn't go out there to find any, so Kate had to do it. I hated the thought of her going outside alone, especially with the killer out there, but we had no choice. Kate left me alone in the house while I nervously waited for her return. She had an axe with her. She would be fine. Besides, the Griffiths were killed inside. If this person were to strike, they'd do so in our house. But on the other hand... There was nothing stopping them if Kate had a chance encounter. 
No, I was being paranoid. That's all. I was overthinking it. Maybe the family was targeted for some reason. Or maybe Beatrice, Joel's wife, had done it. Although I couldn't think of a good reason why. It would explain how he was attacked at home and why I didn't see her body. But then again, it's not like I was looking for her. She was probably dead in the next room over with her kids. Oh god. Her kids. They had to see that before they died. Had to witness their father bleed out as he tried desperately to crawl away. If that happened to Kate... No, I wouldn't think about it. I couldn't. It wouldn't do me any good. She was fine. Maybe I'd just watch for her to be sure. I moved slowly over to the window and peeked my head behind the curtain. The light made me wince, but I squinted my eyes and endured it. No sign of Kate, but I could see her footsteps heading to the hill and into the woods. I needed a better vantage point. Moving from my spot, I decided I would be able to see farther from upstairs, so I grabbed a blanket and climbed the steps. It was much colder out here, but for the moment, I didn't care. I looked out the window and saw the footsteps continuing off past the tree line. I couldn't make out anything else, but looking into the trees, every once in a while I could see something move under the bare branches. So she was fine. It was fine. I pulled back from the window and rubbed my eyes. I couldn't do that anymore. As I did, something caught my attention. A small noise, like the sound of a cabinet closing or something small falling off a shelf. That was odd and also not good, but I imagined it. Rustling. I did not imagine it. I started towards the stairs, slowly and carefully, ignoring the pounding in my head. Was something down there? I had nothing to defend myself with. I refused to let the thought into my head that I would be attacked, but it came anyway. Kate would come home to see my corpse. I took short, silent steps down the staircase. The noises persisted in the kitchen, rustling... Clacking. Scraping. What was causing that? I made it to the bottom of the steps and moved towards the kitchen. The noises persisted. The floorboard creaked under my foot. They stopped. I stepped forward. They continued. I peeked around the corner. It was Kate. Kate? What are you doing in the kitchen? Making you food, genius. What are you doing out of bed? I... Uh, lay down, honey. You'll get all nauseous. I swear I just saw you outside in the woods. What are you doing peeking around outside? Stay away from the light. She pushed me to the sleeping nest in front of the fire. Lay down. I'll bring you something. I sat down and stared into the fire, warming myself back up. What did I see outside? Nothing. I saw nothing. The concussion wasn't doing me any favors. Kate was right. I needed sleep. Sleep fixed all problems. Well, except for getting out of here, but maybe some sleep would give me some ideas. Kate brought me a sandwich and some more water. Can't I have coffee or something? My head is killing me. Caffeine will make it worse, you goof. Water is best. She was right. I'm going back out. Stay in bed this time, won't you? I'll try. Hey, Kate? Honey? Yeah? She squatted down next to me. Just be safe, okay? If it gets too windy, come back. And don't overwork yourself. Carry the logs one at a time and... Shh. I'll be fine. I'm not incompetent. I've done this before. I know, I know. It's just... After... You know? Yes, I know. 
She stood up and headed for the door. I'll be back. And then she was gone. I fell asleep soon afterward in a state of low anxiety. We couldn't leave, but it might be dangerous to stay here. It was torture for me. Now there were two driving factors to get out of the valley, but no physical way of doing it. I feared we may be forced to stay the winter. The only problem with that was that we were low on cans. When I woke up next, it was dark. Kate was asleep next to me and the wind was picking up outside. Another storm. The fire was getting low. I moved to replenish the flame. Distantly, out in the wind, I swore I heard a howl. Coyotes? That was odd. Usually coyotes stayed silent in the winter. I listened closer. I heard the sound again, but it was different than a coyote. More drawn out. Perhaps wolves were in the area. They'd been reported just north of here last winter. It wasn't inconceivable that they might move south. The thought of wolves moving back into the area made me a little happy. I wasn't too much of a nature person, but I knew Kate loved wolves. And I knew that they were good for the ecosystem. There were too many deer here. And as a plus, they might push out the coyotes as well. God knows those things were a menace. I pressed my ear up against the frozen window. I'd never heard a wolf howl in person before. I wondered why they might be out in a storm like this. Didn't make much sense to me, but they were perfectly adapted to their environment. I'd seen my fair share of nature documentaries with Kane. The howl sounded. I immediately backed away from the window. That wasn't a wolf. That wasn't anything I'd ever heard before. My chest tightened as I stared into the dark. It came from downwind and seemed closer than I had anticipated to be heard over the roar of the wind like that. It had to be much closer than I anticipated. I stepped to the window, my eyes fixed on the black outside. From the light of the fire, I could see snowflakes flying past the window, and I could barely make out the close tree line. I stared into it, hoping I wouldn't see anything. It was inky darkness broken by lines of even blacker areas. The snow obscured my vision, but I could make out. It moved. The shadow moved out in the trees and screeched its ungodly howl. I stumbled backwards and watched as it disappeared. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. I heard nothing else until the sun rose. Kate woke up soon after. Even then, I said nothing to her about it. I wasn't even sure what I'd tell her. Logic told me I had nothing to worry about, but I tried to focus on getting rest. It was all I could do. The sooner I got better, the sooner we could devise a plan to get out of here. I was already making a fast recovery. Just a few more days, I could be moving around outside again. The day passed without incident. Most days did. I heard the animal in the wall again in the same spot, but all it took was a good kick to spook it. I wondered how many little creatures were hibernating in our walls, moving around only at night. It was mildly comforting to think that these innocent little rodents were trying to weather the storms with us, just beyond a thin layer of wood. Nothing unusual happened for another four days. Another storm had gone, but another was just beginning. I was feeling much better, and my head only hurt half the time. Soon Kate and I were planning our escape in the kitchen. We didn't have many ideas, but they all seemed to entail getting into town somehow, which would be hard to say the least. Every day we spent here, the snow was just building up outside. Already it was more than two feet. It was getting hard to open the door, but all hope wasn't lost. Every once in a while, there would be larger breaks between storms. The only problem was that there was no way of telling when that would be. And since the power was out, we couldn't just check the weather. 
There might also be the small chance that a particularly brave individual might drive by, or a snowplow for some reason, but the chances were less than slim, but not off the table. All in all, we were running out of time. We needed to find a way out, or else we'd be here till spring. Later in the season, the storms did die down, but at that point we'd be snowed in. Our window was shrinking. We decided to talk about it some more the next day. We had a while until another break came by, and so we had time to plan. That night, I awoke to the sound of thumping on the house. I immediately assumed it was the wind and closed my eyes again, but the thumping continued. Thump, thump, thump. Loud enough that I could hear it over the blizzard, but almost regular. Too regular. Even knocks with even time between them. Knocking. Knocking from somewhere in the other room. My eyes shot open. It was clearly distinct from the wind. Something organic was hitting the house. I climbed out of bed and stepped over Kate, headed towards the sound. It got louder as I moved. Thunk, thunk, thunk. It was booming and deliberate. I stood in the entry hall staring at the door. Someone was there. Knocking. Knocking. Who would be there in this weather? Several emotions ran through me. Hope. We might get out of here. Fear. It might be the killer. But it was mostly dread. For some reason I felt like whatever was on the other side of that door was not going to bring good news. The knocking continued loud and urgent. They wanted inside bad. I stepped forward and grabbed the lock. It unlatched and the door swung open before I could twist the handle. Snow whirled in and a group of people stumbled inside before me, shivering. Standing in front of me was the remainders of the Griffith family. All of us sat in front of the fire. Kate had made the group some hot tea to warm them up while they sat shaking. Most of them looked like they might have mild hypothermia, but now that they were inside, they should have been fine. There were six people in total. Beatrice, her children Sarah and Elizabeth, and a man and woman whom I learned were married and from another house near the Griffiths that I had not met. Their names were David and Grace Kim. They had with them their 19-year-old daughter, Aya. The story began after they had warmed up enough to talk properly. David began talking first. Beatrice appeared at their doorstep near midnight with all of her children, although the boy, Charlie, was bleeding badly and in need of serious medical attention. They had fled their own home after Joel tried to protect them, but he was killed and the four jumped from the window. In the ensuing chaos, Charlie had been cut horribly along his arm. The Kim couple had only been living in their house for a few months when the Griffiths appeared on their doorstep. In an attempt to take Charlie to the hospital, they soon discovered that their car, like ours, had been sabotaged and rendered unusable. They were stuck and with nowhere to go. The boy bled out and... died. The rest of the family spent the next week or so with the Kims, but it soon became apparent that they were being stalked. The group gathered as much food as they could and headed out towards our house the first chance they got. Determining through democracy that it was the best course of action and the next step in the process of getting into town. They had left earlier that day but were caught in the storm after they were slowed by a falling tree that pinned Grace. They finally made it to our cabin just after 1.30 in the morning. The six of them sat by the fire while Kate and I spoke to each other in a low voice. Whatever I had been fearing before was much worse. Whoever was out there was in fact thirsty for more blood, and they absolutely knew where we lived, judging by the sabotage on the truck. The survivors had brought with them cans of food, but it only prolonged the inevitable. With so many people, we could only keep everyone fed for a week and a half. We had to leave at our first availability. 
whenever that would be. Our own problems soon became trivial. This wasn't about getting to spend the winter away from snow. This was about living long enough to do so. The night raged on and people seemed to be falling asleep on and off. I stayed up and watched whatever there was out the window. Nobody really wanted to think about the extremity of the situation, but everyone was. Even the poor little Griffith girls, who I guessed were seven and eight. Whereabouts? The anxious silence filled the room and made the air feel stuffy. People were scattered around, laying on the couch or on the floor trying to heat themselves by the fireplace. It was a depressing scene, especially having seen what had happened to poor Joel Griffith. The tree line was barely visible in the dark, but I stared at it regardless. I shuddered, but not from the cold. In all, there were eight of us. A sizable party, but three were children, and more than that were injured or had mild hypothermia. Waiting for nothing to happen there wasn't much to do but observe. Beatrice was a white woman who was a little heavy for her size, but not unreasonably so. She had a round face and dark brown hair. Her daughters matched her in appearance. David was an Asian man of average build with black hair, but graying from age. I guess he was originally from Korea, but he had no accent, so it was likely he was born in North America, especially because he was living in a place like this. His wife Grace was white with blonde hair and had a slight accent, possibly European. His daughter looked more like her than she did him. She might have had a different biological father. Kate was a shining star among them. She was small, barely reaching five foot, and had light red hair that was cropped just above her shoulders. She had a skinny face with a small nose and mouth, but large green eyes. Even sleeping, she looked at peace, although I knew she was just as scared as I was although I was scared mostly for her. Looking at myself in the reflection of the window, I saw my own dark eyes staring back at me. I had a square jaw and rough build, but those were about my only defining characteristics. Short brown hair and small ears, maybe. I always considered myself lucky to have ended up with someone that looked as good as Kate did. She was my shining star. If anything happened to her out here... Sometime in the night, I turned to look at Beatrice, who was still awake, but staring hopelessly into the fire. I stood up and silently walked over to her. Can we talk? I said quietly. The fire popped. Okay. She lifted herself from the armchair and walked with me over to the kitchen, where we sat down across from each other at the table. I know it might be hard talking about... My son, but what do you remember about what killed your husband? Beatrice closed her eyes for a minute before opening them and looking at me. It was... He was wearing... Uh... Dark clothes? I don't know. I didn't get a good look. She broke eye contact. Beatrice? I need you to be honest with me. I said in a low whisper. You can tell me. What? what do you mean? I mean, I saw something out there. What is it? Her lip quivered and I saw tears form in her eyes. I don't know. Her whisper came harsh and shaky. I don't know what it is. I'm the only one that saw it. It was horrible. What does it want with us? I leaned back in my chair. My worst fears were confirmed. This wasn't a person doing this. It was an animal. Something inhuman and unlike anything ever seen here before. Maybe never seen anywhere. Whatever it was, I knew it wasn't just some dumb creature. It was smart. And it knew how to stay hidden. How did it get in? A tear landed on the table. Joel, he, um... I heard a noise outside, went to check it out and left the door open. 
And then he came running back and was chasing him. Oh God, it was chasing after him. She bit her nails and her teeth clattered. And I could tell in her eyes she was reliving the experience. But it didn't get in on its own. Beatrice shook her head and still staring off into space. I sighed, a little relieved. It might not be able to get in so long as we make sure it didn't. Thank you for being honest with me. I'm very sorry this happened to you. If you need anything, don't be afraid to ask. She nodded and walked back over to the fire where she sobbed quietly to herself. I moved to the window once more and stared out. I knew it was out there. It always had been. Just beyond sight. What did it want? What kind of creature could do something like this? Would do something like this? It wasn't feeding. At least that wasn't the entire reason it was killing. Otherwise, Joel's body would have been consumed more. No, it was doing this for some other reason. And it wouldn't stop until we were all dead. I squinted into the dark for the longest time and swore I could see something. Just beyond the tree line. In the night, I heard the wind howl and the trees outside violently shake together. It was dark. It was always dark, but we had all gotten used to it by then. Since the group of survivors had stumbled to our door, the situation only got worse. In only a week, the storms had gotten twice as bad. Now they averaged five days in length and I could barely tell what time it was outside. On top of that, the length in between storms had gotten shorter. Much shorter. We missed our opportunity and now it seemed the worst had come. We may be forced to stay here the whole winter on little more than a few cans of vegetables. It was an impossible task. We were rationing our food, and it seemed the effects of hunger were constant. It was livable, but for how much longer? How much longer could we stay? Each day was longer than the last. Most days we sat by the fire and tried to entertain ourselves in vain. Some people played board games. Others found books to read. Still, others talked in a low voice while they looked longingly out the window, hoping they wouldn't see anything waiting in the storm. But I could tell it was still out there. In the night, the screams of the monster blended with the wind. Everybody except me and Beatrice believed our stalker was from the realm of man. If only they knew. The firewood was running low, but with all these new hands, we had gathered enough to weather another storm before it hit. Our main problem remained food, and whatever was out there. I sat in the kitchen despite it being colder there. We had filled the bathtub with hot water to heat that room up, so one or two people had relocated there temporarily. But in the kitchen, I had enough distance to feel like I wasn't losing my mind half as much. Stuck within a group of survivors, and I had a clear view into the storm outside. Well, as clear as clear could be. Kate joined me for a while, and we spoke about what we could do to get out of there, with no success, and then talked about anything else. One morning, I began to notice that the wind was dying down. I called a meeting in front of the fire, and we began bouncing ideas off one another for the millionth time. We need to move quickly, David said. There's no telling how long we have. Could just be a few hours, maybe less. So what then? I said. Eight people is a lot. So we send a few, only a few, get help from the town. Beatrice saw this as a horrible idea. We can't just send two people out into a storm and hope for the best. What if they get into trouble? Don't you remember what happened when we made the journey up here? That happened because there were six of us, Beatrice. David told her. Less people means more speed. And time isn't on our side. Being out there alone isn't just dangerous because of the storms. Everyone looked at me as I spoke. Don't forget we're being stalked. You can't defend yourself from an attack out there. Not adequately, at least. What could one person do against two of us? 
David poked me. I looked at Beatrice. I saw what happened to Joel. Trust me. You don't want to get caught out there. David was heating up. So what? We just die here? Starve like peasants? I agree with Dave. Grace, son. We need to send people out there. The risk is worth it. I still don't like the idea. Beatrice grumbled. Then they bring protection. Grace suggested. What do you two have here? Kate and I looked at each other. She was sitting close to me. Nothing. I told them. No guns? Milo doesn't hunt. Kate defended me. We have knives. Kitchen knives. That's all we can offer. If I may, Beatrice cut in. Joel has... had a rifle. He told me to get it before he... when he was... It's still at the house. We can get it. That's too far, I told her. It'll waste too much time. There's a house sort of between here and the town, Kate said then. It takes less time to get there, but more time to get into town overall if you go that way. The neighbors might have something you could protect yourself with, or a working car. Or they could be gone, someone said. Or they could be dead, someone else jabbed. The bickering flew over my head while I looked down at the ground. Something didn't seem right. I stood up and walked over to the window. Snowflakes whipped past at lightning speeds. Trees bent and broke their branches just beyond that. And just beyond that was something. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was there. I could tell that something was looking at me from beyond the darkness. If we didn't move soon, we'd all be done. Kate came up next to me and asked what was wrong. I turned around and addressed the group. Two people should leave. The group stopped talking and looked at me. That way they aren't caught alone and they can move quickly. Head towards the house. It's the only shot we have. David's right. If we all stay here, we die. And if we all leave, we're as good as dead. Who leaves then? Beatrice wondered. Milo and I, David's son, we're the two men. We should go. I choked out a word. No. No? No, I can't go. Someone needs to protect this place. Someone needs to watch over everyone here. Half of you are either too weak or too sick to protect yourselves adequately. I need to stay here. I looked at Kate. I couldn't let whatever it was get to her. Then who's supposed to go with me? David started getting snarky. You're the one who's up to the challenge. I can do it. The group turned to Aya, who was sitting across the room with the Griffith girls, watching them. You're not going, Aya, Grace said sternly. I can do it. I was in Girl Scouts. I took some martial arts, Mom. I know how to survive out there. And I'm young. I can move fast. I said nothing but looked at David. It was his daughter. No, sit down. Grace said once again. Aya did nothing. She can do it, Grace. She's smart. David seemed sure. She's probably a better candidate than I am. I know she'll be fine. What about the killer, huh? She barked. He's out there. Waiting. He won't be, I said. They're out there right now watching the house. I saw many panicked eyes look to the window. You can't see, but they're out there. They have been for several days. Now the storm won't have calmed down enough to leave until tonight, so you can leave by the cover of darkness. How can you be so sure? Grace said. I don't see anyone out there. How can they be out there exposed? David seemed to almost snarl. 
trust me, I said. I've been watching for a while. He'll see us, David said. He'll follow us. No, they won't. I'll head outside myself. Distract them. That'll give you time to leave. Besides, we need more firewood anyway. Kill two birds with one stone, right? Nobody said anything. I clapped my hands together. Then it's settled. You leave tonight. You can take some of Kate's and mine clothes to warm you up. If you need it, and take some food with you in case you get stuck someplace. I can keep it distracted until you leave. Grace gave me a dirty look, which I assume meant she was bitter about me giving the okay for her daughter to leave. But it was our best chance. I believe that Aya was a better candidate than me. I couldn't walk in snow. I hated it. And we needed somebody here to watch the house. It was my house, after all. And it was my Kate that was here inside. I moved to the window and looked out. Kate came up next to me. She didn't say anything, but I could tell what she was thinking. She was mostly scared, but I could tell that she was happy I stayed instead of going. I was too. Outside, I swore I saw something move. When the time came and the wind had lowered to an acceptable speed, Aya and her father were dressed to head outside. We'll head to the house on the way. David said, slipping on his jacket. But there's no guarantee anyone will be there. Break in if you have to, I told him. You probably won't have enough time to make it to town. It wouldn't surprise me if the storm caught you on the way to the house. But any shelter is better than no shelter. And there may be food there. Water, too. And heat. You can wait out the storm if you have to. David nodded. Good luck. You too. He slipped out the door with his daughter and I turned to head out the back. I grabbed the hatchet and slid open the door. Kate grabbed my arm. I'm coming with you. No, you're not. Let me go. You're letting the cold in. Yes, I am. I'm not letting you go out there by yourself. She was stubborn. Too stubborn for her own good. Fine, but stay close. The door closed behind us and locked. Now we were exposed. The sun had just dipped below the horizon. I could tell despite the cloud cover. It was dark enough to let the Kim sneak away, but light enough that I could still see a bit. The wind was still moving through the trees, but mostly in short bursts and without incredible power. Kate clung close to me and looked around. How do you know he's out here? She said to me as we walked. I can tell. If they were following the Griffiths, they would have naturally come here. And us moving outside is the perfect target. That's why I didn't want you to come. Well, why can't the others come out here with us? We can't protect everyone. Besides, we don't need as much firewood this time. We got a lot already. Kate looked around as we moved through the trees. In the snow, the forest really did seem barren. It was deep snow, and finding logs under it wasn't easy. But the storm had blown down enough trees to keep the search easy enough. The trick was not getting caught, but we also needed to make ourselves seen. It was a tricky balance. I hit a tree with the back of the hatchet to make noise and attract the creature. Wind whipped snow into my face and made me curse reflexively. Kate helped me brush it off. We moved further out and found a fallen log half buried in the snow. It was still wet, but nothing a little drying by the fire couldn't do. I started hacking at it while Kate stood watch. After a few minutes, she tapped my shoulder. I looked up. Do you see that? She said. She didn't seem too concerned. What is that thing out there? A deer? I looked in the direction she was looking, but I didn't see anything. What? What does it look like? Like, like, I don't know. It's half covered by the tree. I gritted my teeth. 
I hope to God it wouldn't get any closer. There. Oh, it's gone. Keep an eye out for any movement, okay? Got it, Captain. I hacked away and soon we had a pretty hefty pile of lumber wood. Haphazardly chipped away, but still usable in a fire. Kate carried some and I grabbed the rest. We started on our way back to the cabin. I nervously checked over my shoulder every few steps. I could tell we were being watched. We made it to the glass door and it unlocked as Beatrice let us in. We dropped the firewood off and went out for more. When it had gotten too dark to see at all, we had collected enough wood and headed back. I felt relieved to be in the warmth once again, and for Kate and I to be out of harm's way, I was also fairly certain we had succeeded in distracting the creature. We all settled down for another long storm. By the time we would awake, it was likely the wind would have picked up again. All we could do now was wait and hope, but we couldn't wait for too long. We only had so much food left. I guessed a week's worth. Maybe less. It wasn't good. Not good in the slightest. Wind shook the house. Snow froze the windows. It was always the same. Every day was always the same. It had been for weeks. Every day we tried to find something else to ease our minds and to stop the madness of boredom and anxiety, and every day we had less to ease that pain. Kate liked to read, so we had plenty of books, thank God. We had a few board games too, but even those began feeling dry and more like a waste of time as the six of us waited anxiously for something, anything to happen. Without power, life becomes dull. Life without entertainment becomes unbearable. In life like this, being stalked from just beyond the tree line was hell. I'd often find myself staring out the window hoping I wouldn't catch a glimpse of anything, and at the same time wishing I would, but I could rarely ever. It was always dark now, midnight dark, and the blizzard made visibility even worse. I watched the snow pile up outside. It was tall. Too tall for any kind of land vehicle at this point. Maybe just less than four feet deep. All things considered, we were very lucky it wasn't any higher. Opening the door was hard enough without spilling snow inside. Finding firewood was a challenge, but luckily there were plenty of trees that had been knocked down in the storm. And we could collect easily enough. Each day we grew more cramped in our tiny living quarters, but the storm never seemed to let up. Eventually, we began to fear the worst. What if the Kims could never make it in time? What if they had been caught? I tried my best to reassure people, but there was only so much I could pull out of my ass until convincing everyone everything would be fine was impossible. Kate and I grew more and more worrying. We knew that nobody would be able to get us until after the storm, even if the Kims had already made it to civilization. We were in serious trouble. There were only a few snow plows that could make a dent in that, and they were stationed in town. We would have to wait until at least this one storm ceased. More likely, we'd have to wait until the next one passed, and if the Kims hadn't contacted anyone by then, we'd be done. We'd be out of food. It would be nearing impossible to leave at that point. Not without help from helicopters or extreme plowing from vehicles the town didn't have access to. And that wasn't even considering the threat just beyond the walls of the cabin. There was no telling how long it would take before that thing became desperate enough to try and break in. It was obviously smart enough. It had slashed our cars, after all, so why did it stay out there? Maybe it was because of me. All day, every day, for as long as I could without falling asleep, I would keep watch. Sometimes I'd be conspicuous about it. Other times I'd keep my watch from afar to help calm Kate. I couldn't let her know the reality of what was out there. She wouldn't, couldn't take it well. Not well. No, I had to keep that from her. 
There was no sense in scaring her. The thought that we'd still be here for another week was daunting, to say the least. People began wondering if it was the right decision to send David and Aya out there alone. Every day I could feel Grace's eyes on me. The meetings grew more heated and emotional. I couldn't work with so many women. Not when they were upset like this. But they did have a point. Kate was on my side, but she made it clear she believed we should send someone else after them. Of course, I was the obvious choice, but I didn't want to leave Kate behind. The winds began falling and the group unanimously decided I should go. Even I thought it was the best choice. If not to make sure the Kims were alright, then to make sure we had someone who could make it into town. I was plan B. We had no plan C. It had to be me. And I had to succeed. I donned my clothes. Extra clothes. Extra warmth. I packed a few cans. Beatrice would stay here, as would Grace. They'd watch over the girls. And Kate? Well, she wanted to come with me. I didn't like the idea, but I preferred it to leaving her in the cabin where I couldn't protect her. So we left together. We had snowshoes, which helped us quite a lot. Previously, we had only used them in our trips to the mountains. The storms had never been this bad before. Not enough to warrant this kind of extremity. I couldn't help but wonder if the creature and the storms were related, but... Maybe they had brought it. Or maybe it was the other way around. Regardless, both were dangerous. And both could kill us. The wind was still strong, but it had died down enough to at least walk through. We made a cut through the trees, which helped to block some of it. But it was a chore trying to find ways through the branches. The snow was so high that my head scraped the lower branches of even some of the medium-sized trees, and the wind only made them more painful as they slashed around in the dark. We moved on. I kept a watchful eye on Kane, who was still blissfully unaware of the creature. She believed something was out there, yes, but not this. Not something inhuman that could kill us, and would kill for the sheer joy of it. I had never had a good look at it myself, and all we had to protect ourselves was a bat, so there was no telling what this thing could be capable of. The snow was thick and getting thicker. With each step, I grew to loathe the cabin more and more. It wasn't worth it. It never had been. I couldn't handle the snow in the winters, and now this. This whole experience was the cherry on top. But Kate loved it, didn't she? Hopefully this was enough to convince her we needed to ditch the place. And to think we wouldn't even be here if Kate would just learn not to be so forgetful. We walked in relative silence as the storm died down for the next few hours. The snow slowed us down considerably, but the snowshoes helped. I wondered how the Kims before us might have managed without some of their own. The snow had never been this deep before. Usually, the storms just brought with them frigid air and high winds, kicking up the snow already existing on the ground, but this winter, the snowfall never seemed to stop. With each passing day, the ground became further and further. How could the animals survive under all this? Do you remember our trip to the Bahamas? I asked out loud in the cold. Kate nodded, but didn't say anything. Her face was pink. I really didn't want her being out here, but the alternative wasn't too much more appealing. What I would give to be back there. We'll go anywhere once we get out of this, she said to me, holding her arms close to her. It was hard to imagine such a warm place when I could feel the chill of winter in my bones. It was still only December. How was January going to look? I dreaded the thought of staying here throughout January. No more than dread, panic, fear. We wouldn't survive it. We couldn't. No amount of firewood would keep us from starving to death. We had to make it. I sped up as best I could. 
A few more hours passed and the clouds had thinned enough to see that it was daytime. It wouldn't be long now before another monster blizzard rolled in. But we were almost there. Almost there, but then what? Would we have to try to make it the rest of the way? The house came into view. A large one at the end of a long driveway. The yard was large and cleared of most trees, so we could see the house clearly as we crested the hill. Kate and I marched up the driveway, buried by powder, and towards the house's larger porch entrance. The door was locked. Not a good sign. Did the Kims make it? What about the back door? Kate asked. Back door. Of course. We moved around the house towards the back and found the sliding door lock broken. They had made it inside after all. The inside of the house was just as grandiose as the outside. Simple, but large. The tables were clean, the furniture was neat, and there was no sign of any kind of struggle like there had been in the Griffith household. David? I called into the empty husk. Aya? No reply. Kate and I looked at each other. Do you think they left for town? She said. I hope so. We split up and searched the sprawling household. I sent Kate to find food and I managed to find a man cave in the basement that had a couple of hunting rifles. I also found another hatchet. When I made it back upstairs, Kate was stuffing a duffel bag with as many non-perishables she could find. It was such a relief to see so much food. Thank Christ the people who lived here had so much food. We could bring it back to the cabin and survive long enough until help arrived. Now that we knew the Kims had already left for town, it seemed like things were starting to look up. I desperately hoped nothing would sour it. I need to go to the bathroom, I told Kate. I'll be right back. Don't clog the toilet, she joked. Sweet Kate. Always trying to lighten the mood. I found a bathroom on the first floor and went. As I was washing my hands, something demanded my attention. Creaking. Creaking floorboards. Above me. I opened the bathroom door and called out to Kane. She responded from the kitchen. Yeah? It wasn't her. Something was up there. I motioned for her to come to me and she heard the creaking too. Something small, just the smallest of movements in an old house. It couldn't be the Kims, could it? They would have answered our call. The owners of the home? I doubted it. This place was too cold. Nobody had lived here in weeks. So what the hell was it? My mind assumed the worst. I found the bat and moved silently up the spiral staircase, poised to attack. It was all silent. Kate followed me up, looking from behind to see if she could spot the source of the noise. I located the door to the room and above the bathroom. It was closed. Quietly, I reached for the handle while Kate gripped my arm. It swung open with a creak. There was no monster inside. Just a person. A girl. Aya. She was curled at the foot of a bed on the far wall, rocking back and forth. Her eyes emerged from her shirt when she saw us and she screamed. Maybe in fear, or maybe in relief. Kate pushed me out of the way and rushed up to the girl. She was wearing bloody clothes, but she looked physically fine. Aya began to bawl. What happened? She said, holding the teenager. She didn't say anything at first, and then she said... It got him. My blood turned to ice. What got who? Kate pressured. The monster. It k k killed him. She heaved. Kate looked to me with a mixture of fear and worry and sadness. And then back to poor Aya. She didn't say anything, but I knew exactly what she was thinking. I stepped out of the room and buried my face in my hands, wishing I could let out a scream. The distraction hadn't worked. 
whatever this thing was, it was even smarter than I gave it credit for, and even faster than I had ever imagined possible. Somehow this thing was able to get to the Kims and come back to the cabin without me even noticing. I wanted to bash my head against the wall right then and there. What did this mean for us? Nobody was on their way into town, and the food at the cabin was scarce. Kate came out into the hallway with Aya, who was wrapped in blankets and staring at the ground with puffy eyes. They've been here since the last storm, she told me in a low voice. I already knew what she was going to say next. We need to take her back to the cabin. Are you insane? I blurred in. Kate looked taken aback. I cooled myself off before continuing. We need to go into town, I said. It's the only way. The cabin is closer. Aya needs some place warm to rest. She's in no condition to go out into that storm. If we leave now, we can make it. I clenched my jaw and stared at the wall. If we go back, we won't have another chance to get into town. We'll be snowed in. You know this. But now we have food. We can make it. Food? Kate, we need more than food to survive. What about that fucking monster out there? She crossed her arms. What are we supposed to do with Aya then? I sighed and started pacing. I don't know. We can't leave her here. I know we can't leave her here, just... Why don't you go into town? I can take her back. Fuck no. I whipped around to face her. No, I'm not going to let you go out there by yourself. She gave me a look of frustration. Then what? What other ideas do you have? I had none. God damn it. God damn it all. Everything was wrong. All of it. Just when it seemed we couldn't sink any deeper into the filthy snow, it was just piling up. We couldn't stay here. Ao was nearing hypothermia, and that was evidence enough. This house didn't have a fireplace. For Christ's sake. The only options were to leave Aya here and go into town, or to take her back to the cabin and hunker down until spring came, or at least until the storms died down in late January. I hated myself for entertaining the idea of leaving Aya here, but it was my best shot at getting Kate to safety. That was assuming, of course. The prospect of not being hunted and killed by the creature. Besides, Kate would never go for it. Fuck. I said, okay, fine. Let's head back. Quickly. The next storm is coming. We hurried and combed the rest of the house for supplies. There was little of use besides a couple of spare batteries and a flashlight. We also got more blankets. Whatever else we could find in the kitchen and loaded them into anything we could carry. It would slow us down, but we had protection now. Guns. We just needed to outpace the storm. Outside, a breeze had already begun to grow. A wind like this wouldn't normally mean anything, but in December, it meant only one thing. We had to move. I caught sight of a shed on our way out. I went to check it out in case it had anything we could use. The shed was small and dark and cluttered to the brim with tool after redundant tool, but it did have some nails I could use to board up the house with. I also managed to pull loose an old wooden sled from an avalanche of falling debris. An old radio fell out of it. I stopped for a minute to look at it. A two-way radio. My hopes soared. This could be it. This could be our chance to call for help. I checked the bottom. It needed batteries. It was also busted. Maybe I could figure out a way how to fix it. I loaded in my already overstuffed bag and brought the sled out to the girls. We put everything we could onto it and strapped it down before heading out. As we walked, I kept an eye out for the creature. If it had managed to get to David, then it sure as hell could get us. We just had to keep moving. 
but with all of the extra weight and the extra person, we just weren't moving fast enough. Not to mention Aya didn't have snowshoes like us. Eventually, she had to hitch a ride on the sled while I struggled to pull her through the snow. Regardless, we were making okay time. I was sweating half to death and Aya wasn't looking so good. But if we kept up with the speed, we could make it back to the cabin by the time the wind started to get really bad. I grumbled to myself in a muted anger at everything. At myself. Even a little at Kate. It was her idea to come back. It was her sense to bring Aya back to the cabin. It was hard not to be a little bit upset. But I pushed the feelings down and trudged on. Forehead beating up and sweat dripping into the snow below. There was no sign of anything following us. Not as far as I could tell, but just past the halfway point, something was in the road. Something that hadn't been there before. I dropped the sled and went to investigate. My stomach churned. Tracks. Animal tracks. Kate came up and looked at them too. A look of confusion twisted onto her face. What is that? I said nothing but stared at them. I betrayed nothing but on the inside my mind was raging. These weren't any ordinary tracks. They were large. Too large. Even for a bear. And very deep. They reached several feet down. At the bottom I could see the tracks were almost star shaped. With wide webbing connecting them. I swallowed my fear. Clearly these were new. At most, only a couple of hours old. Kate opened her mouth to say something, but only hot air came out. She looked at me, eyebrows furrowed in confusion. We need to go, I said suddenly standing up. Come on, let's go. What made those tracks, Milo? Kate asked. I don't know. I... we're running out of time. Okay, okay. She said, stepping over the tracks and continuing. I grabbed the sled and pulled harder. It was a struggle trying to get it through this much snow, with that much weight on it. But it was the best we could do. I kept looking over my shoulder at Aya, who was strapped in blankets, and glancing beyond into the trees. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. We probably were. So why didn't it just come out and attack us already? The sky grew dark from a combination of the declining sun and the thickening of the cloud cover. The wind continued to grow and my heart beat from the effort of pulling the sled. But we couldn't stop. Not now. We were getting close. Off in the corner of my eye, I swore I saw something move. My neck snapped towards it, but whatever it was, it was gone. Or maybe it was just a tree swaying in the wind. I felt like I was losing my mind. I steadied my breathing as best as I could and tried to keep up with Kate. I checked over my shoulder a few times just to make sure nothing was there. Aya sniffled from cold and fear and sadness over her lost father. After she was warmed up, it would only be a matter of time before she would reveal the creature for what it really was. What she saw. As much as I hated for Kate to know what was out in the snow with us, I knew that she would need to learn eventually. They all would, especially since we were in this for the long haul. Time grazed by ever so slowly, but we were almost there. The reflection of light off the snow helped to illuminate the area some, but the sky was almost black now, and the flurry of snow that was being whipped up didn't help. We flipped on a flashlight and checked our progress. Only 15 minutes to go. We could make it. Before long, the final stretch of road came into view. I felt relief rush through me. This was it. I took another few steps and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I clenched my jaw. We were definitely being watched. I turned my head to see behind us. At first I couldn't make out anything but soon it became obvious. 
There was a distinct silhouette just past the tree line. Something large and quadrupedal, and a couple hundred feet away. My breathing went shallow. Go, I said to Kate. What? She called over the wind. Go, take Aya. What? What is it? I see something. I looked back at her. Now run. She grabbed the girl's hand and plowed through the snow. I tugged on the sled while keeping an eye on the creature behind me. The flashlight passed over it and I swear I could see the faintest light reflecting back at me. The creature moved back into the trees. I cursed and continued to move, pushing against the wind. Up ahead, I could see Kate and Aya rushing as fast as they could to the house. They were almost there. I huffed and continued to shine the light all around, hoping I could catch a glimpse of the thing. And then I did. It was in front of me now and moving fast. It was headed toward the girls. No, I screamed. I dropped the sled and pulled out the rifle, firing it towards the creature with an echoing crack. It missed, but seemed to draw its attention. It stopped and looked towards me. I could see its body better now. It was tall, very tall. A couple of feet taller than me at least, with an arched back and long limbs that it used to step over the snow with ease. The creature's eyes lit up the light of my flashlight, and it seemed to slink back into the trees. I rushed towards the house, dragging the supplies. The cans rattled in the bags behind me. Somewhere out in the storm, I heard that infernal howling again, and I could tell now it was more like the screech of an elk laced with human screams. My spine tingled as I made it to the cabin's door, stumbling inside and collapsing on the floor. The group locked the door behind me and Kate hugged me tightly, crying. I heard the gunshot. She said, I thought you were. I held her tightly and coughed from the effort of dragging the sled. Did you shoot him? Grace demanded. I shook my head. It's still out there. Beatrice sniffled. Where's, where's David? Grace said, noticing that her husband was absent, but her daughter had made it back. Where is he? I shook my head standing up. He's dead. Grace put a hand over her mouth. No, 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 no. You, you left him out there? He was dead when we made it to the house. Aya barely escaped with her life. Grace stumbled backwards into a chair. Beatrice led Aya to the bathroom to soak her in hot water. I collapsed next to the fire and felt the color return to my cheeks. Kate comforted Grace, who was now bawling. Oh god, this was it then. Unless we could find a way to fix that radio, we were going to be trapped inside this cabin. Snowed in. And with that monster just outside, I wasn't afraid of starving to death anymore. Or freezing. We had that covered. I was afraid of the moment when that thing decided it wanted in with us. The wind never stopped, and the windows wobbled like they might shatter at any time. The group sat around the fire not saying anything but all feeling somber at the loss of another group member. They looked to me and waited anxiously for something, anything I could say to make them feel better. The good news? I said at last, is that we found a radio. If we can manage to fix it, we can call for help. No replies. Aya coughed, huddled in the corner with puffy eyes and cased in a cocoon of blankets. The bad news, I continued, obviously is that David is dead. Grace tried to hold in her tears, and he wasn't killed by a person. Kate furrowed her brow at me. Grace looked up in a sort of bewildered blankness. I've, uh, been trying to avoid this, but it's time you all knew. Beatrice looked down. She knew what I was going to say. Our stalker isn't human. 
Milo? Kate's son. What are you talking about? I rub my face in my hands. It's not human, Kate. The thing that killed David and Joel and Charlie was... is some kind of animal. Bullshit. Grace stammered. It's true, Beatrice said. I've seen it. And A has seen it too. I sighed. What is it? Kate asked. She looked scared. I don't know. I admitted. I haven't gotten a good look at it. Whatever it is, it's smart. And it's big. And it won't stop until we're all dead. Aya muttered. All eyes turned to her. It can't be killed. It's only a matter of time until we all end up like my dad. Her glossy eyes reflected the fireplace. I... We're going to be fine. I lied. We have food and heat. And we have a radio. And weapons to protect ourselves with. Grace bit her fingernails in relief and anxiety. I don't understand. She said. I don't understand what's out there. Neither do I. Whatever it is, it hasn't tried to get inside. Yet. Aya said. The group shifted and looked out the window at the snow, but it was too dark. Nothing could be seen more than a few feet. That thing could be anywhere outside. We sat in silence for the better part of an hour and gradually some of us began to fall into a light sleep. I sat by the glass and watched, thinking about how the window must be the only visible thing. Illuminated by the warm light of the fire, the creature was out there and I was sure as hell that it could see me, watching for it. Hopefully that was enough to deter it. I kept one of the rifles nearby just in case. The clock struck 5am and I could feel myself falling asleep. Kate came up next to me and we both looked out into the storm. Why didn't you tell me? She said, I don't know. I didn't want you to have to be afraid. I'm a grown woman, you know. I know, but it tears me up inside when you're in any kind of pain. Do you think the creature is what you saw when you crashed the car? I nodded. Why didn't it kill you? I shook my head. I don't know. Secretly, I knew that it liked to toy with its victims. Why don't you get some sleep? I'll keep watch. I agreed. I hadn't slept much at all those past few days. I needed the rest. Wake me up if you see anything, or hear anything. She nodded and I kissed her on the head before finding a spot on the couch to lie down. In the darkness of sleep, I dreamt of a great forest of massive fir trees that stood silent in the snow. Among them were a dozen or so massive footprints of some demonic creature that dwarfed me. And within them were the tracks of the monster that stalked us, with its wide webbed toes that ended in thick claws. They were easily big enough to crush my skull. I shuddered at the thought, and just before waking up I heard the sound again, traveling through the trees like a song on the open air. That horrible screeching like an elk in the dead of night, tortured and brutal. I woke in a cold sweat and moved closer to the fire. The sky outside told me it was still night, but a quick glance at the clock told me the time was closer to midday. I relieved Kate of her duty and she went about preparing food for the group. The stove had stopped working several days ago, and now it wouldn't light. So all we had was the fire to warm our food up with. It worked well enough. We would still have to ration, but at least we wouldn't be constantly hungry now. No new developments happened for the next few days. I heard nothing on the wind. I saw no shadows just beyond the veil of darkness. I busied myself with the radio, which I tried desperately to fix without having any technical knowledge. Some of the wires were frayed. I don't know how to fix that. 
I didn't have any electrical tape. It was looking like an uphill battle. And the more I tinkered, the more that the contents of the radio seemed out of place. Maybe somebody handy could slap it together easily, but I was at a loss. More than once I got frustrated and paced around upstairs so I could be alone. Christmas Day came and passed. Nobody celebrated much. Beatrice tried to make the day special for her kids. But even at their age, they knew the holiday had been soured. They were missing a brother and a father. In the end, we all sat by the fire and watched as it waned before adding another Yule log. Nearly a week after the storm had started, I was sitting by the window and watching for movement. Sometime in the night, I somehow fell asleep. When I woke up, the fire was smoldering. I added another log and stood to stretch my back. That's when I heard it. Scratching. The same scratching I had heard weeks earlier at the start of this hellish experience. Somewhere on the cabin wall... Before, I had thought it was a raccoon. Now, my thoughts turned dark. Cautiously, without waking anyone up, I found the hunting rifle and slid the back door open. We had managed to dig a path through the snow from the exit so we could get out, but pretty soon it would be an impossible task. I crawled my way up to the top of the snow and started around the house. The drift was five feet at this point. Without snowshoes, we wouldn't be able to move at all, but... How much longer did we have until it was impossible to leave the house at all? We'd be completely snowed in soon. Already the cabin had a thick layer of snow on it that I wasn't sure it had been built to handle. Eventually we would have to climb out the upstairs windows to get out. I stepped through the fresh snow and saw that it was still outside. No wind, no snowfall. My breathing seemed to be the loudest thing apart from the sound of fresh snow breaking under my shoes. Whatever was clawing at the house had already heard me. I rounded the side of the house and saw nothing. Of course I did. Whatever this creature was, it was probably inside the walls already. Some raccoon. Or it was buried beneath a crust worth of frozen water and trying to hollow its burrow some more. I sighed and shone the light around. Despite the bright reflective snow, the sky was dark enough to make anything outside of my flashlight beam disappear instantly. Anything could be out there. I turned to head back inside but stopped when I noticed something peculiar. I hadn't noticed it before because the white snow and the darkness made it blend in. It was a hole. A hole dug along the side of the house towards the spot where the scratching had been. I took a couple more hesitant steps and peered into it. The hole was big. Too big for anything that could feasibly create it. How long had this been here? Judging by how little snow was inside, I guessed that it was constantly being tended to. At the bottom of the hole I could see the base of the house. The paneling had been clawed away, exposing the insulation and the pipes in certain places, but it wasn't right. Something wasn't right. It was surface level scratches. Not something that was trying to get inside. Insulation had been torn out too. And that was going to be a whole other problem now. Being so close to the warmest room in the house, I was going to have to patch this thing up. I stood and looked around. That was going to take several minutes at least. I dreaded the idea of it. Why gouge out the side of the house like this? In my mind, it was the creature that did it. What else could have dug that hole? The hairs on my neck perked up. I swung the light around behind me, illuminating the tree line some 50 feet away. Instantly, my chest tightened up and I struggled to move at all. There it was. Two eyes gleaming in the light of my torch. They shifted in the dark looking directly at me, and in the silence I could hear a deep huffing sound like breathing or grunting that made my spine twitch. It wanted me to come out there. It wasn't trying to get inside at all. I held my breath and took a step towards the house. It didn't move. 
I took another and it bolted towards me. I wasn't far from the door. I dove into the snow and pulled it open, spilling powder in as I did. Then it slid closed, leaving me panting on the floor, covered in the stuff. Outside, I had dropped the flashlight, and in its shadow I could see the creature towering just behind it. I climbed to my feet and watched as it approached the window. My throat seized up. This was it. This was the end for us. I could see clearly now that the monster dwarfed me. It could easily smash the glass with just one swipe. From the light of the fireplace spilling out into the dark, it was easy to notice that it was at least eight or nine feet tall, with impossibly long and muscular front legs that it used to stand in the snow. Each one was as tall as me and probably weighed enough to be placed in my resting weight category. Its shoulders and neck were strong too, like a bison or buffalo or bear. The spine was long and curved downward steeply, eventually ending in two legs about half as long as the front but with backwards knees. Along the shoulders, chest, and down the back was long and thick dark fur. The rest of the body here was shorter but just as thick. The head of the monster was what immediately caught my attention. It was massive, supported by its bulking musculature. The closest thing I can describe to it is a deer skull with a long pointed snout, and teeth set in to make it look like it was constantly grimacing. It had two massive hulking antlers as well, but the skin was too close to the bone, like it was stretched unnaturally, like a balloon about to burst. Its eyes were large and deep set, and I could see now that they were pitch black but glazed over with white, almost like it was blind. But it wasn't. Every now and again the light caught the white patches in its eyes as it stared through the glass at me, reflecting the light as if it were a cat. It stood there breathing heavily so that I could hear the grunting through the window. I could sense an intelligence inside of it, an understanding that I was afraid, that my heart had climbed into my mouth and I wouldn't be able to do anything to stop this thing if it decided it wanted to break the window. The rest of the group slept, ignorant of the horror that was right outside. I saw it turn its head and twitch its eyes between each sleeping occupant, teeth still grimacing like a rotten corpse's would. Hot breath spilled out between its black gums, and it was close enough to the window now that I saw the glass fog up a little. I didn't know what to do. I stood helpless. Shaking like a leaf as this thing watched the group, probably assessing whether or not it wanted to kill us now. Its eyes moved to Beatrice, then to Aya, to Grace, the Griffith girls, and then landed on Kate, closest to the window and within snapping distance of its massive jaws. My stomach twisted in on itself as I saw Kate's helpless body be sized up by this unholy abomination. Instinctively, I screamed at it and waved my arms. It looked to me. The gun. I needed the gun. I looked around for where I had left it. Behind me, Grace was waking up, trying to figure out why I was screaming. Beatrice's eyes fluttered open as well, but it was too late. I could see the monster slinking back into the shadows again, disappearing completely from view. What? What is it? Grace said, sitting upright, and with a twinge of panic in her voice. I sat down next to the fire, breathing heavily, and looking out the window. Nothing. It's gone now. We need to board up the windows. Kate looked at the window I was staring at and stepped away from it. Sitting down next to me. You saw it? I nodded. It's clawing away at the insulation. It's trying to freeze us out. The Griffith girl stifled tears. What? Grace said, confused. There's a hole in the wall over there. I motioned. On the outside. The group shifted uncomfortably. The monster was getting bolder. As much as I hated the idea of not being able to see outside, 
The windows needed to be boarded up if we were going to protect ourselves from this thing. We gathered the boards that I had sitting in the attic from an old project and got to work nailing the windows. When we ran out of wood, we started smashing furniture and using that. In a few hours time, we had closed up every peeping hole into the house except for the sliding glass door. We managed to pull a bookcase in front of it, leaving a small sliver we could peek into with the storm with. By the time we had finished, the storm outside was already well on its way back, but I still needed to fix the hole in the wall outside. I employed Grace to hold the gun and watch my back. Inside, I had found a slab of styrofoam from some old furniture set we had bought. I stuffed as much as I could into the hole and got to work boarding it up, wind threatening to pull the flashlight from my mouth and teeth along with it. Behind me, Grace stood at the ready, watching for any movement. We managed to get the problem fixed, but I wasn't sure for how long. The creature could be back at any time and tear the house a new one easily. We made it back inside, shaking the snow off ourselves and pushing the bookcase back in place. I had to find out how to fix that radio. It was our only shot of making it out of here alive. The group sat by the fire and one by one we dozed in and out of sleep once more. The perpetual darkness outside was making it hard to tell the time of day. To our bodies, it was always night. We were always tired. The time on the wall didn't matter anymore. More than once I became frustrated with the progress I was making on the radio. And stormed off to a colder part of the house to collect my thoughts. Thinking through deep breaths of steam. I was no handyman. No electrician. I never had been. It seemed like a simple task, fixing a radio, but I still struggled to even diagnose a problem with it. More time passed. Life was stagnant, like a pool of dirty water formed from the melting of snow. Unchanging. There was no other sign of the creature, thank God, but then again, we had a limited viewing range from the few cracks between boarded windows, the piling snow outside, and the perpetual darkness. It could be anywhere. It seemed like it was everywhere, always just at the edge of my waking mind and always in my dreams. I could only imagine it was the same for the others, worse for poor Beatrice and Aya, who had been scarred by the witnessing of the monster killing their loved ones. In fact, Aya had begun to display odd behavior. I would sometimes wake up and find her by the back door, looking through the crack and into the night. Other times, she would make dark comments about the creature, turning every conversation towards it and making no effort to pretend like she believed we would make it out of here alive. She ate less, engaged less, and slept less. I could tell she needed psychiatric help. What she saw happen to her father was eating away at her mind, but there was something there that disturbed me, too. Something dark in her eyes, hollow, like she was looking at something on the horizon. For some reason, it made me feel uncomfortable, unsafe even. But then again, I wasn't in my best mental state either. I chalked it up to paranoia and did my best to watch her in case she tried to hurt herself. One night or day while the others slept and I peeked through the back door, I heard her behind me. When I turned to look, her eyes were red, but not like she'd been crying, like she was having an allergic reaction, or from strain. There's no point, you know, she said. I sighed. As long as there are people in this house, I'm going to keep watch. It knows you're looking for it. It can see you. I squinted out into the storm. I didn't find that very likely, but I believed her anyway. How do you know that? She didn't answer me. We're going to die in this house. Why do you say things like that? Because it's true. Her voice was monotone and devoid of emotion. What makes you think that? Sooner or later, it's going to want to get inside. And there's nothing stopping it from doing so. 
I didn't like the way she seemed so sure. Why don't you go lie down? I said. She didn't say anything but turned away from me and left. For the next hour, I sat in the dark and thought about what she had said. Sometime later that night, I heard her again talking to herself, talking in her sleep. Cold flame, she sun, drenched in a pale odor, drenched in blood, like the swinging of the cosmos on high, in the deepest of the trees beyond the grave of life, hunger, the white eyes of deity clinging the lichen to your chest, fear, in that pale odor comes the tang of death, the warmth of blood on snow. In the trees a deity, ancient, malevolent, in the trees a beast, growing, growling, preying on you. I shuddered. That girl was seriously disturbed. We needed to get out of there and get her help. More time passed and the storm never seemed to cease. No new developments came with the radio and I resisted the urge to smash it out of anger. Eventually, the wind did seem to die down, but the storm didn't stop. It was enough to be able to move outside, though. Like an eye of a hurricane, I took the opportunity to pull the group together and explain our situation. I don't understand, Grace son. You want us to go out there? Yes, I explained again, in two groups. Why? We need firewood, before the snow gets too high and we become trapped in here. What's wrong with the wood we have? It's fine, but I want to get more. In case the storm lasts longer into the season, we might run out if that happens. But I thought you had that radio. We're not staying here all winter. No, I sighed. But we need to be prepared for all possibilities. I don't know if I can fix it. I could tell Grace was upset with me. I don't understand what's so hard about it. David would be able to fix it. I rubbed the bridge of my nose. I'm not David. Clearly. I think... Kate bumped in. We should focus on surviving. Nobody wanted anything bad to happen, but... Oh, you're just glad that your husband is still alive. Grace said, eyes wet. Excuse me? Oh, don't play dumb. We all know you volunteered Dave so you could stay here. She snarled at me. You think I volunteered him? I shouted. David chose to go. He gave his life to protect you. And look at you. Unharmed. We couldn't know that this would happen. Kate said, trying to douse the flame. You should have been there. Grace continued, getting more emotional. He wouldn't be dead if you had gone with them. Aya wouldn't have had to see her father die. I could feel my chest getting hot. And what? Just let that thing get in here? Kill you instead? You didn't seem to have a problem leaving us here when Kate was with you. I clenched my jaw. What's that supposed to mean? You don't care about any of us. You only care about her. Bullshit. I let you into my house. I risked our lives getting your daughter back here. Stop it. Beatrice squealed from the couch. She was crying. Please, stop it. I realized I was heaving in anger. Grace was doing the same with tears in her eyes. I looked to Kate, who had a concerned look on her eyebrows. It's poisoned you all. Aya spoke. We all looked at her. She was standing by the fire and staring into it. What? Kate asked. Look deeply and you will find the stench of the beast in your minds. Aya? Honey? Grace sniffled. Please sit down. You're scaring me. Aya turned and looked at us. The beast is hungry. Aya? Grace scolded. Stop. Sit down. Why? Please, you don't know what you're saying. 
You bicker and you fight and soon you'll turn on each other like animals. I think we all have a bad case of cabin fever, my son. She looked at me, through me. You've seen it. You know the Wisokin is here, in this room. My heart pounded in my chest. The what? Aya, Grace shrieked. Aya turned and walked to the peephole by the back door, staring out into the dark storm again. She, uh, is going through some kind of psychosis. I made up. Excuse me? Grace said. She needs help. I told her. We need to get her help. She's just frightened. What we need to do is get out of here. Frightened? Jesus Christ, Grace. The girl watched her father get torn to pieces. You need to comfort her. I yelled. Grace stifled tears. In the bathroom, I could hear Beatrice's girls start to cry. Everyone could hear what I was saying. She stood to go to them. Let's drop it, okay? Kate said, putting a hand on my shoulder. I nodded. I needed a breather. Grace left for the kitchen. I'll make some coffee, Kate said. I think we need a break. She left, too. In the other room, I could see her talking quietly to Grace and trying to comfort her. But the widow moved away from her hand. I sat by the fire, watching the flames slowly consume the log. There was something wrong with Aya. I knew, but I could tell it wasn't just some sort of coping mechanism. She was right. There was something evil in here with us. With her. That thing, whatever she called it. It could burrow itself in your mind. I knew it because I could feel it too. Worming its way into my subconscious. It was more than just paranoia. More than cabin fever. It was like I could feel it making me go mad. Pretty soon we would all be at each other's throats. I shivered. I was cold. It was cold. Not even the heat of the fire was enough to truly drive it off. The storm grew again and we never left to go get more firewood. I fumbled away at the radio, but I knew it was futile. I had tried every combination in every order and orientation. I wanted to throw it. I wanted to smash it out of frustration and anger. Even with my fingers inches away from the fire, they still felt frozen. It was like trying to do neurosurgery with sausages. Meanwhile, more time passed between spats. Days at first, then hours. Soon I found myself head to head with the others of the cabin at almost every given moment. I even found myself yelling at Kate sometimes. I couldn't handle the pressure of all the warm bodies, the conflicting emotions and collective fear of the monster and storm outside. I felt like crawling into the fireplace and letting it eat away at my bones and my heart. I needed it to warm my mind. I could feel something cold creeping its fingers under my scalp and burrowing itself into my gray matter. I felt dizzy after standing up. I twitched when I heard sounds outside. Aya continued to deteriorate. Her eyes grew more bloodshot from lack of sleep. Or maybe some immense pressure behind the skull that was ready to burst through. I became relatively afraid of her. More than once, I woke up from a light sleep to find her standing over me. Or over one of the Griffiths or her mother. Or over Kate. But the more I pushed Grace to do something, the more she built a wall around herself. Sometimes when she thought I was asleep, Aya would speak to the walls. I could only ever catch fragments of her conversation, but whenever her lips would part and the whispering voice like cold wind came through, I shivered at the thought. No, the feeling that something was just on the other side looking for a way in. I knew it was out there too because it constantly reminded us as it scraped away at the cabin's paneling from time to time. 
or howled its horrible death call on the wind. One night, I lay on my side, on the couch watching the fire. The radio was in front of me, still busting. I hadn't even tried to fix it for several days. My mind was aching to get out of the cabin, but the only bud of hope was hopelessly wrecked. Out of boredom and desperation, I picked it up one last time and began pulling wires from their outlets, exposing the frayed inside. I haphazardly connected the pieces together to see what, if anything, would happen. At that point, I knew I would never be able to fix it, so I figured I might as well try everything, even if it would completely destroy the thing. A spark shot from the wires and missed my finger. I threaded the copper together and something crackled. I blinked. Was that coming from outside? The static returned and I shot upright, still holding the wires in place. Shit, that was coming from the radio. I rapidly hit the button on the top and turned the dial, hoping I could find something. My stomach twisted into knots of adrenaline. Unhooking the microphone, I brought it to my mouth. SOS, I said. SOS, we're trapped and dying. With effort, I managed to sputter out my address and waited for a response. I was met with the sound of radio static. Hello? Hello? I need emergency rescue. Anyone there? Still nothing. I hit the button some more times. The receiver squealed, picked up the sound of a low growl and short circuit in, electrocuting my hand. I dropped the radio and it smoked, now completely and utterly fried. That was it. That was our only lifeline. And now Kate and I were going to die out here. Kate was going to die because we had to go back to the cabin instead of leaving. I screamed and stomped on the broken machine. The adrenaline of hope was deformed into rage. Pieces of the radio went flying and cold tears formed at the corners of my eyes. The others woke up and Kate rushed to my side, holding my chest while I breathed. Wiping my eyes off on my arm, I looked around the room. I could see the shocked face of Grace, the confusion on Beatrice's, how scared the little girls were. Kate was concerned and sad for me. What in the hell is wrong with you? Grace shouted. It's fucking broken. I spat. Nothing. Nothing. We're going to die here. I fumed. Grace stood up and pushed me. We're going to die because of you. You should have gone with David. You even had the chance to make it to town after you went after him. It's all your fault, and now you've destroyed our last hope. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Aya escort the children to the bathroom, where I assumed she had a hot bath running. I pushed Grace out of the way and kicked the radio bits some more as I walked past. It came on, I said, and it short-circuited. Nobody was on the other side. Face it. We're all a fucking alone out here, and that's how it's going to stay. I crouched by the fire and turned the log, still breathing heavily. Grace sat down and buried her face in her hands. Kate sat next to me and pet my back. I leaned my head against hers. We all sat in misery for the next few minutes as the wind shook the foundation of the house. We were all too tired of fighting with each other. There was no point anymore. We were all shells of our former selves, ghouls of skin and bone and full of icy anger at ourselves and at each other. Eventually the group began to fall asleep again, but I remained at the fireside, staring into the flames that I'd grown so accustomed to watching. It was the only source of light, the only source of warmth, and we all huddled around it like primitive Neanderthals trying to survive something much greater than ourselves. So much bigger. We were tiny specks in the eyes of the storm and playthings for the beast outside. Pray. We were mice being swatted by a cat. I got up and headed to the bathroom. I'd forgotten that Aya and Beatrice's little girls were in there. 
I walked in on Aya crouched by the bathtub. Her head snapped to meet me, and I could see her eyes were horribly dilated and wild. Blood dripped from her teeth. Aya, you're bleeding. I start in. I didn't finish because I noticed the blood was not her own. Lying in the tub were the gutted remains of Sarah and Elizabeth Griffith, their shining organs still steaming with the heat of their bodies. Painted across the walls were the bits of sinew and flesh that Aya had been devouring raw. I screamed and the monster in front of me shrieked, sending bits of the little girls flying with her crimson saliva. My heart twisted into an expression of agony as the girl pushed past me and into the hallway, leaving a trail of bright blood dripping from her clothes while the others were awakened again to the sound of horrible wailing. Dizziness overcame me, and I doubled over, vomiting the remains of the canned food I'd eaten hours earlier. Aya ran through the living room, and as the others realized she was soaked in blood, they started to scream too. Now all scrambling and disorganized. Grace pleaded with her to stop, but she cackled, calling out to the creature in the storm. In one swift motion, she catapulted herself over the couch and pulled the bookshelf down so she could get at the back door. Frigid wind rushed in as she pulled it open and scrambled outside, clawing her way through the snow that had collected and out into the darkness. Grace screamed for someone to do something. I yelled back in desperation and blamed her for not watching her daughter. Meanwhile, Beatrice, who realized her daughters were not in the living room with us, ran to the bathroom and shrieked with all the heart-wrenching agony of a mother who had lost everything and fainted. Kate pulled herself into the corner unsure of what to do while screaming rang throughout the house. Grace looked between me and the open door, almost foaming at the mouth with anger. Then she turned and ran out the door after her daughter just as underdressed as she was. I closed the door behind her and locked it. Kate was over by the bathroom now, and she was retching too. I could hear her crying and could see her clutching her stomach. Neither of us had any idea of what to do. Everything had gone from horrible to abhorrent in no time. All at once, we had lost four of our members of the house, and we were down to three. After Kate and I collected ourselves some, we closed the door to the bathroom, where blood was now spilling out from under the door, and brought Beatrice to the fire. Then the two of us sat in the kitchen, still violently shaking and glancing back at the glass door in the off chance that Aya or her mother were to come back. Neither of us knew what to do. The sudden shock of it all hung in the air like the stench of decay. In hindsight, I knew I should have got more vigilant. I could see the girl changing in front of me, but I never thought it would become this bad. I feared for my own safety. How much longer could we last? There were only three of us left. Hardly enough to defend ourselves from that horrible creature. That wasn't even surveying the emotional damage that might make us go crazy faster. After an hour or so, I finally got the nerve to try and clean the blood from under the doorway. I wedged a few towels underneath and hoped that the bathroom would be cold enough to stop the bodies from decaying. I had no intention to ever step foot in there again. What could I even do? Scoop the poor girls into buckets and dump them into the snow? Kate tended to Beatrice as she woke up screaming. All through the night, I was painfully aware of her howling in pain as she cried until she was dehydrated. She'd lost everything. First her husband, then her son, and now her daughters. As the hours churned by, I became more and more afraid of what she might do to herself in agony. I made sure to keep her attention away from the bathroom door and... Kate tried her best to make something nice to eat with the extra rations we now had. Why had Aya snap like that? It was the monster, sure, but how? What was this thing? Something supernatural? Paranormal? I knew it wasn't natural. 
But where its abilities seemed to end blended with the realm of fiction, I was convinced it was at least partially responsible for Aya's psychosis, and probably wholly responsible for her visceral violence. Who would be next? Who would the creature target and speak through the walls to? How would I know if it was me? If it was Kate? Until it was too late. More days passed and the storm never ceased. It could have been a week since it last started. Or days. Time was thick and slow like molasses in January. Snow piled up past the windows and completely snowed us in. The only way out was through the second story. One night, I sat by the fire with Beatrice. Kate was asleep next to me. Head on my lap. Aya was right. She said at length, quietly. We're never getting out of this. I wanted to tell her she was wrong, but the words died at my lips. Why did this have to happen? She continued. I rocked my head from side to side lazily. Whenever I sleep, I can see it. Beatrice told me. I can see its eyes staring into mine while it tears away at my husband and my children. And I can't do anything to stop it. A tear fell from her eye. On top of the house, above feet of snow, I could hear something shifting. Neither of us bothered to look up. The widow sighed. It's always out there. Just waiting for us to give up. I'm thinking we should. No, I said. I'm not giving up. As long as Kate is here with me, I'm not going to let that thing win. I don't have someone anymore, Milo. I'm all alone. Her voice cracked. More movement on the house, and then a screaming shriek into the darkness. The Wasokan, Beatrice muttered. I turned to look at her. What? The monster. I looked back into the flames. In the heart of flaming rage, there burned a being of terrible age, Beatrice whispered. When the gears of time were taut, and in the night there was but not a single voice would rise above a howling wind stripped of love. She turned away from me and lay down to sleep. I was left alone with the feeling of my hair standing on end, like something was in the room with me. Of course, when I turned, there was nothing, but I knew that I was being watched, studying, broken down to be used as fuel for some infernal fire of cold sadism. Another howl came, and I was left alone with my thoughts in the shuddering walls of the cabin. In the next few days, Beatrice continued to worsen. I saw her shudder at any noise, and she hardly ate. Her eyes grew bloodshot, and Kate and I feared she would try to hurt herself. Or worse, she might try to get outside, pulling us all in danger. We took turns, covertly watching her withering frame crawl closer and closer into the flame with each passing day. Beyond Beatrice, though, I could feel my own mind consuming itself. My only source of sanity was Kate, who delicately held my consciousness on strings. When the creature scratched at the walls or climbed on the roof, I could sense her fear and feel my own senses become overwhelmed with a desire to make the thing go away. I couldn't let it reach her. The thought of anything happening to her out here was enough to make me go mad, but the idea that she might be horribly mutilated and torn to shreds by the monster filled me with such burning nausea that I had to force myself to think about anything else. More and more, my mind seemed to turn to the sunny beaches of the Caribbean, with my wife next to me. A hot sun beat down on pale skin while the ocean breathed with salty life on the shore. It was a dream that seemed to be slipping away the more I thought of it, the longer I stayed buried under tons of snow and anxiety. I watched one night as Kate tried to get Beatrice to eat. Her once round figure was thinning out, and I could see the concern on Kate's face. Please be. 
she said softly. Just a little bite. It can't hurt. Not hungry. You need the food. Beatrice's hand shot out and flung the fork from Kate's hand. It clattered to the floor and Beatrice hugged her knees staring into the corner. I could hear her muttering. Kate stood and backed up, walking towards me. Beatrice's muttering grew louder and louder. A series of incoherent speech patterns and short bursts of laughter. She was losing her mind like Aya had. What do we do? Kate asked, holding my shirt sleeve. I rubbed my forehead. I don't know. I think we need to keep her locked up. Are you crazy? She'll hurt herself. She'll freeze. Kate, she's going to hurt us if we don't do something. So help me God, I'm not going to let anything fucking happen to you. We can't. She needs our help. I sighed. We can put her over there. In the closet. And give her blankets. She won't be able to do anything in there. Kate looked back and forth between the rocking woman and the door of the coat closet. Okay, she whispered. Together we managed to lift Beatrice up and put her into the little space. We gave her a series of blankets and a crank lantern, along with some books to read. To my surprise, she offered no resistance. But as we moved her, I could see a sort of hatred in her eyes that made me shiver. Finally... It was just me and Kate left in the room again, huddled together by the fire like we'd done countless times over countless winters. But it seemed like this would be the last. I wanted to cry. I just wanted to leave, but we were trapped and being toyed with. The only company we had was the woman in the closet, who we fed canned food every now and again, and the monster outside that reminded us it was there with its screams. More time passed. It always seemed like time was passing. How long had it been since we lost the girls? Maybe just a few days, but it really felt like weeks. Every minute was agony. More and more we started to hear Beatrice bang on the door, or could hear her talking and laughing like a mental hospital patient. When we opened the door to feed her, we saw that she had stopped cranking the lantern and was living in complete darkness. Even the books had been torn and she was huddled in the corner. It seemed like she was never sleeping. I caught a glimpse of her eyes and saw they were crimson like Aya's had been. All the time my body felt like I was being stretched thin. I felt claustrophobic, anxious, cold. Like Beatrice, I couldn't sleep. I was afraid something was happening to me too, but worst of all was the creeping dread. The constant reminder that we were being hunted, the slow build-up to what felt like a catastrophic climax. Like our lives were just some sick form of entertainment for this monster. It came closer to the house. It was louder. It came more often. My hair seemed to stand on end at all times, like electricity was building in the air, ready to discharge in a bolt of lightning at any moment. The worst part was that there was nothing I could do to stop it from simply breaking in and killing us while we slept. It all came crashing down when I heard the digging by the back door. Kate was asleep. Beatrice was silent. But there was the unmistakable sound of the monster outside, huffing mechanically as snow was shoveled out of the way. I pulled aside the bookcase to see its long arms reaching into the hole and pulling massive chunks of powdery snow out with its wid hands. A pit reaching from the top layer all the way down to the door frame. I caught sight of its eyes as it pulled the last bit of snow out, glittering in the faint light of the house. I let out a screech that pierced through the air and made the window shudder. I winced and covered my ears and Kate snapped awake. But by the time she had made it to me, the monster had already gone. I held her back with one hand and gripped the rifle in the other, scanning the darkness for signs of movement. This was it. I was sure of it. It was going to try to get inside. 
Nothing moved save for the snow, being pulled by the hurricane wind. Then, tumbling into the pit, was a frozen body. It was Aya. She landed face up and I could see her grotesque face crusted with blackened skin. Her lips were curled back, exposing her gums and teeth still red with frozen blood. Her eyelids were similarly stuck open and the look of her horribly disfigured body made me want to gag. Then she moved. I jumped backwards and Kate stood behind me, standing on her toes to look over my shoulder. Aya's body twitched, legs and arms bending over so slightly at the frozen joints, and she climbed to her feet like a robot brought to life. Kate screamed and I held the gun at the horrible aberration of nature in front of us. Aya's stiff fingers, still curled, reached for the handle of the door and tried to pull at it. Jesus Christ, she was trying to get inside. I looked into the eyes of the ghoul. I couldn't tell if they were alive or dead. They could barely move in their sockets, but I sensed a sort of recognition in them when they saw me. If her lips weren't stuck into a permanent sneer, I swear she would have smiled. She continued to pull at the door, but it was locked. I resisted the urge to put the thing out of its misery. She was hopelessly immobile, stumbling at every jerk of the handle. Fingers permanently curled and blackened. After a moment, she put her hand on the glass and tried to break it with her fist, but she was still too slow. Her flesh too frozen. Kate and I backed away from the door as a sound came from the front door. A knocking. My heart was squeezed in my chest and Kate and I held each other. A short trip to the other door revealed it was Grace. Body and face disfigured just as much as her daughter's, but with sort of agonizing pain in her eyes that made me want to tear my own out. Kate whimpered. We were being surrounded by the horrible things. What would be next? David's body would appear. Joel's? The answer came from the closet door. Inside, Beatrice screamed and professed her love for the creature of the storm while she tried desperately to break free. The handle came loose and the door burst open, revealing her withering body. Eyes so bloodshot that tears of red were actually coming from her eyes. She smiled with cracked lips and cackled before barreling towards me and Kane. I panicked and shot at the woman. The bullet hit a lamp and she launched herself over the sofa with inhuman speed. I shot again and tore a hole in the cushions. She slid into the kitchen coming to a stop at the knives and pulled the biggest, sharpest one she could find. I screamed for Kate to get behind me as the woman charged. I shot again and it hit her in the stomach, but it only did little to stop her. She hobbled towards me still. I fired another shot. The sound making my exposed ears ring, and the bullet lodged itself in her arm. She howled in bloodlust-soaked rage and turned to the glass door next to her, where Aya was still trying to break in. Before I could do anything, Beatrice grabbed the knife at the glass and it cracked. She lifted her arm for another strike, but she was stopped when another shot went through her skull and her sick mind came flying out the other side. Kate cowered and hid her face in my shirt. I shook as Beatrice's body collapsed, and I swear I saw it twitching still. My eyes went to face the back door, where Aya was steadily knocking at the damaged area. The spiderweb cracks grew and my stomach churned as I realized what was about to happen. The glass came down all at once and the frigid storm came blowing into the house. Aya stumbled after us, jaws agape, and I shot her four times before she fell to the ground. Now we were exposed. The snow blew into the house and the fireplace shuddered. We were going to die. Outside, the screech of the horrible monster could be heard. It was coming for us now. Upstairs, I screamed at Kate. Go upstairs. She sprinted for the staircase as the sound of a massive body hit the ground. I turned to see the beast. 
Grinning to expose its teeth and crouching down just to fit inside, it shrieked again. Like the sound of a dying deer and scrambled after us. I fired the rest of the rounds into the monster, but it was no use. I was out of ammo. Throwing down the gun, I turned up the stairs, pushing Kate forward, and we ran into the room. The staircase behind us was destroyed with the weight of our assailant, and I could hear its heavy breathing as it tried to clamber through the hallway that was too small for it. I collapsed next to the bed and slammed the door shut. In the corner, Kate was crying and shivering. I crawled up to her and held her, crying myself. This was it. This was the end of it all. I failed to protect her. All I ever wanted was to keep her safe and I couldn't do it. Now she was going to be killed by that thing and there was nothing to be done. The monster dragged its claws against the door but seemed like it couldn't break it down. The hallway was too small for it to make any great effort. It shrieked again and a sharp pain stabbed my eardrums. I held Kate closer watching my breath crystallize through blurry tears. I couldn't let her get hurt by it. She was too pure, too innocent. On her finger I could see our wedding ring glinting in the dark. She didn't deserve this. If that thing got to us, she would suffer. She would die in agony. There was only one way out. I held Kate tighter and told her I loved her. She squeezed me back and I pulled her in more, feeling her warm body against mine. Slowly my fingers crept to her throat and I gripped her still tighter, shuddering from sobs. She gasped for air but didn't fight back. All the while my body fight me, filling me with stabbing pains of guilt and regrets and love and Kate's body went limp. I crumpled and sobbed. It was my turn now. My turn to die. I couldn't see through my misery, but I heard the door crack. It was almost here. I couldn't let it reach me. It couldn't have the satisfaction. My fingers searched the floor, the bedside table, looking for anything sharp. Nothing. There was nothing. The door splintered and the giant monster crawled inside. It stopped at the bedside, crouching to keep its muscular shoulders from grinding against the ceiling. It heaved and I wiped away the tears from my eyes. All I felt was numbness now. I was going to be with Kate. Even in the dark, I swear I could see its eyes, glinting faintly at some unknown light source. Or maybe they were glowing themselves. But for a minute, neither of us moved. We just heaved, staring at each other. This was it. All this time waiting for us. The Wiesoken seemed to invade my mind. I could feel a sort of sick pleasure and a burning desire to crawl into the snow. To devour the flesh of my wife, but I resisted and screamed at the thing. It sucked in several breaths in quick succession like an animal about to sneeze and then started to back out of the room. I screamed. I yelled. I howled at the thing to come back, but it didn't. I cried and ripped out my own hair and fell to the ground shuddering. My ringing ears played tricks on me. I could hear the air being sliced. A deep bellowing sound shaking my chest while I cried, but it didn't go away. It continued. And then I could hear muffled shouts. The window behind me shattered and the room was flooded with electric light. The barricades were torn apart and I was lifted by the living hands of humans and taken out into the snow. Half awake, I saw that the storm was gone somehow. There were people... There was a helicopter hovering above the house, now almost completely snowed in. The radio had sent my distress call after all. The whole time, I had thought nobody was coming. In my heart, I felt the pain of the horrible realization that I was going to live and that Kate was dead. Kate was dead because I killed her. And now I was being lifted into the helicopter. I wanted to be down there. I wanted to be dead instead of 
here. I tried to scream and cry and resist, but I couldn't. I wanted to tell them to leave me, but they wouldn't. And I saw the snow below us fall away, taking the cabin with it. Smoke still sputtering from the chimney, leaving behind the only person I'd ever loved. Dead and freezing in that horrible fucking cabin.